Coming to you live from my apartment, it's Rob Has a Podcast. And now, here's the guy who's about to put the R back in R-H-A-P. I am Rob Sister Nino. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to number three on our countdown of the top 40 seasons of Survivor. Tonight, we talk about Survivor Pearl Islands. And boy... Do we have a, a great crew to talk about it here with you tonight, Survivor of Pearl Islands? And later on in this very podcast, uh, we will learn the number two and the number one seasons of all time as voted by the listeners of Rob as a podcast. So a lot to do tonight, of course. Uh, let's welcome in uh, the people we will, will be uh, speaking with. Uh, first, let's go to, oh, hold on. Uh, this is awkward. Uh Mike Bloom scheduled. Yeah. <laughs> Ahoy! <laughs> there be podcasts here, I hear. Is this Bloombeard the pirate? I, I be Captain Bloombeard as of late. He yeah. with the one seeing side and the one blind side. Here to talk about me favorite season, Survivor Pearl Islands. Wow. Uh, Captain Bloombeard, uh, it is an honor. For you. <laughs> Maybe not so much for me, but I'm here anyway. This is my version of walking the plank. This no, is my walked, keel hauling. You ran the plank. <laughs> yes. If you're listening to the audio podcast, uh, you check out the YouTube video uh, for the visual <laughs> here. You won't be disappointed. It'd be a hell of a visual, I say. <laughs> Even if you have a, an eye patch covering one eye, it's worth it. Yeah. Are you, I look are you, half as good that way. Yeah. Are, are you staying in character for the whole show tonight, Captain Bloombeard? Absolutely not. No, this okay. crap is... I am. I'm going in with the clothes on my back. Uh, mm -hmm. None of the none of the party city cut. Should I re leave the beard yeah, on though? Leave the beard. Yes, please, please. I feel like uh, it's like an evil Mike Bloom uh, that we're dealing with. Uh, I look but... like someone who you like find passed out at a Jimmy Buffett concert with this shirt <laughs> mm -hmm. and this beard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I could see it. <laughs> All right, uh, Mike. A pleasure to have you here to talk about uh, Survivor Pearl Islands, and uh, let's welcome in the other half of uh, this amazing duo that I get to speak with about Survivor Pearl Islands. Although I'm a little concerned. Uh, it was either going to be Haley or my grandmother. And uh, I'm a little concerned right now, but let's bring in uh, a woman who, you know, for many years as uh, being the co-host of the bachelor bachelorette bachelor in paradise rehab up. It is the great Haley Strong. I'm ready to loot everyone's attention for two and a half to 14 hours. <laughs> oh my God. Wait, where did my shoes go? Haley, did you take them? Barefooted and loving it. Barefoot. Yes. Wow. Uh, first Jacob Jones yesterday on the slop. And now, uh, I, Haley. yeah. Yeah. See, I, I did wear my tie dye t shirt. I was tempted to just go underwear only. Um, in in support of Austin, but I thought this was not a good mm -hmm. idea for yeah. you and your um, audiences. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I was inspired by the Morgan men. I'm bottomless. I hope that's okay. <laughs> nice. You're like Don it. <laughs> you're Donald ducking it right now, or I guess like Pelican peating it. I suppose. <laughs> yeah. So all right. Uh, I think we're gonna have a lot of fun tonight. I think this is gonna be a good. Really, one what gave it away? Yeah. To talk about the number three season. On our countdown. Did you oh. say number three? That feels way too low. Too low. Um, I thought I was invited to talk about the number one season. Mm. We'll debate it tonight. I refuse to debate it. This is just the opinion I am holding to. No need to at me, my friends. Okay. All right. Well, 
happy to have the number one season energy here tonight to talk yeah. about uh, Survivor Pearl Islands. Technically me... speaking, number one non-Netflix season of Survivor. I think that's something to write home about. That's something, yeah. It's the best season not on Netflix right now, <laughs> Survivor Pearl Islands. Let me set up here. Okay, we are getting into our conversation tonight. Anything uh, that we don't get to, we are going to be talking about on Thursday, where we have a uh, patron royalty, uh, Humberto is going to be uh, joining myself, uh, Gio Worthy as well on our patron feedback show coming up on Thursday. That's going to be 430 Eastern live. And then we are going to uh, also start our conversation tonight. Uh, and guess what? David Bloomberg and Jessica Lewis are going to be back this weekend to talk about why Sandra won Pearl Islands. That should be in parentheses. <laughs> Why Sandra won this particular season? Yeah, I mean, this is a it's a legendary season for many reasons, right? Like this is the birth of the first two time Survivor winner. This is their origin story. Uh, and what an origin story it is. Uh, Sandra is not the prototypical Survivor winner. And I love the fact that she and Tony are our, our only two two time winners because they have to be, I think, two of the biggest characters to ever win Survivor. The mm -hmm. fact that they're the most successful is icing on top of the cake. It's wild. It's wild. Okay. So birth of an idol here on Survivor Pearl Islands. Uh, we'll continue our discussion on our patron feedback show, robinswebsitecom slash patron uh, for that. And of course, uh, this is uh, like Mike Bloom week on the podcast because uh, in addition to appearing here tonight, Mike Bloom and I uh, kicked off the Survivor 41 preseason on Rob is a podcast uh, with our preseason kickoff special. And then, Mike, uh, you and I have another podcast that is uh, dropping uh, tomorrow where we are going to hear interviews that you were able to uh, get with uh, the Survivor 41 contestants. We'll hear the first six interviews in one podcast episode on Wednesday. Yeah, let me uh, actually I'll take off my beard to uh get into my plug Mike Bloom, facial hair. it was you the whole time and i would have gotten away with it too if it wasn't for you meddling pirates <laughs> and that mangy snake of yours uh yeah so it, i had the pleasure of being able to submit questions to the 18 contestants of survivor 41 ahead of time was able to capture their answers in audio form uh some answers went to the articles that i am currently writing uh at this mm -hmm. moment over at parade.com but rob i had the pleasure of getting together with you to play some audio from those interviews uh to be able to break down you know between that my articles and their bios as well as other supplementary information you know who are these 18 new people that are coming to play survivor in fiji for the first time That's in a, a year plus yeah. uh so it's, it's a big deal it's been a really fun time so far and the first six people should be up in your feed uh maybe by the time you're already listening to this okay all right uh check that out plus uh we're also gonna have uh some other patron goodies along the way uh now that is the uh month of september uh, we'll also be doing some uh survivor preseason content that is going to be uh patron exclusives as well uh great time to become a patron of robin's podcast here now that we are in the new month of september at robin's website.com slash patron okay let's get to survivor prolongs haley tell me why were you we would have let you be here any week why, why did you say pearl islands baby it's my favorite season. It is the most rewatchable season. It has everything. Banger cast. Best premiere ever. Hilarious twist. Honestly, big fan of the outcast twist. Not going to lie to you. Uh, like, just the, the best characters in Survivor all collected into one. And it's just... It's just such a rip roaring great time. Like it's it's a first for so many reasons. One of them, it's like this is the clothes on your back era, and that's it. Like it's it's like this for the rest oh, of Survivor. Yeah, Tyler basically. Perry saw this and he's like, oh, this is my favorite season too. And it's just like there's so many jaw dropping moments, and like even watching it now, and I this is the season I've seen the most. I'm st I still get so excited watching it. It's just so much fun. I laugh out loud. I cry. I just have a great time. Did I watch it on 1.5 speed this time because I delayed my start? Yes, yes, I did. But it was mm -hmm. still fantastic. Mike Bloom, yeah. an honest to goodness survivor historian. Of course, you know all the seasons uh, backwards and forwards. Uh, why was it important for you to talk about Survivor Pearl Islands? 
backwards, forwards, and at 1.5 speed as well. Pearl Islands is uh, an incredibly important season of Survivor. I think it ushers in uh, a lot of big moments, a lot of huge moments, not only Survivor, but reality television and characters are ushered in through Survivor Pearl Islands. I think if we're defining Survivor by eras, this is definitively, I mean, look no further than this rankings to confirm it, the definitive old school season where there is still a bit of a focus on maybe some of those more survival elements, but there's plenty of strategy. There's plenty of character moments and there is blind sides on blind sides on blind sides, especially in that post merge. The theme is by far the best theme we've ever experienced in the survivor season. And it's not a theme in a titular theme. Nobody is sent to like the Jolly Roger to go receive an extra vote or something <laughs> every episode. But instead they they imbue it to focus on like twists and, you know, really fun game mechanics that only pump up the importance of this cast. I really enjoy this cast. Uh, it's not really stars and scrubs for me. I know that there are obviously some people that we really are going to talk a lot about, but I feel like it represents old school Survivor in a really interesting way in that for the most part, with the exception of I would say two people, it really is a distillation of like normal people whose personalities pop a little bit on television. We're not mm -hmm. necessarily getting like the teen TV, you know, over the top personalities that we might in modern day Survivor seasons when they want to create big epic moments. Like a lot of people in this are relatively good humored, excited to play, but not necessarily like the, the most inimitable characters in Survivor history. And then there are at the same time, you throw that in as a bonus. I would suffice it to say that Pearl Islands to me is a microcosm of reality TV in general. And I'll elaborate on that more as we go through here. But I feel like this season just contains everything to know and everything to love about the genre of reality TV. And I think that's incredibly special. I mean, I think that that's a very interesting uh, premise to open up with uh, that I w wonder, like looking back at it now that you say it like that, I wonder if that maybe the, in Survivor's first six seasons, it was trying to assemble a collection of maybe normal people where then in the like dichotomy of the biggest hero and the biggest villain that we ever get, is Survivor now, to some degree, uh, chasing that system uh, in all future seasons? It's an interesting point because, I mean, this it's safe to say, look, the two people I'm talking about, Rupert and Johnny Fairplay, uh, one what I would say is, is like consciously pursuing a larger than life role on the show. One, I think unconsciously, as he will say in the reunion. But suffice it to say, yeah, I mean, this is also a very different editing style. I feel like you know, it is a very Rupert centric uh, for a lot of the time that he is on it, but he is only on for half the season. And so I, I do wonder, though, if that, you know, lays a couple of seeds down the path of, OK, there's people like Sugar and Coach and Russell Hans, these people that we can sort of like big personalities we can focus airtime around. In this case, not at the expense of other people. There aren't really like purple players this season, I would say, in comparison. But it is a little bit of feast and famine of here are some big people to the matter of, if you look at the Survivor Pearl Islands DVD, who's staring at you front and center? Not Sandra Diaz Twine. It is Rupert. I think that shows you what they're trying to emphasize in their storytelling. And to your point, how it might be a departure from the previous six seasons. Haley, you are wearing the tie dye top tonight. I, I am curious to know, uh, how does Rupert 1.0 hold up on this rewatch? In my opinion, I think Rupert 1.0 holds up incredibly well. I still think that Go dude Rupert. is is an amazing character, and I feel it is funny because I feel like Mike, you were you were saying about how, um, you know, there's the kind of di dichotomy between Johnny Fairplay like chasing that character and Rupert just being that character. Where I feel like in every season after that. Rupert is trying to catch that lightning in a bottle he had in Pearl Islands and it just does not feel the same way and so um it had been a while since I watched Pearl Islands but I had watched it in like the spring um and I was like sucked right back into that to to that Rupert hold of like joy and you know being around the podcast for so long we've we've had our fun and games with the Rupert bot and sure. you know Rupert what tweets. yeah what he's kind of turned into over the years but 
Rupert in Pearl Island is just phenomenal. Like he's so exciting. He's so genuine. He's so like, he's so gripping. He is just such a gripping character and he's flawed, but like you're rooting for him. He's just, he, he he's great. And like, I almost wish that they just never went back to the well of Rupert. And I understand why they did. Like he's the biggest character in the first, probably all the whole series of Survivor. Everyone knows who Rupert is. But it's just like, I almost wish they just left it alone. And I know they couldn't have, but like this version of Rupert is still like so easy to root for and get Rupert for, I guess. <laughs> yeah. I, I He's easy. He's so like, he's great. Mm-hmm. I love him. I love I him in this season. Completely agree. I mean, let me put out a hot take here. Uh, Rupert Bonham is unabashedly one of my favorite Survivor characters ever. And it's weird to say because I think he that was, was the hot take. I mean, I think so because I think to Haley's point, no, like in twenty, in I would say in twenty like seventeen, that take is like, Ooh. Mm-hmm. but like yeah. after watching the season, you're like, bang, and that's bang, the thing baby. Is, is that I I think that Rupert, we've experienced some Rupert fatigue. To right, Haley's okay. point, where, like, you're worried about mention, being like a basic bloom, where people yeah, where people mention him so much, like, oh my god, you like Rupert, but here's the thing. Rupert is always an incredible character to me because Rupert acts like he is in a Shakespearean drama. He gives the most melodramatic, overdrawn, pausey confessionals I have ever heard of from a Survivor contestant. And again, I still think to Haley's point, this is unabashedly him. Like this is still who Rupert is as a person, but like the gravity with which Rupert brings into every single situation that happens over the course of this season is amazing things like him tearing apart a coconut and saying so much rot and death here it's like he's like he's richard the third monologuing that's what it feels like to me watching rupert he is he's really epic in a sense that he does not expect to be whatsoever and i love every time they cut to him because you know he's gonna say something very dramatic that does not apply to the situation whatsoever yeah, uh, that rotten death confessional comes when uh, he didn't get taken on a reward challenge. Yeah, and he's ripping apart a coconut saying so much rotten death. And he like looks around him like so much rotten death here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so true, Rupert. Let's talk about the winner of the season, uh, Sandra. Haley, was Sandra Diaz Twine uh, appreciated in the real time for her win in Survivor Pearl Islands, or did it take her winning in Heroes versus Villains for people to appreciate Sandra's win in Pearl Islands? I think it's even taken beyond that, honestly. And like, w- I watched this season when it was originally on, but what year was it? Like 2000 and like 2003. Three? Yeah. So I was like 12. Um, Same. so, so I watched it and I loved it and I enjoyed it, but, um, I don't remember any talk about Sandra's win. And I feel like even after, I, I, I feel like it's hard for people to say that they didn't prefer a Sandra win to a Lil win. I, I think where we really get into the arguments is in Heroes versus Villains, people saying that Sandra didn't deserve to win over Parvati. And I think it took a couple years past that even to be like, oh my God, Sandra's the best. Like Mm -hmm. looking at what she did in Pearl Islands and then looking at what she did in Heroes versus Villains and seeing what she's doing in her, you know, she's played two more times since then, lost both times, but I think she still tried to be herself, but like do what she's known to do. And I never felt like Sandra was really pulling a Rupert in any of her other seasons where being like, I know what they want from me, so I'm going to play it up. Like she Mm -hmm. was just always her. And I think... I don't think many people except Sandra could win with a Sandra game. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would say that I feel like that Sandra does get to that place uh, by the uh, game changers version of Sandra, at least least to some degree uh, where that I feel like that, uh, but in her first two times where they Sandra doesn't play uh, we're we're not doing heroes versus villains tonight. uh, But that Sandra, you know, there's 14 seasons in between uh, when she plays uh, here and in Heroes versus Villains. Like, I, I think that she comes back that same earnest Sandra that she is here in this season. Yeah. And I think it's a matter of she says this in her final tribal council, right? She's like, listen, I played to who I was at the end of the day. Like, I was going to be, you know, truthful to you about whether or not I was going to work with you. And I think time certainly helped her. You know, there there was some rumors I remember being bandied about about her returning for All Stars. And I don't think that would have been a good idea because I think with 14 other winners after her, 
she very much sort of fell under the radar again, I think in comparison mm. to a lot of other people to the point where she is one of four winners brought back for survivor heroes versus villains. And I, if I think if you ask someone preseason, like of the four winners, who's probably the one that's going to last the longest. If you take out maybe challenge performance, it'd probably be Sandra because she'd be able to sort of equate the same thing that she did before, which is just like, let me serve as a vote for someone. Let them take each other out. I slip through with unlikable people, present myself as the better option and rake in the cash once again. It, it's, mm -hmm. it's really interesting to see how, I remember at the time during Heroes versus Villains, people were excited to see Sandra from a character perspective, not from a strategy perspective, because Sandra, again, is an, a phenomenal character. I mean, there's a reason why she gets the first confessional of the season and an even greater reason why she's swearing in that confessional is because like she is, as Jeff calls her, uh, um, the, the mouthiest mother that he has ever seen. And yeah. so I think to have her come back, it was like, oh, great. I want to get more. I can get loud too. what the F moments. Not really more so like, oh, I can't wait to see more Sandra strategy happen. Mm -hmm. And the Sandra moments are all over this season, Haley, and uh, some that I did not really even remember. I mean, and I know all of the iconic ones, uh, but when she goes to Morgan to take their tarp, that was something that I had uh, completely forgotten about. And that is one of the best Sandra moments. It's just it's it's so perfect in her and it's just in she's not like getting mad at them she's just like okay i'll do what i gotta do but, they're, but they you. are getting mad at her the morgans, well, yeah, the, morgans the morgans have no chill like that's just that's just the season there yeah the, the morgans i think what i forgot about this is especially in the first half of the pre-merge it really is goofus and gallant and i feel like we haven't we sort of remember that with being Oolong versus uh, Karor right in Palau, but I feel like it starts a little bit with Marquesas, but really here where Morgan in the first half of the pre-merge does literally everything wrong and Drake does everything right. And I feel like we hadn't really seen that for a while in Survivor. It was sort of paving the way for like a steamroll that ends up, of course, completely backfiring in the Drake's faces after they throw that challenge. It's it's crazy how they they went into the merge even on even footing mm -hmm. and like not i mean like even footing with the number of people like i wouldn't say like yeah. even footing like loyalty but i just it's just such, yeah. it's just such a magical season like every episode is an absolute banger i was like oh like we just watched this can't like i skip an episode or two no you can't they're, they're all great like it's all fantastic yeah, even like the the Rhino Boot episode, which I would say is probably the most blasé, I think still has some stuff in it, right? Like that's where we're setting up this big fall of Rupert. And so it's really important for the story of that. I totally agree with Haley. I think there's at least something in every episode of this season, which you honestly, even with some of the best seasons, cannot say about a Survivor season. It's that good. We talked about uh, two thirds of the big three. Uh, Johnny Fairplay on uh, the rewatch. Uh, Haley, uh, how was that for you going back to Johnny Fairplay? Um, is he a dude that like I'd personally want to hang out with? No, I also don't think he'd want to hang out with me. I just don't think we have much in common. Um, but he's a fun character, and I think especially matched with Rupert and matched with Sandra it's like this like triangle of insanity it's like it's magical and they're all like play it's it's crazy how many great characters there are in this season and especially on that Drake tribe like it's the most entertaining tribe ever probably mm -hmm. and it, they're all playing so differently but so hard and it's just really entertaining and you know Johnny Fairplay is very deliberate about so many things. It's he, he pre-gamed in a in an era where you couldn't really pre-game yet. He did that. Um, he, he's very interesting. Um, and you guys were talking on the Micronesia podcast that Jeff Probst hated him in Micronesia. Hates him here too. Like I don't Not think it was much. just that fist Not fight. That, yeah. No, yeah. I don't know. There's a lot of like uh, you know predating Penner. I suppose you got this a little bit in your season too, though, Rob. Like a lot of back and forth between Penner and Johnny Fairplay. Johnny Fairplay always has the one-liners to match Jeff Probst, and this is still in an era where I think he's okay with it until All Stars, where he's just like, okay, please treat me like a host and not just like uh, a sounding board here. I mean, yeah. I'll put this out here: Johnny Fairplay is the most important character of Survivor Pearl Islands. Uh, not only from a source of entertainment, but also like 
the post merge is about him, Burton, and Lil, right? It's about the three of them jumping sides in this absolutely chaotic way, taking people out in their wake. Uh, and I think that's something he wanted to do. He obviously had an agenda coming in. Rob, I'm so interested to hear from you because, I mean, listen, your season came beforehand. He, Fair Play has said many times he based his game off of you. I mean, when you watch that, like, I, I don't know, do you feel like a parent watching a, ch a child play, you know, off of your game? Uh, I, I don't want to take any credit for uh, what uh, he's doing here in the game. You know, it, I am happy to hear that, you know, uh, to hear him retell the story that he said that he thought that the show was boring. And then he watched my season. He's like, oh, you can go ahead and like uh, go from side to side. And, and then ultimately it doesn't have to be just like voting in a group. So, I mean, uh, that that's uh, very nice to hear that, you know, I, I did something in my season and somebody else like moved the ball forward in uh, the next season and helped contribute to the evolution of the show. So I'm very happy, uh, you know, to see that other people like were able to take something away from w what I did. Um, again, I, I don't want to uh, like take uh, too much uh, credit or blame for uh, Johnny Fairplay. <laughs> Exactly. It cuts both ways. It's like nice. that's, It was nice to hear. Like that sword that is the immunity idol, it cuts both ways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, I do wonder, though, um, do you think, is it possible that Sandra learned anything from watching Survivor of the Amazon? Haley, in watching uh, the Amazon back a couple of weeks ago, like I, I was thinking about like uh, playing the game uh, more individually. Like I kind of feel like that that is also... Um, Sandra's uh, methodology for approaching the game of like, uh, I'm not necessarily going to stick with a, a group. I'm always going to try to uh, find what's best for me personally. Yeah, I guess. Like, was she a Survivor fan going into this? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. I don't think I, I realized that. Then I, I think that's really cool. Then um, I also think it's just like a part of her personality where she's very much willing to say like anyone but me. I don't care. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know them from a hole in the wall. Like, great yeah i mean off. this is not anything that she's ever said for the record i i'm just right. I'm, I'm just wondering like that makes as, sense like, though people who are like coming along and have seen the show before you know is it is it more than just johnny Fairplay who is uh, looking at the game as uh being more of an individual game than a team game well yeah, i think even like burton's looking at it like that too i think you could probably even like we don't see a lot of sean but i bet he could see it like that um I, it, it's funny because like the morgan's are very much like let's stick together and i wonder if it's just because they trauma bonded so much where the drakes are very much willing to like cut each other's throats and i wonder if it's because they spent so long together and it's like the colin stone theory it's like you want to go to tribal and like get people out so that you really get that core core alliance well look at the leaders of the two tribes right like we're going to talk about another big character survivor returnee himself andrew savage was like the cheerleader of the Morgans, he was the one to, I think, really rally them around. Every pre-merge episode pretty much feels like uh, it has some sort of inspirational speech from Andrew Savage about how they're going to go get them. And the leader of the Drakes are, I guess, Rupert? But, like, people have resentment towards him. They literally point and laugh at him behind his back. So I think it depends on, like, uh, you know, the leadership, I guess, is dependent on how you feel about the leader and will you stick together from that perspective and compare Andrew Savage safe throughout the entirety of the pre-merge, Rupert almost gets voted off in episode six because they're just like, ah, screw it. Let's get rid of him. I think that just shows like the difference in mentality between the two tribes. Let's talk about some of the uh, twists of the season. Uh, how about, let's start with uh, the way that the survivors are marooned here, Haley. Uh, we'll talk about the premiere, but what about the survivors uh, being thrown out and uh, having to walk the plank and then basically with only the clothes on their backs? I loved it. Like like Mike said earlier, it's just every single thing they threw into the season, it felt very like thematic and it just made sense. And it, it didn't feel like they were trying to like extra torture them. It was like, this is this is what might ha would happen if you were a pirate. It was it was very interesting. It was so cool. Like I love there's so many points in the season where it's just the cast is shocked and this was one of them and I loved it. And did I feel bad? I think it was Tijuana who had to like jump into the water with her like little kitten heels. Like, oh what a nightmare. But it it's great. Every part of it's great. I, I would I want that to happen to me? No. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it was fantastic. 
Yeah, the, the, this is definitely a season where I think you kind of have to divorce your emotions a bit from, I don't know, being sympathetic towards the players because to be candid, uh, a, a lot of unfair things happen to them over the course of the season between this, between the outcast, between the jury winning an immunity challenge. Like this very much feels like, you know, the Mark Burnett sort of TV experiment side of things, right? Of like, we're really going to try to start to shake things up. We threw in a swap in episode three, and that certainly served as something. Let's start to shake up things a little bit more. And it starts here. I mean, they got completely flummoxed. They thought they were flying out for cast photos, mm -hmm. and they end up being stranded on the clothes of their backs. Poor Lillian Morris has to spend two months in a Boy Scout uniform that she has to keep as immaculate as possible lest she earn the ire of her troop. But even things like, uh, you know, and Jeff Probst will certainly make comments about this because this is a Jeff Probst single and ready to mingle phase uh, pre Julie Berry, right? Talking hey, about like, where are them boobs at? No, yeah, like, no Nick, bras on these ladies. Nicole not wearing anything under the dress. Like, oh, she's going to be the most popular person here. Uh, but they get they confiscate like all their their goods as well, right? Like Austin buys I an entire that in Survivor China too about uh, that Ashley. Show. Yeah, yeah. He's like, well, I guess you'll be popular. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's Jeff and not Tyler Perry that wants people to be stranded in their skivvies. Like, yeah, this is this is it. Because uh, this is the first time that they did it. I mean, Rob, you can attest to this, right? That like previously you sort of pack some outfits mm -hmm. to use. And at least this time they gave them sneakers and at the final six gave them swimsuits. That's an incredibly long time. Only some of the people got swimsuits. Mm hmm. That's absolutely wild. But yeah, it really created this moment of marooning. I think that's what they wanted to create was just like, not just a, a general like, hey, you're hopping off a boat into a into the water. It really is like, you're on the SS probes. And I say a vast G matey, walk the plank and start swimming lest the sharks get you. And you have to essentially find your way home now by buying things at the town. And so they try to create that. Uh, and unfortunately, it means that like uh, poor Sean's Armani suit gets cut up. Uh, but then Rupert ends up with about like three different skirts from the experience too. Okay, so you win some, you lose some. That's how I actually learned. Uh, surprise, surprise! I've never swam in jeans before, and so Rupert helped teach me not to do that. <laughs> Were you planning to do that? I don't know. I mean, it's one of those things where you're like, well, I might as well try something once. But once I hear Rupert talk about, you know, that just wet on denim, just rubbing against each other, I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. Rupert, I got it. I'm not gonna do it. Thank mm -hmm. you. You taught me mm -hmm. something today, Rupert. So important. Such, such a PSA during the season for uh, anybody who is going to go swimming in denim. Uh, don't do it, kids. Also, a big twist in the season, the outcasts. Haley, I, I didn't realize that I, I, I was not uh, really like uh, in the internet discourse around uh, Survivor Pearl Islands at the time that did you feel like that the outcast twist was heinously unfair? I mean, yeah, but it was so exciting. Like mm -hmm. I, I can't remember the last time I was so shocked during an episode. You were like, good. I was complete. I had, I had no expectations of that. And like, and it's not like they brought back two snoozers with this twist. Like, I feel like we got rid of a couple snoozers for it actually. Ooh, ooh. Um, but it, getting Lil and Burton back and having them be such like a big part of that end game. And I get why it's unfair and I get why people don't like it. I'm just not in that camp. I think it's great. I don't think they need to do it ever again. I don't think that it has ever needed to come back, but just like fitting with the theme of this season, it's perfection. It's incredibly exciting. It's, it is unfair, but sometimes survivors unfair and it's a lot of fun. Yeah, so a few things about that, because I agree that obviously it's incredibly unfair. Any any Survivor contestant will tell you that, including those people out there, right? They voted those people out. There was nothing in the ethos that ever said any people ever had a chance of coming back. This was the very first time. And so it really did, it really did screw them over. And I'm sure we'll talk about, you know, if they merge the way they do in Episode 7, is Andrew Savage still finishing in 10th place? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. But there are things looking back on it now, 18 years later, that I think make it much more palatable, especially yeah. in comparison to Redemption Island and Edge of Extinction. It ends at the merge, which is great. This means mm -hmm. that we're not getting an entire episode upon episode stuff. 
it was all off screen, which granted, I think that led to some sketchy circumstances as to like how well fed were the outcasts really? Were they really living on meager portions? Uh, mm -hmm. I would not necessarily believe it, but it means that unlike Edge of Extinction or Redemption Island, we're not taking time away from the castaways to go to yeah. Outcast Pavilion and deal with it. I really enjoyed the fact that, to be candid, that it wasn't just one challenge to determine who would come back. I would have appreciated Edge of Extinction a lot more if there was a vote to bring somebody back. I really liked that extra mechanic of first you have to win a challenge and then you sort of have to do not necessarily social or strategic maneuvering, but like your standing matters to get voted back in. And lastly, uh, you know, we're also watching this from a time where International Survivor has been using non-elimination twists out the wazoo, right? That's, that's the MO of Australian Survivor. And I have sort of learned to come more at peace of non-eliminations or bringing people back if there is a contribution to the story if there's like an importance to those people coming back. And to Haley's point, Burton and Lil are such incredibly important pieces of the back half of this season that I really appreciate that they come back this way. I think it's a really great storyline watching, for example, you know, Lil pay it forward to Savage, watch Burton bring Rupert into a bro hug, give him immunity and then vote him out two episodes later. Like there's really, really fantastic narrative stuff going on with the outcasts. And so I think if you got to bring people back, across the board this is the way to do it yeah i especially when you say it like that mike if you told me that there was gonna be an outcast twist in survivor 41 i'd be totally okay with it i mean maybe you don't have to bring back two people maybe bring back one person at the merge but i, I would be fine if in every single survivor season uh somebody that got voted out pre-merge is gonna have a chance to get back in at the merge and that's it don't bring anybody back at the final six it feels like jury management in the beginning right mm -hmm. like it's you it's not just trying to protect those relationships after you hit a certain number. It's like trying to have those good relationships all the way through because it was very much proven where um, Andrew more or less screwed over Lil or in her mind screwed her over. And that came back to bite him in the ass and he got voted out. Back to me. Yeah. yeah. And like, it's great. Like it's hard to imagine this season without Burton and Lil in it. And, I'd like to, I'd, I don't know. I'd love to play out the second half in another podcast some other day. All right. But Mike, so <laughs> Brand Steel. All right. Exactly. We'll see what happens. Austin's, Austin's going to end up winning just if we're using Brand Steel <laughs> logic. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I, so at the end of the day, again, I, I do, it, it's not great on, in that, like, I never love the idea of, like, once you're voted out, you should be gone. Like, I love the finality of the tribe has spoken. But to Haley's point, if it's like a one-time thing that makes a season unique, I'm more fine with it. Uh, and it Survivor fits so perfectly with it too. Yeah, exactly. Like, like it Survivor doesn't stick out. Yeah, as a perfect example of that, Survivor South Africa did a season that was actually very similarly pirate themed, where you could steal idols from people. Uh, and I remember talking about this with Shannon Gus, and I'm like, "How unfair do you think this this is?" And she says, "Yeah, it's unfair, but like." I can forgive it more in that it happened one time and it's with theming in the season. And I agree with her there. Like, yes, it's not the best game mechanic, but if it's creating entertaining television and is relatively contained to like one extreme example, I'm more than satisfied with it. Okay. Anything else big picture about Survivor or Pearl Islands before we talk through the season? Are y'all pirate fans? <laughs> I do love Pittsburgh. Yeah, they're okay. Yeah, because I mean, listen, if you're not a fan of pirates, I you either will be by the end or like even less of one. Because I I seem to recall Pirates of the Caribbean came out in what? Like, I think it was the summer of 2003. Yeah. So like this was Mark Burnett trying to strike while the iron is hot. Uh, you know, obviously lots of Captain Jack Sparrow comparisons. And it's so interesting to see them like embrace that, but also embrace obviously like the Pearl Islands was not a fabricated location. It had a pirate history, but. For my money, we have never seen such commitment to an aesthetic theme as Survivor Pearl Islands, and that makes it all the more special, in my opinion. Yeah, they really uh, nailed it. It was a cool theme. They went all in on it, and uh, Haley, uh, it's, a, it's a great effect uh, to you know keep with casting uh, Rupert, having the luck to have cast a person who wanted to be like a uh, great uh, pirate esque villain in the season uh, just uh, all in all uh what just a, 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 a amazing uh just uh, all of the events coming together 
Yeah, and I now that you say that, I wonder if like knowing that the se- the season is kind of pirate themed, if that gave people more of like a carte blanche to be like, let's lie, cheat, and scheme more. Like, like let's, pirate master. Yeah, let's do it. Um, mm. one more thing, I-, I will say for like such a great season, a lot of these challenges are a snooze fest. Especially like we got like what six shooting challenges in the back half of this. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, Haley, you can't say that unless you're a killer and you have to shoot your own dartboard first to become <laughs> the killer before you can kill. With a blow dart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I will say uh, the challenges I would say I think are lacking in spectacle. I do appreciate the commitment to the theme though because it did seem like pretty much every challenge had some sort of pirate thing. Like Jeff always went into a pirate explanation of they used to hit blow darts. They used to crawl across the riggage. Uh, on a pirate ship. Granted, were they epic challenges? Not whatsoever, though I love that first challenge. I'm so excited to talk about that first challenge. But I think for me, going back and watching this in 2021, it's a it's a breath of fresh air, is what it is, compared to the umpteenth season in Fiji of standing there holding a ball in place for as long as possible. Shoot some muskets. I'm fine with it. It's It's less impressive, but I like the difference at least. Mike, ding, marry, and kill, a musket, a blow dart, and uh, a slingshot. <laughs> I mean, something tells me that blow dart's been around, so definitely ding it. Uh, I'm going to marry I'm gonna marry the slingshot. Really? I'm I feel like the slingshot, slingshot has more accuracy, and I'm going to kill the musket. Good I luck. Have, yeah, exactly. Well, the musket might kill me, because, uh, yeah, I feel like uh, if I'm trying to hunt with the musket, apparently I'm just going to burn everything down, because according to Survivor Pearl Islands, all muskets are just, like, explode upon impact. Mm-hmm. Yep, in slow motion. Sure, sure. Um, I think I would kill the blow dart. Um, I'm not putting my mouth on that after everybody else has been uh, passing around uh, that blow gun. Uh, hey, we're in a pandemic here. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. Do pirates care about communicable diseases? Hmm. I think that pr- most pirates, I think, were pretty much uh, all pro mask. I think that that's, uh, you know, I, I think it also could double as an eye patch. So I think that uh, pirates, I think if they were here around today, I think they would have been very COVID safe. And most pirating is done outdoors anyway, Mike. That's very true. There's no really indoor pirating going on, but it's also mm-hmm. like then they, maybe that's why I like to keep things in chess, right? It's like to keep it outside of open air exposure so people don't touch their stuff. Sure. sure. All right. Um, before we lose the plot any further, why don't we go back to the start of it all? And, and let's talk about uh, the Pearl Islands premiere. And I'm wondering maybe if instead of uh, talking through it episode by episode, Maybe we should, uh, once we uh, talk about the premiere, because it's so iconic, we could talk through uh, the story of the Drake tribe and the story of the Morgan tribe uh, as uh, their own entities. Yeah, I think that that makes sense. Because again, like we said, like the first half is Morgan's downfall and the second half is really like the fall of Drake slash the rise of Morgan. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the Pearl Islands is going to open with the marooning on the pirate ship. And Jeff tells them that they're going into the game now. And I think what's really amazing, Haley, is that Jeff uh, collects the personal items from all of the players. Uh, And I thought that this was uh, very iconic to get to see what each person was carrying with them. Also, like, were they labeled bags? Like, I'd be worried I wasn't getting my, like, wedding rings back. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And How did Austin okay. had like bottles of booze yeah. from like the yeah, maybe it's just because lady pockets aren't usually that big, but like, how did he fit a whole bottle of booze in there? How big are his pockets? Like, <laughs> did, did he purposely retrofit his pockets to smuggle in not like one bottle? Like, I saw a bottle of rum in there, a bottle of wine. What was this man intending to do? Now, look, Austin would be the first to tell you he's not prepared for a survivor, and I think we got firsthand experience <laughs> there. Yeah, I mean, I could totally see hitting the duty-free shop on the way home from Survivor, but it does feel like a little bit of a weird move to like, oh, I'm on my way to Survivor. Let me me just stop in here real quick and pick up some booze. Yeah, like unless you thought you were going to spend a lot of time on jury. Or maybe Austin was like, I'm going to make this pre-jury trip absolutely banging. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, that, that was, uh, very interesting. Uh, everybody's going to, uh, walk the plank and, uh, head, head out to see a- anything else from, uh, the, from the opening before our players are going to head off to the Panamanian fishing village. 
Well, we have like a pseudo showman's building, right? Uh, we have Krista sees Rupert come over, you know, like, he's a big old hippie and he's stronger than ox. And it's like, <laughs> it's like, these are the people that are be calling each other BB baby like two weeks from now and a romance is born. <laughs> I love Krista so much. She is uh, like a oh freaking. Oh my God. Oh my God, Sean is the biggest puss I've ever seen. <laughs> like, Chris is one of my favorite voices to do because it's like a, a congested Muppet, and I love it so much. <laughs> oh God, I love her so much. I love every single person on this season. They're all fantastic. You could have brought back this whole cast and just played it again and had a nice time. Mm -hmm. Every if single person, Haley. There's, uh, there's no misses. Okay, if if we're going to say like who's an app of a character. Sure. Trish and Michelle. Oh, mm, interesting. Okay. Well, who do you think I was going to say? Well, I was talking about Rob's well, wife. No, <laughs> leave, Nicole would have been amazing. Leave my wife out of this. Nicole would have wife... been amazing if she stayed, and she had a great first episode. You yeah. can't tell me that she wouldn't have been good. I mean, to me, that I I, I always looked at Sean Cohen, I feel like. No, oh, no. I no. think Sean, Sean is a much bigger character than mm -hmm. I think people remember. He was a big mm -hmm. antagonist in this pre-merge. And I think mm -hmm. if he would have made it past the merge, I think he would have been a real, real power player here. Mm-hmm. What about Skinny Ryan? Oh, I love Skinny Ryan. God, I'm so mad he never or... came back. Like, I'm not going to... I love Skinny Ryan. Skinny Ryan I looks like a, Skinny Ryan looks like a Shia LaBeouf role. That's she what does, I noticed this like, time around. That one, and I feel so bad because like he's one. He's like he's he's like the first Eric Reichen back, and he's so excited to be there. But like no one else is excited to have him there, and it's so it breaks my heart. Like, uh, do you think he's? Yeah, Lola even calls him by his, his government name, right? She's like, Ryan I, love, Shoulders. I love Ryan Shoulders. This is a weird first episode. Everyone's calling Lillian Lily. Like, I think everyone's still trying to get settled into the whole nickname thing uh, that people are, are just sort of trying to feel out exactly what everyone's called in this moment. Do you think Skinny Ryan's still a fan? No. No, you, I'm pretty can sure. Can you text him for me? I, I think someone I think someone said in one of the quarantine questionnaires that Skinny Ryan has, like, scrubbed himself from social media. Oh, okay. I uh, hope it wasn't because he had a lot of bad takes. I don't know. Like, I would not be yeah. surprised if he's like a mountain man at a local grocery store, you know, just sort of like mm -hmm. off the grid. We, we saw him off the grid once and it didn't go well for him. <laughs> yeah. I think I met him at the Survivor All-Stars reunion because, you know, I, I always I did feel like a kinship to Skinny Ryan because right. I felt like that basically uh, I like going out to Survivor. I, I kind of thought that Skinny Ryan's experience was going to be the experience I was going to have. Yeah, he sort of I mean, like and ultimately painting. it would be this experience that I would have in uh, Panama. Wah, well, he's, paint, he's painting the invoice for you, right? Like this yeah. idea of like, well, we can't have this Rob Sesternino kid. To that point, Haley, I, I really felt bad during the, I think it was the Outcast episode, right? When they're like, Skinny Ryan would have perished by now. And they're just like, oh, whenever they feel down, they're just like, you know what? You know who sucks? Skinny Ryan. <laughs> and like, that was their big rallying moment. It's sad. It makes me sad. And I really, I like Skinny Ryan and I wish he got a little bit more of a chance. And I think if he was on the Drake tribe, I think him and Rupert might have had a nice kinship. And it was just like, he just got on the wrong side of things and it just did not work out well for him. And it That's just makes, it makes me so sad that he was like such a big fan and this was probably like such a shit time for him. That's, that's a thought experiment. Swap Skinny Ryan and Johnny Fairplay and see what happens. <sighs> I feel like they go out in the same spot. <laughs> Maybe not Skinny Ryan doesn't make it to number three, but like, mm -hmm. I feel I like know. Johnny Fairplay is going out early on. on I know, you know, drive. Rupert has a certain opinion of John, right? He's like, reminds me of one of my kids going out and getting honey, smoking something, drinking something. I don't getting think you get honey. That. Yeah, that, that, that's is I that a euphemism. I mean, listen, I, I'll, I'll fair be it for me. He's to... always uh, sweetening his herbal tea. <laughs> He's after me, lucky charm. Knocking off beehive after beehive. Yeah, I think he says something like that. Again, this is why Rupert is such a, un a weird character is because he has these weird phrases like, uh, a, you know, saltwater catfish. I didn't know they made such an animal. Or, uh, you know, uh, yeah, talking about how uh, he reminds the giant fair play. Where, oh, John reminds me of my boys who I mentor and just pop off with stupid stuff. Talking about getting some honey or smoking something, drinking something. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I mean, no lies detected. No, I mean, John is a bear. Mm hmm. <laughs> so, fact check. 
yeah, uh, Little John uh, is what or, they or, call or him. Big, or Big John, depending on who's calling him, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Depending where John is in relation to what you're saying. Okay. So let's talk about the, uh, this uh, trip to the Panamanian uh, fishing village, because really, uh, we don't ever see anything like this before or after in the history of the show. And uh, uh, Mike, uh, they give them uh, what? Some uh, doubloons? Uh, Balboas. Balboas. Uh, the the currency of Panama, apparently, to to trade with. And yeah, this is really, really cool. Uh, and, you know, this is one of those things that I would love to start another season with. I don't know how you could do it thematically necessarily, because I think with the way Survivor situated now, they're not necessarily near uh, maybe the aesthetic of the village that they were going for. Right. I think what they were going for was, hey, here are some Americans like it's almost amazing racy. Right. It felt like an mm -hmm. amazing race task of like wander up and Teams down the street. We'll have uh, 100 Balboas to trade for supplies that they'll need for the next 39 days. Yeah. And then Austin gets like a 30 minute penalty for selling his clothes or something. So, I mean, I think it was a really great way to just get to know people instantly to see like how they react in this moment. I'll put out a question here. Uh, does Sandra have the best opening episode for a winner ever? Yeah, I think so. I think I, I I maybe think that this is the reason why she stayed so long during during that opening bit when usually she should be in trouble. She her name was never whispered on anyone's lips going out. I didn't mean they never went to tribal, so that whatever, but like I, I think she saved herself for the entire season with this moment. Yeah. It's a super strong opening for Sandra. I'd have to like really go through all 40 seasons to give you a definitive answer, but she's got to be up there because she comes in and she's such a rock star to come through here and uh, be able, she's wheeling and dealing. And as we know from like many interviews uh, with Sandra one, uh, she's an extreme couponer. Yes. So she's not going to get ripped off. No, she took an entire barbecue <laughs> while they were celebrating the barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> she took the entire thing. Yeah, because like not me. only does she speak Spanish, which is like a huge thing, but she like you said, she is a, a, a schemer and dealer. Like she was like, I want everything. Like, let's get what we can get. And Rupert literally stealing the other people's shoes is just like perfection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's and that's I love that moment because that's one of those things I think in, in All Stars, Rob, right? Doesn't that get voted during that that America's Tribal Council is like one of the greatest moments in Survivor history. But it's odd because you think of Rupert as like the capital H hero of Survivor. And the very first thing we see him do is steal the other tribe's footwear that was given to them. But as he says, you know, pirates pillage, pirates steal. I stole for the Drake that like, well, it's, if it's in line with the theme, then we love him for it. Mm hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that being underhanded, but I think also like letting the audience know about what you're doing, especially if it's not anything that is like gross or horribly mean, like uh, just sort of like dunking on the other tribe. I think that that's acceptable. I think the audience is going to follow you uh, along for the ride on that. Yeah, it just it was a, a huge pivotal moment, a great introduction to the character of if anyone is committed to this bit, it is Rupert. They got either really lucky or they picked the perfect person to bring onto the pirate season because Rupert, I'd say what, like 25% of his confessionals are pirate themed. We, we joke nowadays, right? being like as a hustler, as a David, mm -hmm. but like Rupert was doing that back in 2003 with no prodding from production whatsoever. He was serving it up to them there. Yeah, Haley, what a find it must have been to know you're going to do a season about a pirate theme and then to find this man in casting it, it is just, um, I don't know if it, what his backstory is in terms of uh, had he ever applied before? Did he, like, did they meet him and say, oh, no, this is the theme? Do you think they, like, met him in the mall and handed them a contract on the spot? Oh, you think they were out looking for pirate types? No, I don't know. I don't know. It's possible, Ooh, right? Like, I Indiana? feel like... I, I don't know. Did he send a video no. in? Quick, go to all the landlocked states. Find me those pirates. <laughs> There's lots of lakes there. He said that's where he learned how to fish. Yeah, I suppose so. I don't know. Maybe it's something like uh, they sent out, you know, satellite people and be like, I found a picture of this guy. It really looks like a pirate. I think we could bring him on. Uh, I mean, Rupert is also just so odd looking. Like, mm -hmm. he looks like Hagrid, 
crossbred with Jerry Garcia with the way that he dresses. <laughs> It's such an odd aesthetic. And then add on top of that, like, oh, and I love being a pirate too. And it is the oddest tasting yet most delicious cocktail out there. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, the tribes are going to eventually uh, land on their beaches. Um, Whoa, wait, wait, wait. We, we yes? cannot get past the village without talking about the attempt at human trafficking that happens in Survivor Pearl Islands. <laughs> okay. Well, tell me about the woman who uh, really has a thing for Trish. Yeah, this is arguably like the the thing Trish is probably most known for in the season, right? Is like uh, they're bartering with this lady, Corazon, as Sandra will call her. And apparently this lady like gives them such a deal because she has a thing for Trish, like in a sexual way. Uh, yeah. And also this lady sort I mean, of- Sandra didn't know that. Come on, Sandra. Oh, she, I think she's got a good like sense of things about her, right? That's why we love Sandra as a player. But I mean, this lady sort of jokingly, but maybe not jokingly says, hey, I'll give you this pot if you trade me Trish. I mean, do you think they were allowed to go through with that trade if they could? <laughs> if they wanted to sacrifice a member of the tribe, like uh, I think it would have been above board, no? I just would love to look at the Wikipedia page for Survivor Pearl Islands, and it's like, you know, Trish, blah, 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 Drake Tribe, sold day one <laughs> to Shopkeeper. <laughs> I think she'd have to willingly go. I don't think that she would be allowed to be sold. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we shall see. But that was definitely a big... I, we did this uh, podcast a while ago, Rob, right? The greatest Survivor NPCs. She is absolutely up there as just like the random local to be like, well, I like you. I want to keep you. You can take everything I want, but she stays right now. Uh, and Trish is just like, uh-huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Oh, oh yeah. As in, Definitely the tone, right? Of like, I don't know the language, so let me just smile and nod and get out of here as soon as possible. Haley, it's too bad that Trish didn't make the loved ones visit, that they could have uh, brought this <laughs> shopkeeper out. Like, uh, Trish, it's the woman from the shop. And it was such a tonal shift from the woman for the shop to go from like wanting to marry Trish to yelling at Tijuana. <laughs> mm -hmm. My money. <laughs> yeah. Like you could see that like this, clearly they really got on this woman's good side. Cause like, if you cross her, she will like yell you out of house and home. Mm -hmm. What kind of shop did she run? It seemed like she ran, I don't know, some sort of like Panamanian container store. I'm not sure. Oh. Like, I, I don't know what they got there. Really? Those are very popular. I have never been to one. Mm, okay. All right. Mike, anything else from the fishing village before we talk about the tribes? I did notice one weird thing. And again, this is very amazing racy is that they had to find a boat driver and have enough money to be able to pay them, which is like such an odd thing. What if they didn't, what would they do if they had not enough money Bring to them drive back them to, to the village? You could drop back off where you started. Yeah, like, I guess you live here now. You have to set up mm -hmm. camp in the middle of town square. But I guess mm -hmm. the, the important story point we should bring home here is because, look, uh, I think I and a lot of the Survivor community are much kinder to Austin Taylor in retrospect than in 2003. I think especially in a history of quitters on Survivor, Austin does not make things better for himself. Maybe he was still reeling from losing out on all his booze by selling all of his clothes on an island setting where it is going to be freezing at night. Yeah. I played on these islands in the all stars uh, for at least a few days. Okay. And uh, yeah, I couldn't imagine uh, what it would have been like to have just uh, been there in just my underwear at nighttime in the Haley, rain. Haley, what did you think about Austin's choice of underwear though? The fact that we get to see his uh, juicy couture esque buzzed shorts, the entire pre It's interesting to imagine somebody wearing these unironically mm -hmm. yeah remember he was he he chose them. to pack these on vacation these, this was his photo shoot underwear yeah. and he was <laughs> now he's wearing them well Do you think he's fairness, gonna have like one of those cute moments where he just like mm -hmm. puts the pants under his butt and does like the cute like over the shoulder oh yeah did he think that photo shoot with, was like with a the alcohol like yeah like that, that's the that's photo it, shoot yeah he thought it was like a it's calendar a shoot. trophy he yeah. thought he was posing for the zaddy calendar for 2003 and he's like i've got my underwear i've got my bottles of you booze I'm ready to go. that's important that's important so good job ot all right uh let's talk about uh ot's tribe uh the morgan tribe because uh they are going to be the focus of the uh first few episodes of the show they're going to go to the uh first three tribal councils of the season and uh they do have a person who is uh running the ship here 
It is going to be uh, Captain Andrew Savage. Uh, Mike, uh, what do you think of Andrew's leadership here on the Morgan tribe? Well, he is certainly is not a wimpy little non-leader. That is no. 100% for sure. I, I love the role that Savage plays because Savage is also an incredibly intense person as well. Yeah. Right. I, one of my favorite Savage moments is when Johnny Fairplay visits them in episode six and he calls him a little piss ant. Uh, just like the took that the, away from us. Exactly. Like I, I love how Andrew Savage wears his heart on his suit sleeve. Uh, and I think maybe to Haley's point, it was a matter of like trauma early on that they just lost so much. And granted there were some expendable people, but like they were so beaten down that Andrew Savage felt like he was, uh, he thought he was uh, Emilio Estevez in the Mighty Ducks, right? Like he was like the the leader of this ragtag group, only to find out that hey, the big team threw the game. He's mm-hmm. a really interesting character to track. Uh, he has a lot of deliberation to him. I think he's actually a really fun narrator, but like at the same time, he's kind of an a hole too and so it's this weird complicated thing of he's supposed to be the leader of the underdogs who are supposed to throw our support behind but also he's kind of an a-hole do you think he knows how to have fun oh that's a good question i don't know if he's ever been given permission to have fun during his time on survivor (laughs) So I, that's not exactly my read on Andrew Savage. I think he's just like a super serious, but I, I think he's also like that, you know, if, if you're like part of his crew, he's just like intensely loyal. But like if you are one of like the others of the mm. like g- core group, then I feel like he has no use for you. Like, I feel like that he is not very good at sort of just like at least patronizing the people that are at the bottom and probably also like, uh, you know, uh, villainizes them to a degree, probably to keep the core group stronger. Yeah, I think it's one of these things where like you speak it enough, it becomes true, right? Like even in this first episode, it seemed like he was really making the push to get rid of Skinny Ryan above Nicole. He calls Skinny Ryan a limp noodle. Uh, And so you could tell he's like, I don't know. Maybe he just has a thing against skinny guys between the Ryan shoulders and Steven. He just saw like deja vu in his eyes. He doesn't uh, like a schemer or a skinny schemer at that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I think that, yeah, Andrew Savage, I think has sort of a, a, a will that he wants to enforce. It's a motivating will. It's a group think will, but I totally agree with you, Rob, that this is where it comes into, into play when Lil comes back, right? It's like, he doesn't necessarily feel like he, he has to be, deceitful and like if you're in trouble if you're not in the inner circle i'll i'll treat you nicely but like i i don't necessarily need to to make you feel completely comfortable and that certainly is a a, a way to play survivor it's it's riskier especially in this day and age when you vote people out and they either serve on the jury or may serve as some sort of person to have an effect on your game but that is the way that that savage proceeds through life and it really makes him in my opinion a very fun and complicated character Haley, uh, he likes to have his guys also, Savage. Yeah, I get the vibe that Andrew Savage would not enjoy me personally on a Survivor game. What kind, would... of, noodle, what kind of noodle are you? I'm a, I'm a Cavatappi, like those like swirly boys. Oh, okay. <laughs> sounds, I just... sounds delicious. <laughs> he, I, I enjoy him as a character. I think he's a good character. Again, I just don't. I have a hard time, like, I, I will put myself in these situations a lot of time, and I just mm-hmm. don't think Savage would like me very much. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I get that. I get that. Um, Just, you know, he loves, you know, in this season, you know, uh, he, he loves Rhino. He wants, uh, you know, he moves, like, uh, you know, heaven and earth to try to keep Austin around. Like Even loves- though Austin is, like, keeps trying to quit, and I feel like... I feel like he got so mad at Skinny Ryan for giving up, even though like he was truly trying to the best of his abilities. His abilities just weren't that good. Austin Mm. is just like has a thought bubble of all those bottles of alcohol he left behind. He's like, let me get to them. I need them right now. And Savage basically was doing like, but do you need to quit? But mm-hmm. do you need to quit right yeah, now? Like, I, I feel like if, I feel like if Skinny Ryan was pulling that, like, he would have been like, oh, what a sh- what a shame of a man this is. But like Austin doing, he was like. Well, Austin just, you know, needs a little bit of help. Like, it's fine. Mm-hmm. He's going to come around. He, he was really sold on Austin's potential. 
Yeah, maybe that's the thing as well, is we know that, like, obviously, uh, Savage is a, is a businessman, but I don't know, I, I feel like I get some sort of, like, Tony Robbins aspect in him, right? Like, you have potential, we just need to awaken that in you. This game pushes you to your limits, and you discover new things about yourself. Like, in episode two, the entire talk to not get Austin to quit is twofold. One, we gotta keep the big ox uh, in challenges, and B, it's like, like you, you don't know what you're capable of. And Austin's like, I very much know, and it is not this. I, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. here. I reach my limit. Please let me go. And they're like, no, no, no. I don't think you realize. You need to get to 110% right now, Mr. Taylor. Uh, and to sort of see like Savage take that motto, I think, is really interesting. Again, uh, he was sort of foisted into this leader role. I think it's Nicole right in this first episode that says they want to, to put him up as the leader. And I really appreciate that type of character, too, that... Uh, I don't want to compare Andrew Savage to GC, but I guess I did of like, what do wow. you do when the leadership role is given to you? You can be like Andrew Savage and be like, all right, I guess I'll roll with it. Or GC and be like, bye-bye paddling away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I do feel like that Andrew relishes uh, this role because that if he did not want this, like I kind of feel like that he would go out of his way uh, not to be in this spot when he returns in Cambodia. And it feels like that he is looking for a, a similar setup in his second time out as well. Yeah. And it is interesting. I think to, to hear Savage make like, especially as the situation gets increasingly dire as the episodes go along, like trying to find the rare beams of sunshine around the storm that's building, right? Like at one point, I think in episode three, he's like, well, we're a lot mentally stronger than Drake because we've been beaten down more than they have. And therefore mm. we know adversity more than they do. It's like, keep trying to find that silver lining, man, because things are bronzing real quick for you and your tribe. Let's talk about the first player out of the season, and that would be Nicole Delma. Uh, Haley, uh, did uh, Nicole do a lot wrong here? I don't know if she did a lot wrong or she just said the wrong thing to the wrong person. Like, I don't think she had a great, um, great judgment of who she could actually trust and who she couldn't. And I think that's what screwed her in the long run. She's, you know, her, her read on the situation was that she was exactly herself and she knew she was either going to be first out or she was going to win the game. And she was first out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here's, here's something. I think Nicole Delma had a case of big move itis. Yeah. Like, cause obviously skinny Ryan or even Lil could have been someone to easily offer up. But instead, she goes for Tawana, or I guess she calls her Tawanda, uh, building up, I guess, uh, a future song parody contest years and yeah. years down the line. Maybe uh, that's what we would have called her had she been the first person off. Oh, yeah, perhaps. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. just everyone who rhymes with Wanda can only go so far in Survivor. Mm -hmm. But it seemed like the, the narrative we were told, right, was like Tawana kept talking loudly and Nicole didn't like it. She felt like she was too all over the place and like cost them some stuff at the end of the day. And so she wanted to target her. And everyone's like, what? Why would you do that? Okay, okay, we'll get rid of you then. Why are you causing all this kerfuffle? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm going to speak to my wife about this because uh, that, like, I don't like it. I don't like it one bit. Nicole. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that that is one of my favorite uh, running jokes when people, uh, so, sometimes people have thought that my wife is actually uh, Nicole Delma from Survivor Pro Islands. How do you feel about your wife possibly hooking up with Andrew Savage after the show? Andrew Savage? Didn't you ever see that moment in the reunion, right, where they're like, hey, I heard Nicole, you and Andrew Savage. She's like, absolutely not. No, never. I thought it was the, the Johnny Fairplay. No, that was uh, that was Michelle. No, Michelle and Burton, and then it was Dara and Johnny Fairplay. I love that runner too of like all these these young women just being like, no, I'm not going to sleep with Did, any of these men yeah, on this. I mean, I mean, Andrew Savage was married during uh, the. I mean, I think that would have been a real scandal. I, I, I oh no, you know what it was? It was it was Rhino, I think. Which, yeah. given the reputation of Rhino, I think makes a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, that, there's a reason why they okay. call him Rhino. It's uh, of the horny variety. Okay. Oh wow, I did not know where that was going. So I'm glad it was there. That's um, somehow better. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Nicole boot is, you know, not really explained uh, super great in the show. Uh, the Morgan men are also going to get naked in the first challenge. And uh, wow. Haley, this is also confusing. As a never nude, I just can't even wrap my head around being okay with this. <gasps> so yeah. I would just be afraid of so many things. 
in so many places and in so many ways. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, well, what did, did Sandra, I think, said that uh, she wishes that their dingalings got stuck in the vines. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's like Jumanji hellscape right there, right? It's yeah. like if your, if your genitalia gets caught on the fauna. Please, Mike, it's a dingaling. Sorry, it's a dingling. Uh, game over from that perspective. Yeah, I'm glad that Sandra, for once, like, does not speak R-rated. <laughs> I guess R-rated in honor of the the season, and is like going PG-13 there. I love that challenge because it's also like I love how it's atypical in that like there's no puzzle at the end, right? It's literally just like brute strength drag this cannon through this obstacle course. But so I guess what happened was because Austin decided to sell all of his clothes, even though they had sure. money over by the end he's like my buzz shorts are falling down and savage and rhino the bros club say like all right man you drop trow we drop trow you know brother morgan brothers for life morgan men and so at a certain point while they're like in the middle of the muddy woods (laughs) austin's pants fall down and they're like okay one two three and they do the full monty and essentially just take off their underwear And one of the greatest editing moments I've ever seen in Survivor history, back in the old school days of Survivor, when Jeff Probst wasn't narrating every challenge, they would say, you know, so-and-so ahead, uh, so-and-so trailing. But in this one, they said Drake ahead and Morgan behind with a nice blurred shot of all three men's asses staring at us. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that maybe, maybe this was like the response to Jenna and Heidi. Did they think like what Jeff would just give away chocolate and peanut butter afterwards? I don't know. It's like, hey, Pavlovian. It's like, look, they did it. They got it in a magazine. Uh, Maybe we need to uh, show our butts on TV and our (laughs) ding-a-lings. Yeah, exactly. And Jeff, uh, Jeff, it's like really doing a lot of objectification in this, right? Like, doesn't he say, uh, we've got two naked Morgan members and they're not the ones that anybody wants to see. Like, Mm -hmm. really? Aren't they the hotties, though? Yeah, but mm-hmm. you know that Jeff is like Mr. Like, oh, but what about the brawless women? What are they mm-hmm. doing? Oh, Aren't they okay. popular? That makes sense. Because when I saw that, I heard that. I was like, these are the hot dudes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was like, what? Okay. You want skinny Ryan? And I saw, and I saw like, like Jeff reacting going like, what are you guys doing? Like he just seemed legitimately confused as to what was happening in the middle of a challenge. All right. Well, ultimately, uh, Morgan goes to tribal council. They vote off uh nicole delma uh setting up uh the second vote of the season where we're gonna lose uh skinny ryan mike can you talk a little bit about the downfall of skinny ryan yeah i mean skinny ryan essentially gets a a warning shot fired at him right from the canon of the tribe of like well it seemed like you really didn't try your best because there was a portion of that first challenge where morgan actually gets ahead in the final yeah. stretch and people seem to credit skinny Ryan was the lone Achilles heel who got gassed out and allowed Drake to pass them. So they're like, you're on thin ice, buddy. You know, uh, you're, you're in a paper bag right now and you're going to be punching your way out of here. If you don't show yourself anytime soon. And suffice it to say, he does not live up to expectations over the course of episode two, right? There's that reward challenge where they have to like swim out and gather some booty uh, even though they had plenty of it in the last episode. And Skinny Ryan has a lot of problems in the water. Will not be the last time that a Morgan member has problems in the water. And basically at that point, like, his ticket is punched. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Haley, he will form an incredible bond uh, with Lil, who we haven't talked too much about yet. We have a lot of time to talk about Lil later, I think. Yeah. <laughs> got a lot of Lil speak coming up. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're going to go off on missions together and uh, Lil really understands Skinny Ryan. Yeah, I love this bond. I think I always just kind of love like the younger guy and older. Wait, do you think they were big brother fans and wanted to be like, um, oh, Danielle and um, Jason Guy? guy? Yeah, (laughs) I I mean, uh, I I don't think that uh, they were like uh, me and Dina talking about that uh, from Survivor of the Amazon. Two down and 16 to go. (laughs) Yeah, I'm just... Uh, have you ever watched a little show called <laughs> Big Brother? They call me Big Lil. Roddy is the devil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they were missing Big Brother 4 uh, when they uh, were. Oh, to, poor yeah. them. Yeah. So uh, the, that being said, no, I, I, maybe Skinny Ryan. I don't suspect that Lil was a Big Brother fan. Oh, come on. Seems right up her alley. No, I think Lil would be like crying over every eviction, right? I'm like, I can't believe it. 
Why do they have to Lil, go? Do you think Lil would have voted in like the? Text oh, in like thing? in like the OG Big Brother days, I think yeah. so. Do you mm-hmm. think Lil was more of an American Idol fan? Hmm. I think Lil is the biggest Clay Aiken fan we've ever seen on Survivor. That's yeah. my <laughs> guess. Just the Clay yeah, yeah, <laughs> Lil is the biggest claymate we've ever I had. I just love that Clay Aiken. <laughs> I think so. Like she, she saw Ryan's shoulder. She's like, she reminds that me a lot of man. <laughs> he's doing so much good. Yeah, I, is it possible she saw her beloved Clay Aiken in Skinny Ryan? Mm-hmm. Ruben, I don't like that young man. <laughs> <laughs> I guess Ryan did often feel invisible. <laughs> <laughs> Play the drop. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Okay. Um, anything else on Skinny Ryan? No, I mean, listen, it was it was down to like the weak link of the tribe versus someone who wants to quit. We saw this in the previous season with uh, Shauna, she of the badass ski cap that like in Survivor, if people want to keep you around enough and there's not a, a, a an official thing you can do yet to quit, like you're staying in there no matter what. So there really was mm-hmm. no chance for this guy. Yeah. Even though Austin does want to leave. Uh, no, no, sorry. You don't get to leave. Uh, it's going to be skinny Ryan. Um, we have uh, one more Morgan tribal council where Lil is going to be uh, the one to go. Uh, Lil does make a screw up here <laughs> at the Morgan tribe. Uh, she ends up uh, losing a uh, fishing hook and Mike, Andrew Savage uh, cannot forgive her for this. I uh, love this because we really hadn't seen, like we've seen Lil get emotional, but this is truly the beginning of like the pouting, blubbering Lillian Morris that we get to know for the rest of the season. Specifically when she goes out with the hooks and she goes, oh no, I lost the hook. Oh man. Like, and she just immediately starts to break down. That's Lil in a nutshell. She makes a mistake immediately regrets it and then has an emotional reaction to what it and listen done? Ex- yeah, like she has so much like i don't know introspection of like oh no i've doomed us all <laughs> and i i love this this rinse and repeat cycle that we get like i cannot get enough of lil as a character because it's just so funny to keep repeating those beats no matter what the situation is mm. Haley, a- andrew was very upset about this uh that he said that there's only there's only two ways that she could have lost the hook one is if the rope broke, which that didn't happen, or if she didn't tie the knot correctly and she said she had a merit badge in this. I bet if Austin lost the fishing hook, it would be a whole different story. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You'd be like, oh, it's fine. We didn't need it. You know what? I was actually going to toss it away. <laughs> yeah, we can catch fish with our bare hands like the cavemen mm-hmm. do. We're good, OT. Don't you worry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... Ultimately, uh, Lil asks about her position in the tribe. Uh, Andrew tells her that uh, he's going to get back to her. <laughs> what a yeah. dick. He's like, uh, she's like, I'm so happy you have the balls to talk to me. And he's like, listen, you know, you've been such a great asset. I'm going to give you the brutal truth. And uh, this is where the, the I mean, Lil's episode in general is just an incredibly delicious moment of foreshadowing. Right between this moment of her being like, well, you tell me if I'm going. He's like, sure, I will. And we never see it. But the piece de resistance is when Lil's torch gets snuffed, it does not get snuffed. Mm, oh, I yes. Love it. Haley, was that an omen where the yes. survivor god saying, no, Lil yeah, cannot I think it was. go? I, you know, a lot of these well, things I feel weird. like don't happen by accident. I guess well, that, I have to stay. <laughs> well, I love that too, though, because Je- that's what Jeff sort of alludes to, right? Like he puts the torch snuffer down. There's a, like a pause in the music for dramatic pause. It comes up, it's still lit. And Jeff says like, uh, you know, Looks like they don't want you to go. And those like, oh, yeah, sure. Like, she's just still just so... saying that. You say that to everybody. Exactly. You don't like, mean it. I'm, not, I'm, I'm assuming you say that every time someone gets, leaves the show, that they don't want you to go. But it turns out that, like, not only is that element in the season, but she is one of those people to get her torch reignited. So it's just like, God, you could not write that. That is mm-hmm. just absolutely incredible storytelling. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Should we circle back to uh, the the early uh, Drake days before we get too far down the uh, Morgan path? Yes, because Drake is a hot mess. Okay, uh, let's uh, circle back to the uh, the early days of uh, Drake. Uh, everybody is uh, very impressed with uh, Rupert, who is able to uh, really be a, a great provider here at the at the Drake tribe, Haley. 
yeah, he's just nonstop. He figures out how to use the sphere and like, but they also really equipped themselves well in the village. They got all those things that they needed to do this. Um, it's just really it, like, were they ever hungry on this season on the drink trial? Yeah, I know. They, they literally say like every challenge, right? Like, oh, our bellies are full. Like Rupert caught a fish for each person in the second episode. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it seemed were... like it, it seemed like they bought enough rice, but we're also able to obviously supplement that with with the sea protein, where um, the Morgans were not able to do that, and that's why they went through their rice so quickly. Yeah, is, was this the uh, the unintentional backdoor pilot for Survivor Fiji here with like the unintentional <laughs> haves and have nots? Yeah, it really did uh, work out that way, and I think that it sort of gets forgotten after the first episode, uh, but the Drake tribe is just uh, set up so much better uh, than the Morgan tribe, uh, who are just like in dire straits for the entire season, other than when Rupert comes to visit them. Yeah, so Rupert is getting increasingly territorial over uh, over his spear. He's also getting like honestly a little manic as well right he talks about like i don't sleep at night i just work all day and he's like i don't think i can keep up this workload i've made a huge mistake (laughs) relatable yeah and then but then sean decides to uh go out onto the sea with has rupert says my spear and Mm -hmm. he loses the head and this is uh this shows how you don't get on the angry side of rupert bonham because you could this is when rupert almost like hulks out there are several moments where he could have like uh i don't know looney tune style punched someone through the ground and this was one of those moments yeah Haley, sean doesn't remember where he lost it in the ocean and uh rupert is just uh apoplectic which is like fair would you remember where you lost something in the ocean i don't know Mm -hmm. do you think rupert found the original or do you think production planted a new one oh that's so (laughs) clever that's a great question and they're just like oh crap they're not gonna find it i'm sorry that's like finding a needle in a haystack i mean like i don't i'm not saying they did anything nefarious Mm -hmm. i'm just saying like that's I mean, pretty good findy keepy skills. By I Rupert. do think it was the real one because I kind of feel like if you're a um, television producer, don't you want Rupert uh, to be talking about the spear and being mad at Sean every single day? I guess so. Right. I, Rupert has an axe to grind. He has an entire like weapon guild to a grind. Spear to grind. You, yeah. If you piss him off, I'm just like, can't believe he broke my spear. He my killed spear my spear is dead. Yeah. That's exactly what he says. And he like storms off in a huff so it's like yeah for drama's sake like absolutely break all of rupert's things you know what like they should have hidden hidden some secret sanders in the crew and be like i'm gonna steal the tackle box uh Mm -hmm. i'm gonna break the spear in half and just see how uh, this we need like the survivor saboteur in that way Mm -hmm. yeah i mean we do have uh the saboteurs going and raiding the camp in each episode uh which i mentioned sandra taking the tarp which happens uh in the second episode but this is also a a really fun thing that happens in the pre-merge haley where uh we don't have a swap but we do have uh, somebody visiting the tribe uh the other tribe in each episode i love any time the tribes get to interact with each other in a different way um and it happens in two ways like you say the the rating but also <laughs> i think the producers were genuinely concerned the morgans were gonna die when they said like hey let's get rupert over there for a day mm-hmm. yeah i i, I love well. the i do love the envoys that they sent as well right like the first one they send is sandra who just does not give an f uh you know she's super nonchalant of like hey don't let the bug bugs bite have a good night we'll see you tomorrow but he like she like dismantled their entire camp and took mm-hmm. the tarp and just mm-hmm. walked away with it uh as opposed to like krista walking in with like her weird three braids and be like hello everybody uh nothing's <laughs> going on on our tribe uh, and then johnny and- fairplay is like can i use some shampoo and it's like yeah, buddy then, like then- i'm gonna uh we threw the challenge that you guys won can i wash my hair johnny no, fairplay no, takes takes the biggest dump I have ever seen, metaphorically speaking, like in Survivor Goodwill, where he's just like, doesn't even care at this point about being any sort of ambassador. He's just like, uh, yeah, it sucks to be you. Uh, well, by the way, uh, the thing you thought you won that was your big motivator, we actually threw. So joke's on you, loser. And by the way, your Garnier Fructis is out right now, thanks to me. <laughs> See ya. It's just, it's a, it's a really great, 
and we have Triss in there as well, and, and she's fine. But I, I love the idea of looting. Uh, I know when I when I was able to consult on Survivor South Africa, I wanted to bring back the tribe raid just because I think it's such a fun idea. And even like what the Morgans try to do, right? Of like refusing to help Sandra cut down the tarp or like trying to hide things, putting a pot in the fire so that they hope someone burns themselves when they try to grab it. Like the mm -hmm. small ways the tribe tries to sabotage the people raiding it. That sabotage. being said, yes, uh, it is really great here, but. Haley, is this good in any other season where they do it? I feel like it's, it shows up a little bit in a few other seasons. Uh, they kind of do it in Survivor All-Stars a little bit. But I feel like that it was never as effective as it was here. Well, I think that's two reasons. One, because it's so thematic. And two, because they didn't get the same things right off the bat. Like, I feel like you wanted to go to their camp to see what they got in the Panamanian village that you could use. Like uh, they got tarps, they got all these like buckets mm. and things. And it's like, Oh, well maybe we could use something from that side that they maybe have got that we didn't. And I, I feel like the, the Drake's got everything they needed anyway. So even if it was like when I was just kind of like, they're like, we just have to go. We have all the things we're taking from them. We're just doing, we're taking insurance picks so that if they ever win, <laughs> mm -hmm. they're just taking back stuff they smart. need. That's yeah. smart. Yeah. It's essentially like they won like the raffle, right? Like, okay, I don't need this, but I guess I can, I guess you can give this to me. I don't really want this right now. And I also loved watching how people try, like, obviously you have the Johnny Fair plays, right? Being like, let's weaken them. Let's take their one and only pot. And then Rupert being like, that's not a good idea. And so to mm -hmm. see like how they even approach that idea differently, I, I think it's just, it's a really cool idea. And I think it's especially the individual perspective. Like we saw this a bit in Survivor China, right? Where like when one person gets sent over to the other tribe, I think that's a really unique dynamic, whether it's like strategic or just personal. I think that's the way to go if you continue doing this. One of the big issues that early Drake tribe uh, is uh, that there is a grouping of Burton and Sean and Michelle, and they're a little bit painted as sort of like high school bullies. Uh, and uh, they make fun of Rupert when Rupert ultimately gets out of his uh, fancy denim. Uh, Krista ends up making him a kilt and they are <laughs> making fun of Rupert in his kilt. I, I did not even think of it as a kilt, but that just makes me, I bet you it makes Rupert feel like Braveheart, right? Like mm -hmm. he's the ultimate warrior and that's why he would make it. So, I mean, I love it. Like, listen, in this day and age, like I could see Harry Styles rocking the Rupert in this day and age. Like, I think it's a fish. It's a fashion statement. I don't know. Haley, you're the most fashionable out of all of us. What do you think? I'm wearing a tie dye t-shirt that I stole from my husband's drawer. I think I'm you pillaged it. I it. Um, I love it i love him wearing a skirt i love him saying screw it i want my junk to breathe i want to be able to swim i also think them getting the sewing machine that's one of my favorite rewards ever um next to the fridge of coca-cola mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> i yeah. just love i love they were they made some real cute outfits i'm not gonna lie i love i feel like only sandra krista and rupert really used that reward um i loved i loved rupert's commitment to the skirt comfort mm -hmm. over being made fun of <laughs> yeah all right so uh any of the storylines we want to make sure we hit at uh early drake tribe i mean listen we gotta get loud rob we gotta talk about okay. the first scuffle because i think that's episode three right the first argument between sandra and one of her many survivor nemesis johnny fairplay mm -hmm. yeah so interestingly that uh, this is a debate over who should sit out of the challenge. And Haley, I, I thought the irony here is Sandra is scoffing at Johnny Fairplay's suggestion. She sits out of a challenge because she might not be as good of a swimmer. Cut to 33 seasons later that we are naming the place where survivors sit out of the challenge as the Sandra bench. <sighs> Yeah, it's tough. She, I think she, I, I think what she wanted was not to be pointed out that she was sitting out a yes. lot. But I think she, in her heart, wanted to keep sitting out because she was. She said in the finale, whenever, whenever there was like a water challenge, she's like, "This isn't it. This is not the one for me." Mm -hmm. Right, because I think it, it was her essentially probably thinking about it as a moment of, 
okay, someone is basically saying this is why you should be the first one gone from the yeah, truck. Totally. Like, again, as long as it's not me, it's the cheetah strategy. When you're out running a cheetah, you don't have to be the fastest. You just have to be faster than one other person. And I think in that case, that's what she does. She's just like, where were you? Where were you? When we jumped off the boat, you were still in the water. And I think oh, I, I was uh, jeans on. I yeah, wasn't even using my legs, so like my arms were half as fast as you using your whole body. So what day? What day? Uh, and it's just, I mean, it <sighs> is by far the loudest, like pretty much most aggressive fight. I think even something along the lines of what happened with Kimmy and Alicia in Australian Outback, like that was intense. This is visceral streaming match. Yeah, yeah, they are getting in each other's faces, and of course, quotes Sandra's inimitable line: "I can get loud too." WTF? Again. This is not only a survivor winner, a two-time survivor winner and regarded as one of the best players of all time. Does Incredible. she get in the most fights out of any winner? I would say so. If we're talking like I know that Tony has certainly gotten into arguments. Uh, and you have people like Ben as well, like certainly doing things to earn ire from people, but like Sandra absolutely gives it to, mm -hmm. to people. And it's also really interesting looking back on this season because Jeff Probst loves to talk about how this show is for kids right nowadays the the game within the game sure. but like looking back on survivor pearl islands like this is the least kid-friendly season of the show i have ever seen the first episode features bare ass and now we have sandra and johnny fairplay just dropping f-bombs every other word in this argument mm -hmm. yeah and i was thinking of like oh i want to show my uh kids the survivor season oh this is pirate fun <laughs> It's fine. They bleep the swears and the butts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that percussion worker is like uh, really getting his time and a half, right? Like he has to play a note every time someone says a swear and <laughs> him and you, and Johnny Fairplay just like give it to them. Do you think it should have been like a, a, a pirate musket going off every time they swore instead of like the, the symbols? <laughs> it's like a 21 gun salute. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. <laughs> But yeah, this is where we get not only the birth of this rivalry, but of course, like uh, and another incredible foreshadowing moment, Johnny Fairplay being like, uh, you know, she's not going to be the top four. And I got a mill saying that she's not the final one cut to not only that happening, but Johnny Fairplay himself voting for Sandra to be the one. Mm -hmm. That's like probably some of my favorite survivor, like editing or whatever of all time, that like little piece of being like, screw you, Johnny Fairplay. Screw John because he's an ass. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. So, all right. Um, let's uh, go to, you know, uh, we're seeing Drake just uh, dominate the challenges. They are realizing, like, hey, maybe what we need to do is we need to throw a challenge uh, because then if we throw a challenge, then we could uh, get rid of somebody uh, that we really would like to uh, get rid of. And, and that person is what, Krista, that they want to th throw the challenge to get rid of? Yeah, so this is a plan from Burton. Burton is a really interesting part of this season to me. I actually think he's a very underrated player. Like, Burton was on his way to possibly winning this season. And look, I'm glad that he didn't because uh, he probably has one of the lesser personalities of the cast. And so I'm very happy we got someone like Sandra. Hey, screw you, Mike. Yeah, exactly. Well, that Burn sort of acts, at least in the pre-merge, like he's at a Cobra Kai, right? Mm -hmm. He just sort of is like pointing and laughing at Rupert, saying uh -huh. like, yeah, like he literally is pointing and laughing. It's like he's Rupert's ass is Malcolm and Burton is me. That's what I felt in that <laughs> moment. Uh, but he sort of comes up with this plan, right? He goes to Rupert of all people and is like, I have a feeling that the strong are going to get targeted at the merge. If we weed out the weak people enough, then that means that, you know, uh, there won't necessarily be as many people to turn on us come the merge. It's a really unique strategy. We've only experienced throwing a, a, a challenge a few times beforehand after the swap in Survivor Africa. Mm -hmm. I know it was talked about briefly in Survivor Thailand, but like this feels a bit new. It feels like a newer strategy in Survivor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's a great observation. Um I think that uh, there might have been a little bit of talk about that in Survivor Marquesas. But yeah, you're you're right. Uh, Rupert is very offended. He says, if this was a pirate culture, he'd already be dead. <laughs> so then why did then why did Rupert agree to sit out? Wasn't my choice. I know. Yes. But like, why wouldn't he just stand there and be like, no, 
I'm not. Ooh, I like that. If Rupert pulls like a beast mode cowboy and like just sits down on that gangplank at the challenge, where like, no, I'm participating. You can't sit me out here. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. and it just seems like, I mean, obviously revisionist history, et cetera, et cetera. But then it makes Burton look like an idiot too for sitting out. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, because they, the, what they try to pass off, right? And uh, they Jeff really tries to needle them about this. They finally admit to it the next episode, but they say, like, they have a rotation system, right? They have, like, a, tr- a Drake chore wheel. And... <laughs> yeah, where Sandra's out at least once an episode and everyone else takes their turn. Yeah, she's like, something's unfair here. I think the hat is rigged. But, yeah, this time, Rupert and Burton, it's their turn to sit out the most physical challenge they've had so far. Yeah. Uh, with an attack zone, and then ultimately uh, Morgan Tribe is going to win this, and they also get the opportunity to uh, kidnap one of the members of uh, the Drake Tribe, and they're going to uh, kidnap Rupert, and basically they get to keep Rupert up until the... like They keep him for uh, even the next reward challenge. Yeah, it's okay. Weird. It's weird because... The, so there was a part of the, the season that wasn't shown... Where after this episode, apparently, I think in episode five, there was an opportunity to mutiny. Uh, apparently, Andrew Savage was the one who really put his foot down, right? It was like, mutineers are the first to die, to quote Ozzy. Uh, Classic and, Andrew Savage. Exactly. And so uh, that's saying, though, Rupert was like the first one, I guess, to be kidnapped uh, and brought over to the other tribe temporarily. I, I got to imagine a bit of a thumb on the scale. Like, do you think they threw this twist in knowing that Drake had that plan to throw the challenge? Yeah, like, it makes me wonder, like, they were worried about Rupert going home here, so they just, and they knew there's no one else Morgan would have picked, and they also wanted Morgan to not die a little bit, so I think it was a lot of factors, and I don't necessarily think the producers were like, at this challenge, there's going to be a kidnapping. Mm -hmm. I think it was kind of like, okay, this is the time to use that. Yeah. We're not going to see uh, Rupert at Morgan until the next episode. We see uh, a lot of him. Uh, we end up uh, really focusing on the vote over at Drake. And uh, Johnny Fairplay is going to be a- an interesting uh, swing vote here because uh, he could go with Burton and Michelle and uh, with Sean uh, to uh, vote against. Uh, they're going to put their votes on Krista. Meanwhile, uh, that there is another side of things, uh, which is going to be the Trish, Sandra, Krista side of things. And uh, they are going to say, we've had enough of Burton. Yeah, which is wild. You know, I guess this came about a bit in Survivor Marquesas, but it feels very rare, even at this stage of Survivor, that like arguably the biggest asset to the tribe gets voted out. Uh, and I think it really just stems from the fact that this was his idea. He suggested it to the wrong people pulled it out at the wrong time and he was outnumbered it's that thing from survivor caramoan right for like for some reason these three people thought they were the majority with rupert gone they're like great we're four of seven with johnny fairplay but if i'm johnny fairplay i would much rather go with like the quirkier uh less athletic group where i'm definitely not on the bottom versus like the athletic cool kids in which i am definitively on the bottom if it comes down to us four Haley, Johnny Fairplay has an interesting uh, way that he is going to uh, try to make this decision uh, that he becomes uh, incredibly intoxicated and becomes uh, the first survivor player to attend a tribal council under the influence outside of jury members. This is very fitting with Johnny Fairplay's character, but it makes Jeff really upset because I think think Jeff takes tribal council very seriously. Um, And Fairplay made a mockery of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jeff asks him, like, hey, what's the state of affairs? You know, typical opening question for the very first tribal council they go to. And he just goes, awesome, 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 awesome. Happy tribe. Mm -hmm. And Jeff just goes, are you loaded? Uh, And so it's the incredulousness has already started. I think later on in the tribal council, right, Jeff calls him like, John, you're the self-proclaimed good strategist here. So it's clear while maybe there was some light jabs going on like jeff is now trying to throw punches at this guy like what are you doing to this show it's not my show yet but like how dare you survivor is a sacred institution and you're literally pissing all over the walls Mm -hmm. yeah okay well ultimately uh burton is gonna get voted out here at tribal council number four but uh like lil Haley, he'll be back he will be and i'm glad i like burton and i'm I'm excited to see where his character grows from here. I, yeah. I think we would have been disappointed if we, if this was it for Burton. 
He brings a lot to the table. All right. So, uh, meanwhile, back uh, at Morgan Tribe uh, the next day, uh, we're going to see Rupert trying to uh, work on the Morgan camp. Uh, Mike, uh, there's an issue with like the tide is coming in and they think that like, okay, we're just going to use like a log to uh, <laughs> stop the ocean from coming up this way. And Rupert's like, log, that's a great idea. Let me put mm -hmm. that in my memory bank for next time. <laughs> Dig in the sand, perhaps. Mm. Uh, hmm, they're not so bad after all. Yeah, so Morgan essentially like doesn't want to move their camp. So despite the slowly encroaching tide, they just like built up a little sand divot that yeah. hopefully the tide would go over and Rupert just Come walks in. That'll too. stop the ocean. <laughs> exactly. Like Rupert walks in like, I don't know, like nanny 911, right? And it's like, <laughs> Or like Gordon Ramsay and being like, what the bloody hell are you doing with your shelter? You know, it needs a makeover right now. It's it's tr it's truly outstanding to me that they bring Rupert over for his skills and then they just ignore what he says. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, cause, cause here's Austin the thing. What if we don't do that and we just keep putting sticks there instead? And yeah, I, Austin, love, Austin. I love Rupert's line of like, I have never met more people who are like tr working harder to not work yeah more, uh, rupert halpert's to the camera like he actually sneaks a peek at the camera of like get a load of this guy uh but the reason why they they don't move it is because ot right he's afraid of getting lit up by a snake in the middle of the jungle yeah mm -hmm. well what about drowning while sleeping that seems pretty inconvenient to me yeah uh <laughs> we know that austin is not a fan of the water you think that that would be a uh, another big fear of his yeah, he has great respect for the water i believe but yeah that's a, that's another runner throughout this is that austin also wanting to quit uh, as dara will say later he's afraid of every little old thing uh and that includes i think is it like the first night where he jumps out of bed saying there's a snake but it's a palm branch frond. twist yeah. yeah palm frond twisting in the wind mm-hmm uh, Rupert's going to catch some fish, uh, makes a really strong impression on the Morgan tribe. Uh, he's even going to go to the reward challenge and, uh, compete with the Morgan tribe. And then, uh, Morgan is going to, uh, or Rupert's going to help the Morgan tribe, uh, win a, a reward that he I'm doesn't fine with it. get. I'm happy with it. And the, yeah, but is it? But then he decides to go back to Drake's and not partake in the reward. Do you think it's because it was a terrible reward? Mm -hmm. Maybe Remember, it was yeah. eating. Yeah. Remind remind me what it was again. The shower. A shower. Oh yeah. Oh well. Yeah. Now you'd have to fill with what, like ocean water, anyway. Yeah, Rupert's like, yeah, the the ocean's my shower. I already mm. live in a shower right now. Uh, so I can imagine him wanting to, and I could also imagine if he's fearful that like if there's any ill will towards him working with the opposition that he's like let me just yeah. get back over there asap totally. mm -hmm. yeah so all right uh andrew savage feels like all right we've got the morgan tribe uh back on track uh meanwhile back at drake uh that we see a plan coming together uh, about uh when we have the gross food challenge uh is coming up and so they concoct a plan Okay, Michelle is going to pretend she's bad at the gross food challenge. And then if there's a tiebreaker, they'll pull Michelle into the gross food challenge and then she will ace it. Haley, it's a foolproof plan. Except Michelle doesn't play the part. She just knocks she's it back. Good. She doesn't even she doesn't even pretend to gag, just a scooch. A little a little scoochy gag. That's what mm -hmm. she could have just thrown that in there. I think Drake mm -hmm. just needs to stop making plans before challenges because they are like 0 for 2 at this point, right? Between throwing the challenge and now doing this, like it's only abject failure for them at this moment. Don't and prepare. I, and I love Rhino just being like, kicked my ass. Like did like truly the opposite <laughs> feeling that mm -hmm. they intended. Yeah. Um, Haley, how would you do at the uh, Survivor Smoothie Bar? Uh, baby has a weak stomach. Hmm. Okay. Well, Mike, this is appropriate because Rupert is about to uh, find a snake. Mm, uh, as I, as I call it, a nice aperitif. Yes, you've eaten a snake. Uh, I feel like that Mike Bloom would do okay at the Survivor Smoothie Bar. Um, I would now. Back in the day where I was an incredibly picky eater, I would definitely pull like a Peter Brown and leave like Jeff Special just lying there. Like I'm not even gonna do it. This is the most devastating thing in my life. But like. Yeah, if it's if it's for the Drake, 
Uh, I love the Drake. I, I would absolutely Drake. try to like uh, slam it down no matter what Jeff is is concocting and try to just like tune out Johnny Fairplay trying to flirt with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that Whoa. might make me gag more, honestly. Mm -hmm. That's my favorite runner as well. Is like, again, Dara... Uh, D Dara is sort of the the personification of that yes girl give us nothing meme but I love <laughs> how much of a straight man she is to Johnny Fairplay like every time Johnny Fairplay appeals to Dara and she's just like nope not not having it right now Johnny Fairplay mm -hmm. even uh, all the way through to uh, what is it the the reunion yeah the reunion right where he's like uh, Dara and me hooked up she's like absolutely not didn't do that at all <laughs> no way yeah, she so, doesn't say much. She's so she great does. at being deadpan. Uh, that mm -hmm. it just well, works. She's so a mortician. Well. <laughs> <laughs> she works with the dead and pans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, ultimately, uh, they don't pick Michelle for the tiebreak challenge. Uh, it's going to be Dara versus Sandra. Sandra can't do it, and Morgan is going to win immunity. And so Johnny Fairplay feels like that. Uh, this is all Michelle's fault. Michelle blew it. Yes, but Rupert is PO'd at Sean right now for the umpteen time because Sean has also been shown to be like a bit of an annoying presence around camp, right? He's like slobbering down coconut water. Uh, he voted for Burton because Johnny Fairplay tip him off and then proceeds to like trash Burton like he was never his BFF. And mm. so and so <laughs> Rupert has a plan to get rid of Sean. Never like that guy. Which he pitches to Michelle as she is puking in the bushes. <laughs> Yeah, Haley, this scene is just uh, has a like really like dramatic, like emotional music. And Rupert is like seems to be having a conversation with somebody that he doesn't really uh, seem to notice or care that this person is uh, puking their guts out. Yeah, and, and there's like no comfort element to it. No, like pat on the back being like they're there. It's like truly like a business meeting mm -hmm. in the bathroom. Yeah. Still. Hold her hair, Rupert. Come on. Do something. Offer her a water or a cool washcloth. Yeah, that would be all, nice. All, not, all her offer her is a fish. Like, oh, fill yourself back up. I pulled in one. <laughs> Why do you think <laughs> the, she was puking? Because it was a fish that got you. Yeah. Or the anxiety. I, I, it must have been the smoothies. And, and yeah. that's the irony, Haley, that all she is, she had one job. Pretend that the smoothies were going to make her throw up. She, oh, 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 no, no problem here. Uh, and then she's throwing up channel it too late yeah but i just love this idea of like of all the times of all the places look i think it's safe to say rupert bronum uh maybe has some difficulties reading a room uh and in this case that that came out here of like she is um she is putting the outs the insides on the outside maybe now is not the best time to be like all right here's how we think we can save you right now like let her wipe her mouth out a little bit you know and before sure. you proceed forward with the plotting and scheming yeah okay so Michelle's going to get voted out. Uh, anything else about uh, Michelle, Mike? Uh, she has one of the fun lines from the outcast. She has the revenge baby line. That's probably the only, that and the smoothies are really the only two things to write home about for Michelle. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, I, I bet Michelle can't drink a fish smoothie ever without people <laughs> calling it out and being like, uh, oh, this is just like on the show. This is your thing, right? <gasps> yeah, can I get a picture with you and your fish smoothie <laughs> that you're knocking fish down? Smoothie. Okay. Um, uh, sad news to report. Mike, uh, Balboa the snake has died. Who would have thought uh, the injured snake that Rupert tried to bandage up did not make it through the night? That he kept in a bag. In the same, like in a satchel that you would keep like D and D dice in, he threw a live animal into it. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't know why it's dead. Uh, and so, yeah, poor Balboa. The mascot of Drake did not make it through the night. Uh, and also Rupert is it's like, you know, doubled down on his luck because he's just so distraught. He says, you know, for a while, everyone knew what Drake was going to win this. Mm -hmm. Now there is question, which mm -hmm. is, again, Yoda like for Rupert that he feels like because Drake has been on a losing streak, they are no longer the godlike dominant tribe they once were they're heading in a bad direction in rupert's opinion and that including losing their mascot for sure um balboa the snake is not the only animal uh that we've met so far uh haley uh, we welcome in pelican pete pelican I, pete has entered the chat i love pelican pete what an angel this dude is you're like rhino i would have pet i would have pet pelican pete yeah i would have definitely 100 mm -hmm. probably would have hugged him 
Well, how would you have reacted though if he hopped into the shelter? Like you thrilled, guys? truly Push. thrilled. <laughs> anytime like my cat, safari. yeah, anytime my cat comes near me and like wants to snoogle, I'm like, baby, yes. Like I feel like I would have the same reaction to the pelican. No, uh, talking- they don't have crazy teeth. I looked it up because I thought maybe they had like little razory teeth. No teeth, no teeth on those guys. Okay, so, so they could just they could just gum you then. Yeah, well, you could get like if they bite you, it's more like a paper cut. Oh, <laughs> maybe that was that what Austin was afraid of death by a thousand paper cuts. Of, I, like, think I, don't want, I don't want this thing to bite me. I think he's been he's bit by animals before. Time. Yeah. Yeah. But a pelican. Hmm. But I mean, Austin takes a page out of uh, your bro Mateo's book, Rob. He starts menacingly sharpening the machete next to this creature, this animal, thinking that it will somehow run away at the sight of a blade. And then for some reason, this is the thing that pisses Andrew Savage off. <laughs> that That's it. You may want to quit this game, but don't you dare go after Pelican Pete. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, we're going to see the cannonball challenge. Uh, Haley, uh, you love this, right? Yep. I definitely mm-hmm. remember the cannonball challenge and yep. everything that happened in it. Drake Drake is going to win. Uh, they uh, get to also loot the tribe, uh, the Morgan tribe, and that's when Johnny Fairplay goes over and uh, tells them about how Drake threw a challenge, Mike. Uh, and this is when he washes his hair and gets called a piss ant. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think really emphasis on ant there, considering that they call him Little John. And I just love that. They call him Big John to his face, but they're so petty. They're like, but he's actually little John. He doesn't even realize it, but like we're really pumping him up. Uh, he's going to be so snowed later on, but like John this... snowed. Exactly. Uh, but this sends Andrew Savage into hyperdrive. Oh, his aunt. He is the most motivated, the most driven. He's like, uh, he's like Rocky after they killed Apollo Creed, right? Oh, like this is his Ivan Drago. Rocky from Survivor Fiji? No, uh, they're, they're, they aren't starving Ripley! out there. Exactly. Uh, Get Jeff Probst on the phone. Exactly. So Andrew Savage is just like uh, he just feels like it was it was thrown in their face, and he gets an opportunity <laughs> to really shine in a pseudo individual challenge here to end the pre merge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Haley, uh, it's a matter of uh, holding the buckets on your back. Now Endurance. this this challenge, I love, and I think I love it because. Krista holds more weight than both Austin and oh Sean. Suckers. Mm-hmm. Mike, can, you say some, can you say something about um, Sean being a puss for not holding the buckets and Krista's <laughs> weight for me, please? Sean couldn't even hold as much weight <laughs> as I did in the buckets. That big old puss. <laughs> Gets me every single time. <laughs> My face is covered in bug bites. I look like Pippi Longstocking. <laughs> <laughs> Krista's hair is an its own star it's, of this. Season. It's incredible. I don't know. I've never seen before, maybe outside of like some post-apocalyptic film, a look where you do two braids in front and one braid in the back. But she pulls it off somehow. Didn't the producers hate it because they could never use like her confessionals from any other day because her hair was always different? It was foreshadowing when the third tribe it was the outcast tribe in the back. I knew it. I didn't see it coming. <laughs> it was in the back of my head. <laughs> also, that have either of you ever experienced uh, facial bug bites before? Not on that <laughs> level. No, like, please, no. no I don't I, think no, I've ever even seen this. I, now, again, I've watched the Survivor catalog this season. I don't think there's another person, even Papa Smurf, uh, who's medevaced out of the game for a million ant bites, I don't believe is uh, getting bit on the face. Yeah, it, does, it seems like the bugs just sort of had an agenda. They were just like, let's carve out this area. Uh, we really like this. T- let's just like bite on her cheeks. It, Did it she looks... sleep face first into the sand? Like, I don't Maybe. know how else that happened. Maybe she's a stomach sleeper. <laughs> it's like a tempur pillow from nature. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, this time around, uh, Morgan, they will win immunity. Uh, sending Drake back to tribal council and uh there's a push trish this is her big play mike she says uh time to vote out rupert because uh hey do we really need to eat yeah that's saying like listen we were here to starve anyway we've been living it up in luxury like 
We don't need him. Uh, maybe they're drinking a little bit of like the they're sitting high because they got rid of Burton and they're like, yeah, we're still mm -hmm. doing fine. Relatively speaking, we run that challenge. I mean, Rupert's going to use this opportunity, though, to go after Sean initially. Right. He says, I, I want him off my island and out of my adventure. Really proto Troyzan right now. We're mm -hmm. really starting to get into the entitled Rupert era of mm -hmm. Pearl Highlands. Oh, well, we're going to get it very much so <laughs> in next episode. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh People are already feeling like uh, nobody could beat uh, Rupert. Johnny Fairplay tells us that uh, Rupert's going to win if we uh, don't get rid of him. And so uh, Sandra and Krista, they're not on board with this plan to uh, vote out Krista. And so we're going to have a vote here where uh, Trish and Johnny Fairplay end up uh, getting blindsided here. And so uh, it is going to be Trish who goes home, uh, not Rupert, by a vote of four to two. I yeah, think Rupert played it really well here too. By, I, I feel like he could have easily been like, "No, I hate Sean. I'm voting for Sean anyway." But instead, he goes to Sean and says, "Like, listen, I want to vote you out. The only way you're saving your skin here is to do exactly what I tell you." And I and then Sean does it. Like, I think I mm -hmm. think Rupert did a great job here. I think it helps that Burton and Michelle, the people part of his clip, like he's the last of the Mohicans here, and so he's just like he wasn't friends with them ever anyway. Oh, according to him. Yeah, apparently he always hated them. Uh, but he always sees that friend, right? Like, oh, God, I'm so glad I'm not friends with them anymore. They were such a-holes. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's interesting that, like, to your point, Haley, he has nowhere else to go. It comes down to who has the best best pitch for Sean. And I can imagine that Sean wants to keep Rupert around because as an athletic guy, even though Krista holds more weight than him, like, Rupert's a nice meat shield in, well, in that and regard. Like, if Sean votes for Rupert, what? They're just going to go 3-3 three, three and do what? Kristen, Kristen and Sandra are never going to flip on Rupert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. I mean, Rupert, though, has a bit of a downer attitude at tribal council, right? He's just like, it doesn't matter if I catch 10 fish a day. Half the tribe wants me gone. And there's this like, God, such a made for TV movie moment where Jeff asks him, you know, are you losing hope that can happen? And he looks down. You can never give up hope. Like, it's just such like you could tell it's a mm -hmm. motivational poster that Rupert wants to create in this moment but it's also a really interesting sliding doors moment because in choosing to save rupert standard diaz twine wins two million dollars on survivor interesting think about it. if rupert ends up being voted out here like he's not gonna vote for her to win if she makes it to the end because he's not on the jury he's probably not going to be making heroes versus villains if he's a pre-merge boot and then he's not able to vote for Sandra for a second time. So, like, Rupert is such a pivotal part of Sandra's game. So you're saying this is more important for her game the second time around uh, than it is uh, in this particular game. I mean, I think having Rupert on the jury certainly helped her in that mm -hmm. regard as well. We talk about, like, when you get rid of people in pairs or powerful trios that, like, it really uh, weakens the perception of them. So you're not necessarily going to completely pick off that grouping. We saw that happen with Sean this past week that, like, I think it ends up working out really well for Sandra both times that both the seasons she wins, Rupert ends up on the jury voting for her and he wouldn't be making those ju jury in the first place if she votes him out here. But what if instead of Rupert, what if Krista got cast as a hero in Heroes vs. Villains? I got a letter from JT. <laughs> Gave me an idol. <laughs> I'm putting it in my braid. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, listen, I would live in the universe where Krista Hastie is like one of the most important characters in Survivor history. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. now, Rob, you do Lil on Heroes vs. Villains. Well, well, why wouldn't I get the call? I, well, <laughs> I was a hero. A lot of kids looked up to me. Why not? You said you would call, and they never did. But All waiting. she does is just like uh, squats on, on the pole in every endurance challenge. I do mm -hmm. Pilates. This is aerobics. This is called a squat. You see this? I think this Lil just like said nothing. Lil just said game over. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Imagine Lil with Russell. Don't you say that about God? <sighs> Russ Lil Hans. Lil. Is, is what I want to see. Lil well. Hans. That's what they call my nephew. That's what he got a tattoo. He sounds like a lovely young man. <laughs> a I'd real love to meet him. Did he get it on his Ryan shoulders? Mm. <laughs> All right. I'm a scout. No, she's not gonna play till Vanuatu. <laughs> oh, I'd like to meet her too. All right. So, all right, <laughs> we're, we're, we're losing it. We're losing it. All right. Um. All right. 
uh, after tribal council, Rupert comes back. Who voted for me? <laughs> Come on, read the room, Rupert. It's so so funny. John, what did you vote for me? Yeah, obviously. Like, what yeah. The, what what the bolt was that? I ought mm. to strangle you like a chicken. Hmm. Okay. Um, he's very upset. Rupert doesn't I mean, like it. He was legitimately, I think, about to like cut him uh, mm -hmm. with with the Hawaiian sling. Like he wanted to spear him. He's saying, "What the f was that s tonight?" He's saying, "Like you, like you started this right now." Like he's getting in his face, saying, "I want to grab that little scrawny ass by the neck and pop his head off him like a damn chicken." Danny Bonaduce is <laughs> watching home, being like, "Preach, brother." <laughs> Also, please don't pop the head off a chicken. Damn. <laughs> Easy, yeah, easier said than done. But, like, what a wild way to react to two votes coming against you. Like, Abby Maria, look out. Rupert has by far the most extreme reaction I've ever heard to getting votes. Mm hmm. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, get back to the Morgan tribe. Okay. Um, you know, th things are not going well, Haley. Uh, we're getting into the, the, the Morgan tribe is starving to death. <laughs> they have very little rice left, very mm -hmm. little beans, and they hate the beans. They're tired of mm -hmm. the beans. Yeah. Um, we get into one more big fight also uh, where um, it, is it Johnny Fairplay versus Sean at this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is where uh, there's a little bit of like, uh, you know, stuff from from before. Right. With like uh, John being like, I want to know why I wasn't included in the conversation. He's like, you were in the conversation to F me. You F'd me, Johnny Fairplay. Uh, and Dara's like, oh, or else I'm glad somebody did so we can get off my back. Uh, <laughs> but then. Uh, the next day, right? I think it's like him and Sean get into an argument about what lifting the floor of the shelter. Yeah, uh, that Sean didn't want to work, and then Johnny Fairplay was just getting uh, mad at him and having like a tantrum about that Sean wasn't helping with working. Yeah, but they like they also again like Johnny Fairplay has now gotten in two fights that have nearly come to blows yeah, in a twenty four hour period. High strung. Uh, I would not say that he's always like in full control of his emotions. No, I mean, like, Sean legitimately gets in his face because Johnny Fairplay, uh, you know, you know what it is? I don't think it's it's moving the shelter. It's that, like, uh, there's something about how they want to make coconut popcorn. Yeah, that's uh, this time. Earlier yeah. they fought about that. They wanted to, like, so Krista wouldn't get bug bites on her face. Yeah, so but... They're going to make co coconut popcorn, and he doesn't want to do that. Yeah, he's like, he's like, why should we? And then Fairplay's like, uh, well, you could at least help. And Sean's like, I, I don't care. And, and Fairplay calls him an, an asshole. And Sean <laughs> gets inches within his face and is about to be like i'm gonna knock you out right now uh and so it's become like abundantly clear uh you know that these two are on the bottom of the chopping block uh fair play for not being in the vote last time and sean for just like being uh you know uh, a neanderthal around camp or neanderthal uh as fair play <laughs> would call him okay all right let's get into uh, the outcast twist Haley. Guess who's back, baby? Who? Skinny Ryan. Ba -ba 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 -ba. <laughs> he he has to have the best outcast wardrobe, right? Die jerks. Die jerks. <laughs> is the best piece of survivor wardrobe I think I've ever seen. And die and jerks. Yeah. Okay. Well Revenge, baby. They're back and they're ready to play three tribes for the first time in Survivor history. I would argue this might be one of the most important episodes in survivor history for a lot of reasons. Like there's a lot that we introduce here. The concept of bringing people back three tribes Twitters. in the game. Someone quits. Yeah. Like there's a lot of really important stuff that Steak happens. In and this lobster. Episode. Wait, that was last episode. Yeah. Uh, yes. I, with parcel a, as Jeff puts it. Uh, so yeah, th this is the first time they compete in three tribes. And I wonder if Mark Burnett's like, uh, Oh, this is a good idea. We should try this next season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that's uh, where it gets started here in uh, Survivor Pearl, I uh, Pearl Islands. I, I will say, uh, interesting note, I think this episode aired the night we left for uh, Survivor All-Stars. So, mm. I mean, I, I was not thinking three tribes uh, when we went out there, but we were at least thinking about, oh, people are coming back in from the game. I, I wonder, uh, do either of you remember, was that in like the preseason press that people were coming back into the game? 
the only thing so there were some spoilers about it obviously like yeah. this season came after the whole chill one stuff with the earth season right which was like one of the biggest most popularized spoilers out there i do recall though on the survivor sucks board like people were trolling the pause button as they were watching previews because i remember there's a lot of marketing promos of this jailbreak challenge and like a purple tribe uh, yeah. I remember okay. at least in the week leading up to it there was a lot of like because i think in the next time it's a lot of like shocked faces but we don't see who's coming in uh and so now it was like okay the the other six people are actually coming back to compete in this kelly what a memory on this guy I, I don't know how he's doing it right now. You were like mm-hmm. asked me like, is there anything? What like what about the Bruce season press? I'm like, I don't know. I was like, I was worried about seventh grade. Mm-hmm. I was worried mm-hmm. about seventh grade. Yeah, you were worried about being an outcast. I was an outcast with <laughs> this nose. Did you get back in? No. Why do you think I'm funny? You think I'm funny because I was popular and mm-hmm. cute? No. You were friend. just working on bandanas that said "die jerks." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not a good way to make a good impression. Yeah, I got I got expelled a couple of times for that. <laughs> All right, so uh, we have our big twist. Uh, th- as explained to us, if either tribe loses, uh, they will have somebody come in from the outcast, and if both tribes lose, two people will get voted back in. And Haley, wouldn't that have been fun if only one person got back in? Yeah, but also that was not ever going to happen. <laughs> mm. No, because look. Uh, they were on meager rations. They're playing just like you. They're purely fueled by revenge and nothing else. No other form of carbohydrates. And they blow the other two tribes out of the water in this challenge. So, Boom. Michael, you've studied this intently. I, if I remember, did you? were you on the Survivor Historians by this point? No, this was the season no. before I came on. Cool, 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 cool. What is it that they said that they had? Like a like a tiny bowl of rice and an apple every day or something like an, that? I, I, I definitely remember an, an apple. Yeah, for some reason, an apple a day keeps the outcasts away. Uh, I remember that. But like, listen. Did they sleep under a roof? I'm I'm assuming I there must be some did. sort of lodging. Yeah, sort of like, I would not be surprised, Rob, if I know that like preseason, yeah. remember you stayed in like that bungalow. I wouldn't be surprised if they lived yeah. in a similar type of situation. So... That there was a there were two shower. different things. Okay, so in Panama, where we filmed the All Stars, so we were divided up before the season started in in with our with our tribe. Right, and, so you, uh, you had so the big reveal on the challenge. I, I was with the the Shapira tribe, like at uh, Michael Bolton's dad's house. Uh, but there was also a Ponderosa, and I th- I would have to imagine that the people the Outcast tribe lived at the Ponderosa that we were at after now again uh like did they sleep on beds did they make them sleep on the floor i I don't know what uh but i can't imagine that they were it was not like they were on redemption island or the edge Mm -hmm. of extinction so i think they had a roof over their heads Uh, i think that they had like uh meager uh rations but it was still probably better eating than what was going on at least over at morgan Oh, yeah, yeah, I feel like the Drakes had a better time eating than the Outcasts, but the Outcasts had a better time than the Morgans. Yeah, but sleeping, I, I think, is like yeah. one of the most like underreported things here. Where if they were getting like a good like six seven hours, like I don't know, like were they waking them up like at six o'clock in the morning, like, like okay, you're them in the face yeah, with the water, like gun? Big Brother, like uh, like all right, house guests, time to wake up, Outcast, um, it's time to get up today. Mm-hmm. So Outcast, please, no singing. Mm -hmm. so i have to think that they were in pretty good shape to come back in they win the challenge they're coming back into the game andrew savage Haley, he's pissed he is so mad Mm -hmm. they don't belong here skinny ryan skinny ryan has no business stepping onto this beach again everyone else can come back but not skinny ryan over my dead body and so at this point, to add insult to injury of uh, someone who I guess has been injured, Austin in this moment is just like, all right, gang, uh, huddle up. I'm leaving. Mm-hmm. Phone me out right now. My temple can't take it anymore. It's full of parishioners. It's closed for service. <laughs> yeah. I'm a bag of atrophy right now, as I believe what he says directly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He wants to give 110% uh, at all times, but if he can't, he's got a plane leave. ride home. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, 110%. Uh, was that the proof on the alcohol that he bought? <laughs> Did you Do you think one of the outcasts whispered to him what the pre-jury vacation was going to be? And he was like, I want to. You are going to love it. <laughs> yeah. Open bar. 
<laughs> yes. Like, so, and he's listen, like, I'm out. I'm I may, out. I may not, I may not have won the car, but I won the Bacardi, and that's all that matters at the end of the mm-hmm. day. Mm-hmm. Do you know where they went on their pre pre jury vacay? Um, I do not know that off the top of my head. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Went. Well, because well, you went to because this is the same region. You went to Argentina, right? Yeah, so but like everyone from your season up, went though. to different spots. Yeah, they right? split. They split us up on the All Stars. Uh, so I I don't know uh, where they went. I'm not really tight with anybody uh, that was on that uh, pre jury trip. It's small group too. Uh, well, right? I, you married one of them. Yes, that's just true. That's true. I'll have to ask my wife. Later. <laughs> but I also I wonder though because we'll talk about this like the pure derision Jeff and the show has towards Austin for the rest of the season. Do they let him go on the trip? I would not be surprised oh, if they I just, think they have if they just uh, straight up sent him home. No, I, I I mean when Jeff says Austin go home, I don't think he went literally to his house. And he Jeff didn't seem that mad at this. I he don't threw know. his torch on the ground. Yeah, 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 but like, does he? Would he rather see like Rhino or Andrew Savage go here? No. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, he says people work too damn hard to get here. Okay. All right. Well, let's uh, then let's get there. Okay. Um, yeah. so, uh, we're, we're going to see, uh, actually right before we get to the two tribal councils. Also, uh, Drake is going to have like a little bit of a mini like tribal council <laughs> here, Mike, uh, where Johnny Fairplay and Sean have to like, uh, basically pitch themselves. Yeah, they're essentially like the other three are like, well, we're the decision makers. Let's hold kangaroo court here right now and essentially say, like, convince us why we should keep you. And this leads to, I think, still to this day, one of the biggest question mark decisions in Survivor history to the point where, you know, there's commentary on the Pearl Islands DVD. And I believe this episode has like Rupert, Krista and Sandra, and they still don't know why they kept Johnny Fairplay above Sean. Uh, Hmm. I think if I could come up with some sort of logic personally, it's that Sean was just more of an antagonist around camp. Like Johnny Fairplay voted against Rupert, but he got caught with his hand in the cookie jar. And if the assumption is like, they thought it was going to be a merge, right? And so they come in and this big twist happens. They talk about this. They don't know how many more votes are going to be until the merge now. So I think if they're thinking that we might continue to stay as Drake, it's super easy to be like, We'll vote off Sean now, and then, like, if we go again, we'll vote off John. He has no place to go. Of course, it's the wrong decision to make because Johnny Fairplay is by far the more dangerous player. But I think in this moment, despite what Johnny Fairplay has done for them lately, I think overall they liked him more than Sean. I think yeah. he had more work ethic than Sean. He got along better with them. He can also be a very charismatic guy uh, when he wants to, uh, when he wants to turn it on. And and I think that while we saw him being an antagonist at many points during the season, like I I think that they all genuinely liked uh, him as a person, especially like what he was presenting to each of them uh, as in in his social game. So I, I think that when he wants to, I think he really can turn on the charm. Yeah. So Bye bye, Sean, who, again, I think he was a bigger presence in the pre merge than I initially thought. Like he really was someone that just annoyed the crap out of everyone. Yet was able to like stick around to the point where in a different world, he would have made the merge. And as he talks Mm -hmm. about in his final words, like there's a chance he ends up actually going pretty far in this game. Haley, he gives us a very salty uh, couple of answers at the reunion show. Yeah, like it's hard to tell who's more mad about the outcast, Andrew or Savage Sean. or Sean. Yeah, yeah, and and one of my favorite moments from Sean was saying like, "Well, they showed all my bad moments, but they showed all of Rupert's good moments." Yeah, well, Mike, he's a little bit sort of like uh, the SNL like Weekend Update people, like the like the best friends of Rupert that he knew from mm. growing up. Like, I'm not really gonna say that that you know he wasn't. I mean, Rupert wasn't a bad guy i just think they kind of they kind of only showed the good moments from but rupert did they like i feel yeah, like they... we got some like <laughs> neggy rupert moments literally earlier on in this episode jo- rupert was going to snap john's head off like a chicken yeah. that is bodily harm like mm. that is not the good side of rupert but i think there's there's moments that i think are remembered for that like the whole storyline in episode four right with like him feeling bullied he has that monologue later where like i present a strong uh, facade, but really, I'm just the the scared, fat little kid that got picked on. I'm all his just life. a scared kid who's yeah. still an outcast in seventh grade, but not the outcast. <laughs> 
So yeah, I, th I think that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a really surprisingly multifaceted edit for Rupert, but I think because the good was so pumped up, like everyone was doing the Rupert roar at the reunion, he does the Rupert roar to a standing ovation. I have never Rupert seen that. That's, that's like his like get her done, right? Like that's like his catchphrase that he throws out there. That should have been in the Survivor catchphrases podcast we did, Rob. The Rupert roar sent everyone in a tizzy back in 2003. Roar. Yep. It's huge. So, All right. So yeah, so I can understand Sean's qualms, right? Of like living out there with Rupert was not as heroic as you may think. I can imagine that he's one of the cases like in a Jane Bright sense of comes across peachy keen or relatively so on TV, not very nice to live with as we've seen in his subsequent season. So yeah, and we should also say that this is also the uh, the infamous Johnny Fairplay FU vote where he's just yeah. so pissed off at Sean at this point that he curses him off in his confessional. Boop. Yeah, okay. Let's talk about Austin and Austin quitting, becoming the uh, first quitter in the game. And uh, I feel like that Survivor really wants to uh, kind of tar and feather Austin here to a degree, Haley, of that, hey, here's this big, strong guy, and he wants to quit. What a baby. He was acting like a baby, to be fair. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Honestly, like his edit is like pretty good for like what happened here. Like I feel like for a quitter, like you didn't get sewered as hard as other quitters have gone. So I I don't know. Uh, Who got it got... worse? Nayanka and Purple Kelly. Like does Purple Kelly get it get it worse by omission? Yeah, maybe. Or like I feel like Kathy. Like I listening to you guys talk about Micronesia. Like I feel like they really just didn't do well with Kathy. <laughs> well, I think that, that that was more like on the production. I feel like that edit wise, I feel like that yeah. uh, when she uh, when she wants to go, like I think that Jeff comes out and is like very like sympathetic to her. Yeah. Uh, and but I do feel like that the show wants to like make an example out of Austin. Yep. 100% because I think at this point they're really trying to build in this idea of like if you're coming on to Survivor, you better know what you're in sto store for. You know, you have to tough it out and learn things about yourself. We're not here for people who don't like the experience. I mean, for lack of a better term, they really like pull Austin's pants down this entire mm -hmm. edit. Like if he didn't already do it himself. Exactly. Like between, you know, everything with uh, the Pelican Pete, uh, between, you know, him nearly drowning. Like they showed so many moments and not to say that Austin didn't have those moments. But I do feel like they focus so much on how out of his element he was that there's two sides to that doubloon. We have Suri, who's like afraid of leaves and becomes one of the best players of all time. And you have Austin, who like freaks out at every little old thing, as Dara will say, and just like gets completely reamed out of like, you don't belong here. Get out of here. I completely agree. I think it's abundantly clear they were trying to make an example out of him. Jeff lays down his torch. He's not allowed at the rites of passage. Uh, essentially, like he, I'm surprised he was even allowed at the reunion. Uh, but I think it also helps to be like Austin's totally fine with what happens. Like he's not completely humiliated by the experience. He's just like, no, I know when my body hit its limit, and it did. It came out after the fact he had like multiple staff infections, and so he's like, mm -hmm. I can't do this anymore. I'm gonna go, and I I do respect him for that. Maybe, yeah. and that's why I feel like I have a soft, like a, a softer impression of how he was treated because he was so very much like happy with his decision i think yeah i think he was happy with his decision but i think that it gets uh painted as that like oh there's something wrong uh with austin of uh, that he he is a baby he doesn't yeah. want to work uh that i think that you could definitely uh get the interpretation that oh austin is being presented as lazy which is uh, not such a great thing to do. Uh, so I feel like that uh, Austin got a raw deal. He he himself made the decision to sell his clothes. Poor choice. Ba Absolutely. Bad, bad decision making all the way around. But I do think that there's another scenario of this where Austin is uh, treated by Survivor Medical and is afforded the courtesy of being like uh you know the, the survivor doctor saying maybe austin shouldn't be going on or you know god forbid you know get this guy have a chance to uh, get some clothes back right well that's the thing is like uh you talked about it last week in micronesia right the chet situation like that could have easily been a thing of like listen my body is failing on me please vote me out and it's like 
that's sort of the B.B. Anderson model, right? Where it's not exactly a quit, even though they do the really interesting Johnny scenario. Johnny Fairplay himself in Survivor yeah. of Fans versus Favorites, like request this. Yeah, and it's, but it's interesting though, the way they do it here. Jeff essentially asks for all the Morgan members to sign off on Austin quitting. And I wonder, is this sort of like, a, is this like a 12 angry men, right? If one person says no, what happens after that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that if there was some sort of like a discussion about like if if there was like somebody else was like, okay, this would be the perfect opportunity to do a blind side. Like if the producers knew like, okay, they're they're going to uh, be voting off Austin, but this is the perfect time to take out Andrew Savage. I think they would have had them vote, but I think that they were going for uh, like the most dramatic tribal council ever. Yeah. And so that being said, it's a, it's a big to do uh, and as much as they try to say like this should hopefully scare people into not quitting. It's going to happen uh, as soon as the next season. What I will say is to let your them quit. Yeah. Well, yeah. To your point, Rob, like I think a, a good person is someone who knows their boundaries. Then the experience might not be for them. I don't think it's robbing someone else of another spot uh, on the season. What I will say though, is I really enjoy Austin as a character. Uh, as much as he might felt he might have been dumped on, I really love the comedic runner of just like everything horribly failing for him. He's like the Charlie Brown out there. We're like, he's a, like, there's, he thinks a palm tree is a snake. He nearly drowns in a challenge. He's losing every time, like, it comes down to strength. Uh, you know, he really is sort of like the glass cannon in that perspective, not the ones that are being fired in that reward challenge. And I think he gets a really fun edit for someone who they really unfortunately try to like disgracefully boot from the game. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's come back for the tribal council to vote somebody in to the game to be continued. Yes. We get a to be continued. Should we, uh, should we take our break now? Should, uh, should we do a to be continued here? Yes. I think that's because great. when we come back, we're going to vote somebody into the game. We are going to, have our merge, of course. Uh, still have uh, the vote out of Rupert, the dead grandma. A lot to still break down here as uh, we're going to be talking through it all here on the third best season of all time, Survivor Pearl Island. And uh, we will be right back after this. All right, and we are back here to talk about the second half of Survivor Pearl Islands. Let's uh, bring back the panel. All right. Tonight, we're going to vote somebody back in from the previous panels, okay? So let's let's meet the people, that the outcast, Chappelle, Lindsay Wilson. Come, come on in. I'm mad. They got their opportunity. Chappelle has had 65 seasons of Survivor to cover. <laughs> Mari does it. not deserve to step a foot on this beach. Shannon Gus, come on. Just kidding. I love them all very, very yes. much. Yeah. Uh, but who's going to respond? Who's going to respond with, uh, I am a nice person, like Lil did after she got voted for? I am a nice person. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's vote somebody back into the game. Uh, Haley, you like the vote somebody into Survivor vote. Yeah, I love it. I love that there's like a little more decision on it. And um, one of my favorite like little Lil fun facts yeah. is that they they didn't vote Lil into the game. They voted her out of their vacation. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think that's legit. Yeah, so I, 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 I would I, have to say yes, yeah, a little bit, yeah. So the so because I think the vote is what it's like three to three to two to two to two. It's like an Australian Survivor vote, uh, and Lil gets votes from what? From Skinny Ryan, from Trish, and from Nicole. I know Nicole definitely voted for Lil because she was just didn't want to hang around with her anymore and is like, get the hell, get out of my adventure. I guess to quote mm -hmm. Rupert, I'm not going back in the game. You you, you are. Yeah, I don't I don't know if Trish uh did feel the same way, but Skinny Ryan, I think it was a truly emotional vote. So while it is very fun to believe, I know at least a third of the votes that Lil gets to bring her back into the game is because someone's like, You're voted out of Ponderosa. You're doubly voted out at this point. What do we think of them each getting two votes? I'm fine with it because 
it's there are there are two people going back in. So yeah, yeah I guess I so. They, I guess I'd, I'd, I'd yeah. rather have that than like the okay, the and the second person, the person with the second most amount of votes gets to come in as well. Because considering how scattered that vote was, like it would have been like a five way tie for second three one one uh, yeah one yeah something yeah. like that okay yeah because because Burton I mean let's let's get straight if if only one person come back I think it would have been Burton hands down. Sure, sure. I mean, uh, he ultimately uh, gets the. Does he get the most votes, or he's tied for the most? He's tied for the most, but like they keep saying that the reason why they wanted to vote for Burton is because they wanted an outcast to win, and they felt like between like his physical performance and like his strategy, they felt that he probably had the best chance of doing so. Yeah. And so I think it's safe to say that like he was the team captain. He was the Andrew Savage of the outcasts. Okay. So they're going back into the game. Lil is going to go back to her original tribe. Burton is going back to his original tribe and it might have been a little bit uh Aki Milwaukee Haley haven't if... heard that in a dog's age <laughs> yeah brought it back wowzers yeah and so if uh Burton would have come back with an attitude but he gets accepted with open open arms at Drake well I think I think there was two roadways that were going the right direction. Like Burton was like, I'm not going to hold on to any animosity going in here. And Rupert and the gang were like, whoever comes, we're going to welcome with open arms. Okay. So yeah. they were very happy to have Burton back with them. Maybe it speaks to getting like a big, strong guy in Burton back on your side Fair. where Andrew Savage and the Morgan tribe, they get Lil back and it is uh, a bit of an icy reception for Lil. <laughs> Lil's pissed. She's going back to Morgan. Morgan's pissed. They're getting and they Lil. don't want her. No, yeah, well, like, well, yeah, they were like, let's not talk to her. I th I think it though it depends on the how the chronology of the game went, right? Like these were three people that Morgan kicked out immediately, and then they went on this winning streak, right? That yeah. like bonded them as a five. So I can imagine they didn't want any of them coming back because it's like, you're not part of our family anymore. Whereas with Drake, they just got rid of these three people. So I think it's less of a sting of like, Burton was the most blindsided, but they're still like, hey, we just voted you off like a week ago, as opposed to Lil, where it's like, we burned you on the way out and we had this roaring success afterwards. And now we don't want anything to do with you. Well, why not? Yeah. So... Lil is back. Uh, they're not super excited to see her. Andrew is uh, legitimately angry that uh, Lil's back. Yeah, he's like, "Oh, we love you, Lil." She's like, "Yeah, I appreciate that, but I, I don't, I don't believe it." Yeah. All right, we go to our immunity challenge, and it is uh, individual immunity. Uh, we've merged. We've merged at the challenge. Hallelujah. Yeah, a, a little bit of a, like a really surprisingly low key merge. Maybe it's because they got the trick out, uh, you know, in the, or the fake out in the previous episode. They're just like, mm -hmm. oh, you're merged now. And they're like, hooray. Yeah. Uh, like there's no there's no real there's like a feast when they get back. But like they immediately jump into a challenge from here. Yeah. And so Burton is going to win individual immunity here in this challenge. Uh, on top of that, Haley Burton and Lil have immunity for the first vote uh was that too much to give the outcast i mean matt elrod didn't get immunity yeah i do think maybe it was a little too much but also i don't care mm -hmm. yeah i mean it, it at least guaranteed that they both made the jury and i think that was more so from a production perspective like let's make sure this isn't a revolving door situation because as we saw in redemption island you could very easily do that that's another reason i think why andrew savage is pissed uh, at least he did make the jury that one time, but yeah, it kind of sucks to have it, you know, say, Hey, these two people are automatically safe, but it creates this really interesting moment where we begin the chain of bequeathing between Rupert and Burton for the next couple of episodes. This mm -hmm. is such like a circle jerk that I get so annoyed watching this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it goes in a circle. So, I mean, uh, that, that does, uh, add up. Yeah, because... uh, that that challenge looks torturous, by the way. The keel hauling where you have to like drag yourself underneath and drown yourself five times over. Mm -hmm. Yeah, doesn't look it doesn't look that fun. I just like looked at Rupert opening his eyes underwater and like doing that. I'm like, my eyes are burning thinking about it. Mm hmm. <laughs> OK, um, let's go to our strategy talk at the at the big feast. H Haley, uh, how do you rate the merge feast? I think it was a pretty good mer merge feast, was it not? Yeah, to, to quote Rupert, they had a big hunk of lamb. 
<laughs> yeah. It looked good. Um, okay. I'm in. I'm in. Yeah. I mean, Lamb is not traditionally merge fair. No, I think they were really going for that pirate aesthetic, right? The sort of like almost like medieval times esque, like here's mm-hmm. big hunks of meat and potatoes for you to to dig your hands into. So it was nice. And we should also make note here, first black merge tribe. I know we've had like an umpteenth amount of times of them since then. But of course, the freaking sword, the freaking sword immunity idol is incredible. The best immunity idol we've ever had on the show. Mm hmm. Yeah, did we do that? Did we do a list for that? Yeah, Mike? I was just gonna ask. I, was like, I think that was I think that was the second there. one we did, and I believe that was number one with a bullet or a sword tip. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Immunity sword. Uh people like that. Okay. So everybody is very happy to eat. Uh, but Johnny Fairplay and uh Burton are gonna talk to Lil, and uh we see that there is an opening there. And so uh, they notice that Lil does not feel welcome at Morgan, and maybe uh, they are going to try to recruit her to come to Drake. And Andrew is uh, trying to uh, prevent that, and Lil goes back to uh, a earlier conversation she had with Andrew. Haley, she says, uh, you, you said you would tell me before, and you didn't tell me. I feel like Lil is the real savage in this conversation. <laughs> well done. I honestly I don't think Lil gets enough credit for being as cutthroat as she is in some of these scenarios because oftentimes she'll cry after it. But I think she makes a lot of brilliant moves. She's she swings in the correct direction many times in this mm-hmm. post merge. Like and she she will never get the credit she deserves for it because A, she was voted out and B because uh, she's a sobby McSobby pants, but mm-hmm. you know, I, I love her straight up telling Andrew to his face, like, Hey, we, yeah. like basically you made your bed now lay in it because the reason he is going here is because of the way he treated Lil. Yeah. And I think you're right about that. Lil is very capable in terms of like uh, putting the knife into somebody's back. But I do think she needs to have like the clear motive of yeah. why she's doing it. And I don't think it's enough just to, but don't you want to win? And I yeah. think that's fine. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I, but I think it's interesting comparing her to Sandra, right? Cause Sandra, how she wins out, she's able to say at the tribal council, like I had the motive for doing this. You all understand it. I think there's a little bit of Lil, like Chris is going to put it this way, right? In the final travel council of like having your cake and eating it too, of making this move and then be like, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done it. Like it's, it's really tough. And this is a little bit of like a Don Meehan talk as well, right? Like when you try to follow up a big move with like an emotional plea for forgiveness, you really don't know how you're supposed to take that. Mm-hmm. Like okay, what type of decision is this going to be? I can respect it if it's gameplay, I can respect it if it's personal, but if it's both, I don't know what you're trying to tell me here. Okay. Well, she's not asking for any forgiveness uh, when she votes out Andrew Savage from the game. Uh, The Morgan crew, uh, they were coming for Johnny Fairplay. We should also note here, Johnny Fairplay, I mean, you know this from Rob probably more than I do uh, because you're more of the wrestling person. I'm pretty sure like nearly every confessional Johnny Fairplay does is some sort of wrestling reference, is it yes, not? Yes, that's right. That's right. And here he uh, talks about uh, the macho man, Randy Savage. Is is wrestling like fair laws here? Is it sort of like Christmas music where you can make reference to it and not fear about getting sued by the company? Yeah, I don't don't think that it's necessarily like a uh, trademark. Like, I feel like if there was somebody who was like a big movie buff and like said like lines from famous movies, I kind of feel like that that would also be in. And again, I don't know if he's like doing the exact uh, like uh, quote here. So yeah, I think this is all like in bounds. Okay, I just thought it, I thought it was interesting, and obviously it's this not has... like music where you know that it's like that, uh, and, and maybe some of these trademarks might be copyrighted, but I think mm-hmm. he's uh, you know uh, not in any uh, legal jeopardy here, at least from this. Yeah, so obviously I think it's it's the most equivalent. Do you remember a period of time where there was like an Andrew Savage action figure? No, 
I'm pretty sure there was, and maybe this is a big joke on me, and Burton's like pointing and laughing at me behind my back. But I'm pretty <laughs> sure back in the day, uh, yeah, a little bit of like Beavis and Butthead in uh, in Burton as well. Beavis Butthead and Burton. In uh, Savage action figure. Haley, are you buying this? No. Am I like believing that this exists, or am I Either. actually physically? Either. It? No, neither. Okay. Like, are you where, sure where it wasn't one of those this, like Mike? pop vinyl I, I, figures? I mean, I, I saw it on I saw it on Survivor Sucks. I don't know if this was like a specially created thing for for some because I do know that Andrew hey, Savage that sounds like Photoshop. He did, I know he did try to parlay some stuff into some to some success after the he show. Wasn't like, even he, on the jury. You think How he do you sell he, a doll of a guy who's not on the he jury? He fashioned a uh, Andrew Savage uh, doll. Does it have a string in the back that you pull? Yes, and it says, uh, get out of here, Skinny Ryan. Don't pull mm -hmm. my string. I'm mm -hmm. disappointed in you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, damn it, Lil, uh, is really the main thing that he says. I don't know, for some reason yeah. I remember this. I, I'm sure I'm completely wrong, but if anyone somehow remembers this, please let me know when Andrew Savage had an action figure. But also remember, for a good portion of time, Andrew Savage is one of those people that like Jeff Probst wanted back yeah. for a long, long time. Andrew Savage is like, Jeff's wet dream of a Survivor contestant. If yeah, they were buddies. If Johnny Fairplay hates the most, Andrew Savage is like who he loves the most. Well, let me propose something then. Yeah. Should I should I set up some other sliding doors here? Sure. Because, so there's a rumor, and Rob, maybe you can contest this or not. That for Survivor All Stars, uh, there was a spot open that was up between Rob Mariano and Andrew Savage, mm -hmm. depending on who went further. And I think it's safe to say with Andrew, they both got voted out in 10th, but I think that because he didn't exactly make it as far as maybe even someone like Rupert in this season, they said, all right, we're going to pass on Savage. We'll bring on Boston Rob. So thanks to Lillian Morris, we have four Mariano daughters. In Wait, this Mike, is this a sliding door scenario that you're making up or this is was uh, that you have heard this? I've, I've, heard, I've heard. Now, listen, the all stars. No casting stuff way. Is like a, is a no well way. of rumors. You don't yeah. think that Andrew Savage was in consideration for all stars? I mean, maybe that they had like his Polaroid up on the wall, but I don't <laughs> think that it was like they were like, uh, Andrew Savage, Boston <laughs> Rob, Andrew Savage, Boston Rob. It's interesting to think about, though, because like uh, the he's entire a cool guy, <laughs> I don't know. He wears the hell out of a jacket. Who, mm -hmm. <laughs> who would have treated you better? He has a doll for Andrew Savage. <laughs> he has a doll. Uh, I feel I actually... like he would have been out first if Andrew Savage was up. Yeah, I would have been Kenny Ryan all quicker. over again. <laughs> yeah, um, Mike, I actually do have. Uh, you're you're not making this up. I actually do have an Andrew Savage action figure oh my here. God. Oh, let me uh, see. It. Let me see. Let me hold, let's see if I can hold it up to the microphone. Uh, so you can you can hear what it says. Wimpy little non-leader. So okay. Wow. Mm hmm. Really mm -hmm. lifelike in that regard. Yeah. Especially now that because I I've outed myself as somebody who plays with an Andrew Savage doll. Listen, you create all your favorite moments from Survivor Pearl Islands and Survivor Cambodia in your spare time. You're a Survivor fan. What, what's mm -hmm. not to love? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I think that uh, you might be getting Rickrolled on the Andrew Savage action figure. I, I think I'm getting Rickrolled on a lot of stuff, apparently, <laughs> around Andrew Savage. Is Andrew Savage just, like, selling me a bill of goods and I'm not even realizing yeah. it? Actually, yeah, let's, I, what I think we're we... buying into big Savage propaganda. Yes. Let's put the listeners to the test that if anybody can find the Andrew Savage action figure, please send it to us on Twitter and include myself and Haley and Mike so we can all take a look at the Andrew Savage action figure when you find it. I would I would absolutely love to see it. OK. All right. Um, let's go to the uh, next episode. Uh, Lil feeling great uh that they're selling her she's gonna be the last morgan yeah she's an honorary drake right now mm -hmm. so okay um that but lil that's not gonna be enough for lil eventually okay she's um in the blood now right right all right so we're gonna ultimately get to uh this is the episode that uh mike referenced earlier maybe one of the sleepier episodes of the season uh where rhino is eventually gonna go home Right, we're covered in bug bites. That's how sleepy we are. Uh, yeah. We're yeah, we're I mean, playing pretty... with a stingray, an electric stingray. Yeah, and that's what the episode references, right? Shocking, simply shocking. Like the the outcome is anything but. In fact, I think Rhino gets shocking. Rhino gets voted out unanimously. I believe even the Morgans are just like, yeah, this is a sinking ship. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, poor Rhino. What so, a guy. 
uh, Rupert is going to win a reward. Uh, he is going to uh, gift it to uh, Burton. Uh, and Burton is going to uh, go to breakfast uh, with Lil. Uh, and this was a nice breakfast date for Burton and Lil, Haley. This sounds nice. This sounds like a nice time. I feel like at this point, this is a reward I might want. Yes. Uh, however, the breakfast conversation is, uh, we need to get Rupert out. <laughs> and yeah. yeah, she just doesn't feel good about that because like, she's on the reward, mm-hmm. basically. He because Rupert gave us breakfast. Burton. Yeah. That's not, Don't... that's not a good a good thing to do to your host. Don't bite the hand that feeds you. Uh, but mm-hmm. she's going to really trust in Burton because not only are they co-outcasts together, but Burton is an Eagle Scout. And you just like see the hearts in Lil's eyes oh. of like, this is a man who knows what I strive for in this game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And is this when Burton promises Lil Final 2 or was that earlier? Well, according to Burton, he never promised Lil Final 2. But he <laughs> did, right? Like I'm not, I'm not Mandela affecting that into my brain, am I? Well, he he gives Lil his word that they'll work together as quote as long as possible. Right. Hmm. So this is gonna, this well, is a, I mean, to the final two would be as long as possible. Right, but this is this is sort of the weird dichotomy of the game, right? Like where you have certain people like Sandra who will lie about anything. I swear on my kids that I'll screw you and Burton. <laughs> you have Johnny Fairplay, and then you have Chris being like, oh, "I never lied to anybody in my life because I don't make any promises." Uh, and then Burton being like, "Well, technically." It's as far as we could possibly go. So even still early on in Survivor, despite some of the game-changing aspects that we talked about earlier on, like there are still people who have differing boundaries of morality of like what passes and doesn't pass in the game. But that's mm-hmm. the joy of Survivor, right? Like it's that's the fun of this. Mm-hmm. Definitely yeah. early on, especially. I do feel like nowadays we sort of lose that aspect, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's like it should be cutthroat all the time, blindside or be blindsided. Here it's still like. I want to trust people a certain amount and feel like I, I have at least some honesty in the way I approach things. Anything else uh, to highlight here in this uh, Rhino boot episode? Cause I feel like we have uh, much more interesting things to talk about moving forward. Wow. We really just have not talked much about Rhino this podcast. I eh? mean, is, is there a ton to talk mm-hmm. about? He's no, an I mean, electrician and he's allowed to lie according to Savage. Oh, was that? So do you think, Mike, that they killed an electric eel? So that was mm. uh, sort of like uh, the electrician signed his death warrant in this episode? Exactly. He, uh, they, Well, they, actually off camera, they said like, hey, Rhino, can you string a bunch of these together and like hang some Christmas lights up? And he's like, that's not how it works. And so they said like, screw you. Let's get rid of you. It is interesting, you know, uh, Rhino seemed to have one trusted ally in Andrew Savage. He's known for having many partners, but in this case, it was just one in this game. So, mm-hmm. yeah, R.I.P. Rhino. And this was back-to-back Rhino uh, for me, Haley, because I got to talk about Survivor Micronesia, and we saw him in the audience when he was engaged to uh, Mary. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, back-to-back seasons for Rhino. Nice guy. Uh, you know, n- not a lot to uh, break down here no. in uh, his time in the Pearl Islands. He'll be the first member of the jury. Uh, congrats yeah. to him. Something yeah. that is interesting, though, his uh, his voting confessional, right, where he votes for Chris, it's like, I didn't like you before and I don't like you now. For some reason, the Morgans hate John and they hate Krista, too. Maybe it goes back from when she raided their camp. Yeah, but Sandra escaped scot free. Uh, they yeah. like they're they're fine with Sandra, but for some reason they like can't stand Krista for whatever reason. Okay, all right, let's get to uh, really uh, some of the uh, meteor parts of the season. All right, uh, we are all about Rupert here in episode ten, Mike. Yeah, this is as media as a big hunk of lamb. Uh, this is, I think, this is an incredibly underrated episode. Uh, I think a lot of people talk about the next episode that we're going to speak about, but the Rupert boot episode, it's one of those, I like to call them heist episodes where they set up the idea at the top of the episode of like, this is what's going to happen. And then there's no real surprise. We just see how it carries out throughout the episode. And that's what happens here. Right Mm -hmm. at the top, we get everyone being like, as Rupert goes hunting for sharks, everyone, the sharks are circling him. And they're like, we got to get rid of Rupert right now. And essentially the entire episode is the downfall of Rupert. And considering how big of a character he is and how he responds to it, I just think it's it's an incredibly glorious episode and it's full of a lot of really fun character moments. And Haley, we uh, see a lot of uh, Rupert uh, talking to the camera, a lot of uh, Rupert confessional also in this episode. We sure do. Like, I Get like that head. he's 
I like that he's narrating his own downfall. And honestly, like, I think this is the right place in the story for Rupert to go out. Um, I think if he went a little farther, maybe his charm would have worn off a little bit. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I, th- I think he's starting to get to a point where it's just, like, not the most becoming. Like, when... Um, Burton promises that he'll give the reward to Rupert if he wins, and then he ends up giving it to um, Fair Play, and then Rupert gets really mad. But it's kind of like, wasn't yeah, reward. Yeah, there's a little bit of an entitlement that starts to pop up with Rupert. Well, it's the weird thing with Rupert and Burton where it's my show <laughs> a little bit. Uh, yeah, but where where you you feel like like they never felt even with each other. Right. Like you would think after they after, you know, Burton gave immunity to Rupert and Rupert gave the reward back to Burton. You think like, OK, even Steven, we're square. That wasn't the meal. Or exactly. even like I felt like <laughs> Soup I, is felt not like a they meal. Were, I felt like they were even after Burton gave the immunity to Rupert as like a as like a, this. We're mending fences. I am sorry for making fun of you earlier. Like, I feel like that should have been like the. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It would have been interesting, though, if the rest of the season was a la like Tom and Ian. You have Rupert and Burton winning all the challenges and just giving everything oh, to each God. other. That would have been so yeah. boring. They go out to dinner. It's like, I got this one. No, I got this one. No, I've got it. No, I've got this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's uh, this is where, though, we get some real introspection to Rupert, right? And this is where we get the first invocation of one Laura Bonham. He, he talks to Laura at night. Mm-hmm. The nighttime is the worst time. Who well, apparently it's my one Jeff bad wants time. to make out with? Yeah, yeah. At the reunion, Jeff, Jeff's like, "Look at that hottie for Toddy. What a babe, yeah. Lord yeah. Rupert. If you see her next season, do me a favor, slobber all over her <laughs> on my behalf. <laughs> She's gonna be popular. Bone yeah, him more like bone her. <laughs> <laughs> no. Man, uh, early seasons, Jeff, real horn dog here. <laughs> He's a young man. <laughs> but yeah, this is, all, this is this is again where we get sort of like the everyone's getting annoyed with Rupert at it too, right? With all of the Chris are like baby, 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 and Fair Play's like I'm getting sick of it right now. They think they're above the law. It's time to put things into action. Mm-hmm. And I think that's true. I think they were getting a little high on their own D's over there, and I think they made the right move here. Okay. Uh, Burton is going to tell Rupert that he will give him uh, his uh, reward, uh, but he does not. And Rupert uh, gets very upset about this, Mike. Yeah, so I'm not sure what Burton was doing here. Was it so that he could guarantee he gets taken if if Rupert wins? Like, is this just a way that he wins no matter what? Because he vocalizes later on, like, no way was I letting Bert, Rupert get near that award. So, like, he fuels himself. Granted, the immunity challenge is going to have nothing to do with physical strength whatsoever. So he could have eaten all the, the pizza on the catamaran that he wanted to. Uh, but it still is an odd move. And still for also for him to give up the reward still. Yeah. But to Johnny Fairplay. Yeah, like, hmm. what was the point of him even telling Rupert this? I mean... We could say this, but I, I could tell you, like, going through the Survivor catalog, I mean, this happens, uh, like, at least once in every single season. Somebody, yeah. for no inexplicable uh, reason, a- ends up uh, telling another player that I'm going to take you on a reward and then wins said reward and does not deal with the thing that they just said they were going to do. I mean, this was sort of like because Rupert ends up missing out on the loved ones visit, like, this was his version of that, right? I feel like that usually occurs with the loved ones visit, but Rupert has his own. I don't know, I guess that catamaran was his loved one this time around. Well, mm-hmm. he was going to deep sea fish, and he was going to get so many big fishies. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, Lil and Fairplay came up empty-handed, and everyone's PO'd at them. Yeah. Oh, whatever, who cares? Well, Fairplay and Lil also then, uh, they hit it off on the reward. And like Johnny Fairplay is like, all right, I'm going to explain the whole plan to you, Lil. And she's like, okay, well, you're going to have to explain it to me a couple of times. <laughs> Because she's half a beer in, man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Been there. He's like, I, I am the scout light. master. <laughs> I love drunk Lil. Because this happens at the final six, too, right? Where she's like jumping on the bed. She's like, I might stay up till 830 tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, no. Um, this is uh, this is uh, really fun to get uh, Fair Play and Lil here together. Uh, she seems like that she's enjoying herself. But she's really upset about having to betray Rupert. Yeah, this is it's really interesting that Johnny Fairplay is essentially and again, it's it's not too dissimilar from what happened with you, Rob, sort of 
bringing someone under your wing and look, Lil was still capable of deception. We saw that with Andrew Savage, but she felt like she was justified in doing so. This is fair play, I think, sort of coercing, standing there in Cloud City saying, Lil, join the dark side. We can rule the galaxy together as scout master and, and wrestler. That. Mm-hmm. That's not true. That's impossible. I'm really surprised she went through with it. Mm-hmm. It seemed like out of all the people, Rupert was the last person she would sc- screw over. And then she did it. And I'm like, I'm proud of her. I'm very proud of Lil here. She yeah, well, I, trigger. well, I think fair play, it, it also helps that fair play comes from being like, we have numbers, right? Like yeah. everyone's in on it, except for Krista, Sandra, and Rupert. Well, I think I think Johnny Johnny played it very smart too. Like I, I feel like it could have gone very, very wrong, very quickly. Like Lil could have immediately gone back and been like, hey, Rupert, this is what the scoop is. And then Johnny's done. Mm-hmm. I also love, we talked about this before, but such a great interaction between the two where, you know, uh, Lil's like, oh, I should have given the award, the reward away. And uh, Johnny Fairplay goes, oh, thank God for that. She goes, don't say that about God. (laughs) (laughs) And she literally starts blubbering into his arms. And John is just like, God, I have to spend at least four hours doing this. Mm -hmm. It's so much fun. And also on top of this, and let's not forget in all of this, Sandra invents the spy shack. Yeah, so <laughs> there's a lot of Sandra spying in this season, and it goes back even further than I had remembered. So uh, Burton and Fairplay are uh, talking about, like, okay, when we Lil gets back, we got to uh, talk to her, or, or we got to get Lil on board. And Sandra, like, reports this back, and uh, she doesn't know exactly what they're trying to do. But Haley, uh, Sandra is spying all over the place. I love it. And it really works for advantage. And what is it? The next episode? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. That's when, she, that's when she's going to bring someone in on the spy shack and essentially be like, because I don't know, I guess, does she tail them? Do these two guys happen to always meet in the same location? And she <laughs> happens to find an area around that? Or maybe I don't they know. just think they're talking a lot quieter than they actually do. She never explains it in her seasons of what she does to like do her spying. Uh, she just does it. She just literally hides in the bushes. Like there's no any. That's the thing. Is like Tony, you can throw over everything you want, but like sometimes all you need to do is just crouch in a bush and just like wait to overhear two loud men talking, and you have the intel that you need. All right, let's go to the immunity challenge. Uh, it's uh, an old classic dart game, Haley. You ever play a uh, killer? I was gonna say something weird about blowing, but I'm just gonna push that <laughs> aside. No, Rhino's already gone, Haley. <laughs> oh, um, you know what? I'm not great at regular darts. I do not want to put them near my mouth. Yeah, this was a very complicated immunity challenge, Mike. This is odd for the ones that are like deceptively simple. Of fire this gun at this target. This was okay. In order to become the killer, you must hit your own space, and then you're able to take out one to three targets on someone else's. But if they take out one of yours, you will lose your killer status. Like, it was incredibly convoluted. Something I will say uh, about this season overall is, like, I really love its faults because it shows me that they're trying and that they're caring, that they're, like, doing all these things. Something that we actually didn't talk about that I really enjoyed in its chintziness was the treasure chest Mm -hmm. from the pre-merge, the buried treasure, which let's face it, ends up being like a moldy old wet fart of a bounty. (laughs) Uh, But I love the fact that they like attempted to make this thing happen. They're going to do it to much better effect in your second season, Rob. Mm -hmm. And I like it here that they're, they're trying something new here. You know, weapons have been a part of the, this show since the very beginning, but they completely overly complicated this. Yeah. Mike, I could have used Jeff breaking the fourth wall here to explain to me exactly how this was all working. Let me get out a whiteboard for the dartboard mm-hmm. here nicely. You want to be a killer right here. And I mean, nobody really... The thing also about blow darts is like, unless you are incredibly competent in them, you're really just randomly aiming. Right. right? And, this, and this is how we get Sandra accidentally taking Rupert out of the challenge that he needed to win. But ultimately, uh, Burton will be uh, knocking Rupert out. And Rupert says, Burton knew what he was doing. I love uh, before when Rupert's tearing apart that coconut. He's like, last damn thing I give to Burton, except to vote. (laughs) Yeah, he told him. All right. So afterwards, uh, we get Rupert upset. Uh, Now, Johnny Fairplay, uh, Lil and Burton, uh, they are together. Uh, that they are going to uh, bring in uh, Dara and Tawana on this vote. 
uh, and they have uh, enough to be able to vote against uh, Rupert. Haley, uh, what else uh, do we need to set up for Rupert going home? What else? I don't know. Just like uh, that he went out in the day and caught lots of fish. Mm-hmm. Perhaps? Yep. Well, that they'll be all saved for dinner. Yeah. Well, it'll be nice to have just a meal when they get home after a long, hard travel council. Can we talk about the most gruesome animal B-roll I've ever seen in my life? Though? Is it about the uh, snake eating an iguana? Yeah, I think Sue Hawk got the metaphor wrong, apparently, because apparently the iguanas are in more danger than the rats. That was... God, Ambitious. I thought, doesn't I thought David it like, go through David the whole Adenborough. episode, too? Like, doesn't it like go in pieces? Yeah, so it goes, it takes place over the course of the entire post immunity challenge, where it starts with like the two of them next to each other. And then as they continue to plot Rupert's demise, we see the iguana slowly lessen and the snake slowly widen, as it mm-hmm. basically is like he's being consumed inch by inch by the rest of the tribe. Mm-hmm. So the snake represented the whole tribe. I would imagine so. I guess maybe Johnny Fairplay, if we have to blame one person, and the poor iguana is Rupert. And essentially, Tribal Council comes down to, right, like, talk of work ethic. Uh, This is where Sandra becomes an accidental poet and says, let it be known. John wakes up at noon and goes under the bushes. Uh, I have yet to see him wash a dish or even clean a fish. Uh, Mm -hmm. And basically, like, despite all those arguments, Rupert still gets voted out. Yeah. I mean... At this point, uh, I think we're pretty far down the road over like what he does. He doesn't wash a dish. All right. Get, I'm changing my vote. I yeah, can't it's not, it's not his birthday. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, and Rupert ends up going home. And I loved uh, Rupert's uh, th- th- uh, soliloquy after he gets what I was like. Uh, it's insane how much I needed this so much for my dreams. Yeah, it's like, babes, you weren't the only one out here. Oh, Sad, and, right? No, it's incredible, though. Again, this, this is Rupert existing in his own world. He's he's the main character. He This is the final act of his play, right? Like, this is his, you know, I lay dying right here. So much for my dreams. As, like, the curtain closes and the lights fade on Rupert Boneham, the play. Like, it's t- totally within character for Rupert. It is unintentionally one of the funniest sets of final words who ends their final words in survivor by shrugging looking at the camera and saying so much for my dreams a legend that's who mike i mean he literally and again sincerely in every sense of the word i love watching rupert he is so ott i think to haley's point he pours it on a bit bit thick especially going into survivor all-stars where i think even in those first couple episodes People are like frothing around the mouth at him, but Rupert 1.0 is always going to be not only my favorite version of him, but one of my favorite versions of a Survivor character. Okay. After Rupert got voted out, only one thing to do, Haley, throw out all the fish. Throw that fish! (laughs) And we know that it is going to be uh, Sandra who's going to do it. What a reveal here, though. It is Krista who ends up taking all of the heat for it. I didn't do it. I put my canteen <laughs> down. Stop yelling. <laughs> Wrongfully accused queen. Oh my god. I'm a victim. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I love it though, because this is Sandra though, in a nutshell, in so many ways, right? This is Sandra being for lack of a better term, villainous, right? And we're going to talk about this later on in an episode where she's like, I'm going to steal the machete. I'm going to steal the, the, uh, the spear. I'm going to steal all this stuff. Like, she totally is fine with taking these things. But as soon as she gets caught, she is going to blame literally anybody else, including her closest ally in the game, just saying, oh yeah, it must have been her. And I love that her alibi is that she was too busy yelling at, quote, that snake mother effer John, <laughs> that it was, an, it was a perfect way to, to excuse why she didn't do it. Yeah, they're like, Sandra was yelling. She couldn't have thrown the fish. She can't mm-hmm. yell and throw at the same time. She's Sandra. Mm-hmm. And she was yeah. like, I tried to throw them out, but then I tripped and dropped them. <laughs> Krista does not mount an effective defense at any point. Uh, she uh, says, like, I know it looks like I did it, but I didn't 
do it. <laughs> yeah, again, like, uh, no, she's no Clarence Darrow. That's for sure, right? Like, she's on the stand right now, and she's like, look. I really didn't touch the fish. <laughs> and they're just like, okay, well, we literally have nothing else to go off of. So sorry, A, your main ally got voted out, and B, you just tainted our only food supply. So like you're next to go right now. Mm-hmm. It was pretty cold that they were gonna then vote out Rupert and then eat all the fish he caught. But also pretty cold for Sandra to be like, let me dump <laughs> it all out, you know? Yes. Yes. If I'm not if Rupert's not here to enjoy this, nobody's eating it. Okay. All right. Well, this sets up our big reward challenge, and uh, we are going to have our family visit. Haley, let's bring out the loved ones. Family and high school sweetheart, mm-hmm. but now friend visit. Come on, mm-hmm. William. Yes. And also, and also maybe someone that Dara met like at the airport because he knows nothing about her. To be mm-hmm. fair, when... I made Ethan play this game alongside the Survivor contestants. He did very badly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, these are not necessarily easy questions. I don't know. I I do think things like uh, nickname are pretty, pretty give me's. Okay. Well, ask Angela. Well, what's Mike's nickname? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, she's sleeping right now, but Mixed I, master I, Mike, I've that's say that's the problem now. I have too many. Maybe nub nut was one of Dara's many, many nicknames <laughs> that she has. I'd rather die than have some. <laughs> well, we know where this is going. Television. Yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, that was just one of my favorite. Obviously there's a, there's a big to do with the loved ones challenge, but that was my favorite runner was that Dara. I don't think Dara and her boyfriend got a single question. Right. And Dara's like, we're going to have a talk when we get home. Uh, I looked mm-hmm. her up. I do not believe she is married to poor Bradley after that. Yeah. Well, maybe that's why Jeff Probst thought that maybe she had an in with Johnny Fairplay of that. Uh, well, obviously like her boyfriend and her, uh, do not have that much common ground. Oh, could this have been like a George Glass scenario where they're just mm-hmm. like, oh, my name, my, his name is Bradley, Bradley Milton. And they're like, Bradley Milton, come on out, Dara's boyfriend. They found him? Yeah, they found a Bradley Milton and brought him out. Or like wow. Dara's original Bradley, like her, she had a boyfriend named Bradley Milton, but they broke up right the before. The wrong one. Yeah. But they had already bought the ticket, so they needed to find somebody else whose name it was exactly Bradley Milton to go to Panama to use the plane, plane ticket. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that would make sense. Also, <laughs> <laughs> the nickname, right. the, the nicknames actually might have been my favorite question because we get Changa from Sandra, and we have yep. Burton's nickname is Burton. <laughs> Burton. <laughs> yeah, him and his mom are so serious. I They're love on the same it. page. Okay, um, we can't bury the lead here because we need to talk about Thunder D is going to come out and final uh, seven. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, and he's coming out, and he's dancing, and of course, uh, <laughs> that we're like, "Hey, remember the thing? Remember the thing? How's, How's grandma? grandma? What? Yeah, what? <laughs> what? Uh, oh, that. Oh, she, she died. died, dude. <laughs> <laughs> the three greatest words in the English language. <laughs> She that dude. <laughs> it's just, it's incredible. The the acting is just, and I mean, I'm I'd love to hear all of our thoughts as we were watching along for the first time because, like, I'd imagine again, since I don't think any of us conceptualized the idea that like they would make this up, we're like, oh, that's a weird thing to say, but like, damn, that's a tough way to deliver news. But no, I think Thunder D was trying to play a role of like, well, Thunder D wouldn't just say she died. He tried to mm-hmm. lighten the mood a little bit, you know? Thunder D likes to have a good time with his grief. Mm-hmm. So, Haley, do you remember what it was like for you the first time that you saw this? I wish I did, but I don't really. Like, mm-hmm. I, I I, feel like I was, I just di- couldn't get it. Like, I just did couldn't make my brain work. Yeah. Mike, were you upset? Like, upset as in, like, sad for Johnny Fairplay originally? Yes. yes. Yeah, of course. I mean, listen, I was... 14 years old uh when this aired and look you know i was someone who was very fortunate to like the only people i had lost in my life and my close family were grandparents and so like i think that's an associative feeling that everybody feels i think there's a reason why everyone except for sandra uh really feels for him is because like that's an incredibly tough moment especially when he says the only like it was either going to be my buddy or my grandmother like if you think about the circumstances were this true that like he wasn't even able to see 
one of the people that's the closest in his life that she would have gone out as his loved one. That sounds incredibly tragic. How do we rate Johnny Fairplay's performance, though? Do the circumstances help buoy the acting job that he's doing? I think I'll, he does a very good job. Yeah, I'll give him a seven, at least. I'll give Thunder D a two and a half, that guy. Yeah, but... yeah. yeah I, okay, I forgot that he's like, oh, oh, oh the thing. The, the thing. <laughs> oh, sh- yeah. all right. <laughs> yeah. Um, just to speak to uh, my reaction with uh, that, I actually had heard about this happening before I saw this uh, happen on the episode. So I don't I don't have a honest uh, reaction to all of this. Uh, this happened while I was filming Survivor All Stars. Uh, this episode aired. So I had heard about the big right. grandma lie. And then uh, by the time I saw the episodes, I think I might have watched the finale before I uh, ended up uh, actually seeing this episode. The awkward thing as well is because of the close off your back twist, Fair Play is having this breakdown about losing his grandmother while standing in his boxers and a shirt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. It, it helps uh, lessen any sort of dramatics around the situation. Uh, <laughs> but like good on Johnny Fair Play for like really trying to play it up. He's got Lil. If you got Lil, that's what, though, I think, like, Lil was a fairly easy one to catch in that regard. You don't need Rupert to catch Lil. Well, he yeah. had the production. I mean, that uh, he did not clear this with anybody about that what, what had happened, and so, like, I wonder if it was the kind of thing where if he would have told them he wanted to do this, that they would have said, like, no, you can't do that. <laughs> like, we're not doing that. Uh, but he did it, and then, you know, it was part of the show after that. It's just, it's an incredible moment. And we'll get to obviously the follow-up, but I think something that's even better is that there is one person who doesn't, it's not necessarily that she thinks he's lying, but she does not give an F how many dead relatives he has. Fair play's mm-hmm. buddy. Fair play's mm-hmm. buddy. But uh, doesn't what? she, like, I feel like it's been said after the season that she like overheard him saying something or like. Story I, tracks. Yeah, like just not, like she, the things just weren't adding up for her. Like I, I. Mm-hmm that she didn't be- she didn't totally believe him. no like, like something about like he was talking about his grandmother coming out or something yeah, yeah. yeah. something like yeah. that but I, I i love it though because again everyone is like weeping and we have the exchange of sandra like you said fair play's buddy and john's like well i, I have like a million questions i'd like to ask my grandmother and she's like it's not all about you and luke goes his grandmother died sandra <laughs> all about you okay <laughs> yeah that's a great line <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, ultimately, everybody uh, walks the plank uh, till finally uh, Johnny Fairplay is going to uh, be the one to win the reward challenge. Everybody else has to go off to an island. We don't really get to see anybody else on the island. Uh, and Johnny Fairplay is alone with Thunder D. Uh, Haley, this is also kind of a lame reward uh, for Fairplay to hang out with his buddy and do nothing all day in the camp. Yeah, like, They like, didn't even he... give them a, a happy meal. They yeah, you could have like chartered the catamaran for this one they would w- thunder d and johnny flare play would have crushed some Coors light and beer mm-hmm. yeah exactly no. like, just just give him like a production fishing boat and just like give him a, a bottomless cooler of beers and they would have a great time otherwise it's well it's also because like this is one of the first times we've had the friend visit right otherwise it's been a family member and there's more love of hey everybody look at the camp mm-hmm. but the break to do has nothing to do with the camp it Robert, has to have you met with... Thunder D? Yes. Is he cool? I mean, I I I, I was impressed uh, when I met him. I, I believe that uh, Johnny Fairplay and Thunder D are no longer pals, uh, sadly. Uh, but uh, you know, he did come to like a bunch of Survivor events uh, in the years following all of this. Their friendship it died, dude. It died. It died, dude. Now, again, maybe this is the ultimate long con, but as as I have been told, I don't believe that they are on speaking terms. This Very is sad. just this is just an incredible TV moment. Like mm-hmm. even watching it back, even knowing I love again the storytelling behind it. Like there could have been a confessional of Johnny Fairplay beforehand, being like, "Well, I have an ace up my sleeve in the loved ones challenge," but like the way they suckered us into it. And then the floor drops out from under you. Uh, I remember I when I watched this in high school, like I had a social studies teacher who I would always talk about it the next day. And just like, I remember walking into class and the pure fury in my teacher's eyes of like, can you believe what he did? To the point where she derailed class for the first 10 minutes mm-hmm. by just going off on what Johnny Fairplay did. 
it's wild. Remember, like five seasons before this, Keith proposes to his fiance in like a quote unquote loved ones challenge. Sure. And now five seasons later, someone is faking a loved one's death to earn sympathy. Haley, how do you think that this plays in 2021? Terribly. I don't yeah. think it works. I, I think it I think it works so much worse. I, I don't think that this is celebrated in any way in no. 2021. Well, and I, I, I again, I, I don't know like the discourse that was happening in live, but I think what brings some levity to it in the end is that at the finale, even Lil was like, my mother just died. We bury her. I'm this move by Johnny. It mm-hmm. was fair game. Like it was mm-hmm. fair game, whatever. Yeah. You know, he did what he His had grandmother's to do. His grandmother's there. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, so I think that. Like, I think if other people were more pissed about it I th- on the season, I think it would have read a little darker. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And that's a great point. It could have been like a very dark moment of like, I, if this information had somehow come up that he had made it up of like, I can't believe you do this. Like, it would be a very tough moment. But I'm glad that the, the cast sort of realized like what a big TV moment it was for what it was. I do feel terrible for though the precedent that it set because like, For example, Survivor China, right? Todd's sister Mm -hmm. tragically has a miscarriage and you have to have someone like Courtney say in the back of their head, like, could this be a Johnny Fairplay thing? Like, it does suck that while this is an absolutely immaculate TV moment, it now shifts the paradigm to make people sincerely wonder, like, the loved one's visit, which is the paragon of emotion and warmth of the season, is there a secondary agenda in mind? Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, um, we've really never seen anybody else ever take advantage of it uh, than in the rest of the show. Right, if anything, it's like the opposite. Like, Jeremy Collins doesn't say, like, Val, you're pregnant again? Like, he mm-hmm. he, uh, he, and Adam, like, obscure information about loved ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they don't want to tell people. Like, I feel like that, you know, you somebody can come out and, like, uh, like hey, good news! Like, uh, that, uh, you know, um, uh, somebody's getting married. Like, oh, let's just celebrate. Oh, I got to hear more about this. Yeah, I mean Johnny Fairplay in that for that way kind of like poisoned the well of the loved ones visit a little we bit. We got a puppy. Oh, this is incredible news. I gotta hear more. Yeah, but then, it's... yeah. As we haven't seen anybody uh go back to this well. Maybe it's it's a third rail, maybe it's too toxic. Yeah, I think I think Johnny Fairplay definitely poisoned the well in this regard of the loved ones visit, but like okay. damn was it some delicious poison. It went down well. <laughs> delicious poison. Okay. Let's uh, get back to the game Um, back at camp. uh, So Sandra and Krista, they're looking for something. And so they're feeling like that. Maybe we can get Tawana to flip. And so when they go on, when Fairplay and Burton go off to strategize. So Sandra brings Tawana over to uh, do some spying. Haley. I just love this because Sandra's right. Tawana was never going to believe what she said. Until she heard it with her own ears. And I think it was like a stroke of genius. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and Uh, ironically enough, it ends up sealing Tawana's fate, right? Because initially Tawana's on board now to get out Burton. But now because she's so upfront to them about the plan, they're like, oh, crap, we need to get rid of her. Like, she's coming for our next. We don't know if Sandra and Krista are. At least they're less dangerous. So ironically enough, I think this was completely accidental. But Sandra essentially throws Tawana under the bus uh, Mm -hmm. by showing her this information. As long as it ain't me. Yeah. Um, we get a challenge, which is the Scrabble word for a uh, word find. Uh, Haley, are you a big words with friends person? Um, I don't. I think I would if I had more people to play it with. Ethan, yeah. I do enjoy a good game of Scrabble. Yeah. Uh, this is a wacky challenge where you have to make a bunch of words, and then also then like you get disqualified if you used a plural. You get disqualified if you have a spelling error. Burton is declared the winner, and then they uh, call everybody back in. And upon further review, uh, Burton was not the winner and was disqualified. Yo, survivors, come back! This is so <laughs> odd. This yeah. is so weird. Like, I guess Jeff Probst is the the ultimate failure here for his spelling skills. Uh, and the the odder thing on top of that, right? Don't they reveal at the reunion that like this was created by a fan? Mm-hmm. Yeah. If I was that uh, young woman, I think I would have been like, oh, "No, you don't have to." Like, uh, I don't want to be associated with this. Is Jeff's this like be- cheapest challenge we ever did. Yeah. Is this better or worse than the Make a Wish kid who created the challenge where ac- Missy accidentally broke her leg and <laughs> Wendell saw her? Oh, no. hmm. oh. I 
feel like uh, this was a bad challenge. So I think it uh, speaks more poorly of the woman. But that young man uh, did design a challenge that uh, broke Missy's leg. So it's a toss up. The lesson is don't outsource your challenges, Kierhofer. Okay, just yeah. like keep it in house. You a great team. You know, it's a very talented team. You can keep it in house. And but Burton it, was like big bad about this and his uh his not his exit interview but his quarantine quarant confessional. Yeah. What do you I say? Think he, he was more mad about the next challenge where Dara was able to stick her little arm in and grab the ball even though that wasn't in the spirit of the challenge. He was like she could have got banned for that like I got in trouble for spelling liaison wrong. Like he was hmm. he was he was not the most pleased about that. Okay. Well, Salty there's, Burton. There's no I like, liaison. There's two. Burton you got you got let back into the game, so I don't think you have a leg to stand on. Also here. fair. Very fair. Yeah. Okay. All right. So ultimately, uh, we're going to see uh, the pair of uh, Johnny Fairplay. Uh, and I don't even know if Burton is involved, uh, but with uh, Sandra and Krista, uh, that basically Fairplay is scrambling. He says that uh that he swears on his uh grandma that uh he's gonna work with sandra and krista they're gonna make a new final four deal i feel like it's too soon for him to use that <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah well i think he's really gonna using it more prominently next episode maybe that's another reason why sandra was really on to him of like you're using this a lot i feel like you're not that emotionally devastated if you're using this as a bargaining chip but mm -hmm. yeah i mean this is a really interesting choice these are the two people Who's closest ally? They were the ones in charge of voting out last round. And now they're like, please help us. Uh, and Johnny Fairplay even admits this, right? Like, this is a last ditch effort. This is a Hail Mary, a roll of the dice, as he calls it. And I'm still trying to figure out why Sandra and Krista go with them at this point, especially when in a couple of rounds from now, we're going to really be getting like the girl power. Let's work together to get these two boys out messaging. Yeah, I guess uh, did did they have the votes? Uh, did they have Lil on board? I guess that that's it, a good question. Well, because if even just the four of them, right? If it was Sandra, Krista, Tawana, and Dara, which they assumed it was going to be, they would have had the four votes to get out Burton. Mm hmm. Yeah. Uh, were they worried that uh to that Tawana and Dara were going to maybe uh uh not necessarily come over with them? Yeah, I'm not sure. This could be a, a, a matter of like, well, they'll work with us today, but will they work with us tomorrow? But again, like Sandra talks so many times about how Johnny Fairplay screwed her over. Like, I'm I'm still trying to figure out, even all these years later, why she felt like she could trust him in this moment. Mm -hmm. It's a good question. It's Tawana's birthday. She didn't see it coming, Haley. Isn't there like a birthday curse? Is there a birthday curse? Um, I don't know. I don't think I don't, so. I don't know. I think, I think it was also it's the big what? brother. I feel like that might be America's Next Top Model. Oh. Mm. Okay. They're, they're very easily mixed up. Okay. All right. So Tawana is gone, and uh, we reach the final six. And so uh, Sandra, uh, she is going to start to think about uh, doing the old woman thing. Uh, going to bring in Dara, maybe Lil. Uh, that could be a good way to go. I'm well, I didn't do it last time. <laughs> I'm surprised it didn't stick, honestly. Mm hmm. Yeah. It didn't really go anywhere. It well, doesn't really go anywhere. I don't well, know. Because but... John lies, but he tells the truth. But he also Sometimes. tells the truth. Uh, yeah. And, and Sandra says John is like a girl. Real dumping on Johnny Fairplay this episode. <laughs> but mm -hmm. it's interesting, though. I mean, I could understand it, though, from Dara's perspective this time around, because Chris and Sandra just voted out Tawana, like her number one in the game, when you know, they were going, they were intending to work together. They weren't going to vote for Chris or Sandra. They were going to vote for Burton. So I can understand why Dara feels a little burnt at this moment from all the firewood Burton. she's been collecting uh, to be like, yeah, I'm not going to work with you this time around. But yeah, Sandra starts to, to plant the seed that's going to grow a little bit here of like, we can take out these two guys right now. So we have an interesting reward challenge. It's three versus three, but it turned into where you had to then like race in a certain spot in the like relay race based on what you picked out. So even though Burton is paired with uh, Sandra and Krista, that uh, Sandra has to swim the most and Burton has to swim the least on their team, leading to fair play, Dara and Lil winning reward. They just chose whoever they're like, Whatever chip Sandra pulled, they're like, that, that's who go first. That's who's going first. Uh, oh, yeah. Mm. That one with the dent. That's the first one. Sandra, you have to go first right now. 
And you can tell, like, Johnny Fairplay is just so gleeful, right? Because it goes back to that argument of, like, uh, what day? What day? I'm a better swimmer than you. He's like, once and for all, we can finally prove this argument. Johnny Fairplay and Dara and Lil go off on the reward, and things are going, like, pretty well at first. Uh, Johnny Fairplay is uh, ordering dinner, and Lil's like, oh, I like a man who can order for the table. That's I'm shocked Lil charge. doesn't get her steak meat or well done. She seems mm. like a well-done gal. Yeah. Um, she, she says both in, like in this one, like, oh, I like a man who can take charge. And then, and then like, uh, by dessert, she's like, I don't like him telling me what to do. <laughs> yeah, this is Lil. This is a little in a nutshell, <laughs> right? She's like, uh, what do you want to wear? Like, well, I guess I'll go for the pink dress. Why did I do this? I look like a strawberry tart. Oh, <laughs> why'd you do this? Lil? Like she is so incredibly complex because she makes these decisions and then like immediately has a heel turn just based on whatever emotion dictates the next response. Haley, dinner was going so well. And then Johnny Fairplay said she's like sitting around the camp and doing something. She's like, that's it. You you hurt my feelings. Yeah, Johnny like, Fairplay throws a strong armor. I, I feel like Lil did what I do when I have a little too much sipping tequila, which mm -hmm. is like start crying over nothing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Of like the uh, trying to start uh, a brouhaha when there isn't one, right? Yeah. She felt, then she like, felt like Johnny Fairplay. Like I'm done with this. I'm going to bed, and it was just like, yeah. Haley, Ooh. I just asked you if you could well, put that in the dishwasher. He also treats her like a child when he's yeah. like, "Lil, Lil, sit down, sit down. You're that. If you get up from this table, but then she does this." You can't show me what to do. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, listen, we'll find out in these next couple episodes. Uh, Johnny Fairplay has quite the opposite of a high opinion about any of these people left in the game besides Burton, right? Yes, like specifically the women, yeah. They're basically animals at this point. They're basically pets in a kennel that he's so, just, like, leading to euthanasia. All these women are so stupid because they're women. That's basically quote for quote what Johnny Fairplay said. He, so, yeah, what annoyed me, he's like... He said multiple times, like, like I've said before, I break promises like that women break figure furniture. It's like he went to that well a few times, and it was kind of like, mm -hmm. Yeah, when mm -hmm. you literally have to repeat your line in confessional, like, doing material, if you're trying to do the is this thing on in confessional, He's got a type you know, five, you know, like, that like, Johnny it's a... Fair Play always says in every confessional. <laughs> And also, the, it also makes me wonder the way you were talking about Lil pouting. Like, I wonder how she would be as a real housewife, because that seems like a real housewives esque meltdown. Real housewives of Cincinnati. <laughs> <laughs> what what city is she from? Yeah, she's from Cleveland? like Cincinnati. Yeah, Cleveland's Cincinnati. real housewife. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. Sorry about she's that. She's a city baby. My bad. Here, my bad. Here, my here's bad. my oath. I'm that bitch. <laughs> She talks about how, like, uh, she doesn't want to be the B word uh, earlier in the season. Yeah, but I think, like, she eventually comes out at the end being like, I, I try to not be, but, like, I, I had to be at the end to sort of, like, cut everybody. And, and this is, I think, again, another tough moment for her, right? And this it's also a tough moment for Burton back at camp because, like, now you have Chris and Sandra being like, okay, are we still doing this Drake Final Four thing? And Burton's like, oh, uh, I don't know. To, uh, mm -hmm. after later and they're like uh okay we definitely made a mistake not getting rid of him last time mm -hmm. yeah because now basically new final four is you know we have uh basically like these uh voting blocks uh that it's fair play and burton and lil and dara with uh sandra and krista on the outs but lil you know uh she may be going through a life change Haley. happens to the best of us yeah she may she may have some things going on and I can't sleep. And, and she talks to Burton and she asks about the final two. And uh, Burton cannot give her a straight answer. Burton, just say anything. Mm -hmm. And this is this is weird. I wonder if it's the, again, it's like this line that Burton drew himself of like, I am not going to to lie. And I guess if you omit the truth, that's not lying. Right. Like I can't if I don't promise them the moon then we're not going to get there of uh, essentially saying like, well, well, it'd be great, but I can't promise it. And that's something you never want to hear in the game of Survivor. Mm hmm. You can't do it. Can't lie to Lil. Um, so Lil has her doubts. Uh, we have our musket challenge. And uh, Dara, it, it, is it Dara or Burton wins immunity here? 
Dara wins. This is, this is uh, so Dara, Dara started off her, her yeah, she started her off run. her streak of three last time, and now she's in the middle of it. Okay, here we go. Uh, Dara wins immunity. Uh, so unfortunately for Krista, uh, this is going to be the end of the run here for the great Krista Hasty, Mike. Yeah, and she's going to try to fight a little bit, right? Like essentially, Burton and, and Fairplay try to like essentially get her on tape right to be like uh yeah i'll throw sandra under the bus like i'll vote her out if we need to and mm -hmm. then they go to like sandra you won't believe it krista said she'd get rid of you it's very much like um what tony does with hey, the hey that's entrapping <laughs> yeah hey you don't have that this is was this watergate <laughs> <laughs> uh i i think that you know it's it's really unfortunate for krista because it's like the duality of them essentially tricking Lil, because we never hear her say that she's going for Lil, but they claim to Lil like, oh, Chris is gunning for you. On top of Sandra, honestly, like cutting bait at this point, being like, it's it's nice to be with you, Krista, but it's even nicer to have you on the jury. And like, I don't care. I'm fine if I'm without you at this point. Mm -hmm. That unfortunately, it's just like a real uphill battle for Krista. And she goes out with at least seven too many buns in her hair. Uh, mm -hmm. She looks like a bakery the way she walks out of tribal council. She's got a baker's dozen. <laughs> baker's dozen. All right. So uh, let's talk about episode number 12 of Survivor Pearl Islands. And it, it's another banger. Great episode at the final five. Okay. So uh, Sandra is uh, really worried. Uh, she feels like that uh, she is going to be next. So Haley, uh, Sandra's going to sabotage the camp. Great, love it. <laughs> mm -hmm. She's like, I don't care. I'll go all out here. Hide the knife, hide the machete, hide the pot, hide the mm -hmm. fish again. Have a great yeah. time. And Johnny Fairplay and Burton are uh, thinking about getting rid of Dara because she's won too many challenges. And they talked to Lil about it. And, and Lil is also upset, Mike. She goes, Well, if they can screw her over, then they'll screw me over too. I was like, Yeah. <laughs> First they came for Rhino and I said nothing. <laughs> and they came for Tawana and I said nothing. And then they came for Dara. Yeah. And then they told me they'd get back to me. <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So uh so this is again, this is gonna be it's a like you said, Rob, a really fun episode, but this is really like Lil's big move is this episode where Sandra I think gets a lot of deserved credit behind this, but Lil is the one to really make the flip. Okay. So uh, we get our second chances immunity challenge. You have to do all the stuff that we've done uh, before. Burton wins immunity and he gets to take uh, somebody with him to go enjoy the car, go to the ruins. And Mike, uh, this is a classic survivor mistake. This is one of the worst reward picks I have ever seen. It is when it is so blatantly obvious to the people that are going, this was not a good decision. It is not a good decision. Yes, you might underestimate the other three people back at camp, but when there are five people left and you are a tight two and you decide to segregate yourself from everyone else for an entire day, you got to expect shenanigans are going to ensue. Burton, what are you doing, man? He just didn't want to eat hot dogs with anyone else. They're the two best friends that there could ever be. And then they deserve to hang out with each other, Mike. And Come they're on. GMC Envoy SUV. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I love the way that Jeff introduced that, too, because, like, the car reward was not part of it, right? Like, they pull up off the boat, and Jeff's like, uh, hey, let's catch a ride, unless you're digging that one over there. Uh, and I do wonder if, for a second, they're like, does Jeff Probst want us to steal a car right now? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, it's a pirate season. Yeah, it's out of, like, Fast and the Furious. Mm-hmm. Yeah. P pirate uh, steal cars. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. So... All right, back at camp, the women are talking. Sandra says the guys are snakes. And Lil, you've got better chances with the women. Think yeah, about so it. This is a weird narrative that we get in this and the last episode about Lil's jury chances in particular. We get this, and it's interesting because it's actually coming right off of your season, Rob, where we get this other weird edit, right, of like, Mateo is going to conquer anybody in the finals, and then he gets absolutely slaughtered. Same thing happens to Lil here, where there's so much talk about how no one's going to take you to the final two. Well, You're too nice. 
Yeah, if I could push back on that, I did anybody in the episodes ever say Mateo is going to win in the final two? I, I think that might be like a day when he gave everybody the uh, family visit, but I feel like maybe the people at home thought that Mateo was going to win in the final two. I don't think that anybody in the Amazon thought Mateo was going to be somebody who's going to win a lot of jury votes. I trust you on that. You've watched the season more recently than me. Yeah, I think it's more of an He also edit. lived it. Mm. That's true. He also lived it. <laughs> so I think yeah. You are the... You have seen that season more recently, yeah. I mean, it's like look, no, it was like there literally are many a part things I trust time. Mike Bloom with a lot more than I trust. <laughs> no, my I'm, I'm no. Do not trust me when it comes to Survivor of the Amazon over Rob Cesarino, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I do think it's interesting that we get so much focus on Lil as a jury threat when the ultimate result is she gets absolutely creamed in the final vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think the things that they think are going to work actually end up backfiring uh, very badly where that her like, oh, she's going to cry and everybody's going to vote for her. This is what she always does. Yeah. And she also has this thing, though, right, where she's like, oh, I don't want to get third either way. And they're like, you're you could win that final challenge. You have a hell of a lot of better time beating the two of us than Johnny Fairplay and Burton, which ends up partially true. She sort of takes the weaker person from each pair uh, and ends up beating them both at the end of the day. Mm hmm. OK. All right. So um, meanwhile, Johnny Fairplay and uh, Burton just uh, l laughing it up, Haley. It's going to be so easy once they get back. They're going to spin those women around uh, just like that. Because women be dumb. <laughs> <laughs> it was too perfect. Three ladies with one brain cell. <laughs> I challenged Mike from that one season of Drag Race. We are three women with oh, that. one brain. Is when they speak at the same time? Yeah, that's what essentially <laughs> what they think is they're just like, uh, I, I don't know. It, it really is. I could tell at this point that Johnny Fairplay is really building this up, right? Mm. Stupid. Like, they, especially mm. as, women, as, they're not going to figure out that they should come up with a plan. And even if they do, then we'll know. And then they go mm. back to camp and they're like, this is fishy, but women are still <laughs> stupid. <laughs> On the one hand, I think something might happen. On the other hand, women. So I think I'm okay. Am I right, <laughs> am I right or am I right? Put All that right, so professional and say it again. <laughs> Uh, Burton goes and talks to Lil, and uh, she is not giving uh, Burton a convincing answer. She tries, though, and that's mm -hmm. that's the important part is that she tries. Mm -hmm. All right, yeah. so we get the great scene, Mike. Uh, Johnny Fairplay goes to talk to Sandra. Yeah, because he thinks he's again sniffing stuff out, and he's like, Look, just as a cautionary thing, in case Lil jumps over, I need another ace in my pocket. And this is going to be Sandra. And this is actually the, the MO of Johnny Fairplay several times is he'll betray Sandra and come back and be like, please, 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 please. I'm begging you. Okay, I'll do anything. I'll vote with you this time. We're totally cool. And then stab her in the back and then rinse and repeat. And so mm -hmm. he does that here. He approaches and be like, okay, we're, we're going to the final three, no matter what. You, me, and Burton, I swear on my grandmother, I want you to swear on my kids. Show me your hands, Sandra. Show me your hands to make sure you're not mm -hmm. crossing your fingers. And Sandra's like, what BS? What was this guy doing during the trip that he's coming back with this frazzled attitude? But she swears on her kids that she'll screw you and Burton. Oh, and she did. She didn't yeah. break that swear. I love it. Yeah. It's, it's so great. Like, this is probably sandra's quote-unquote biggest move of survivor pearl islands and it comes at at just the right time and she's able to still completely snow johnny fairplay and burn if lil was not able to do a good job of deception sandra is and maybe that's a microcosm as to why sandra wins and lil doesn't mm -hmm. among other things many <laughs> yeah all right uh this is where dara is gonna win immunity and uh if burton had it his way Haley, uh she would not have uh gotten that chance that she would have got a penalty for she would have using she would skinny have, arms she should have poured all that water in there and then johnny fairplay should have gotten eliminated and everyone should have mm -hmm. okay uh so dara has gone three in a row good for dara all right um johnny fairplay talks to Lil and uh, Burton comes in and they're basically uh, working uh, two on one. Uh, but, you know, uh, Lil is not going to do something she doesn't want to do, Haley. No, she's not. She's going to stand her ground. That's one of her badges is standing her ground. You guys are bullying me. I don't want to be tag teamed. I know you're a wrestling fan, <laughs> but this is ridiculous. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, and then like they go like, all right, fine, that's it. Uh, let's go talk to Daryl. Let's go talk to Sandra. And Dana and Sandra do a great job. They keep up the front, right? They're like, there's no women's alliance. We didn't do anything. Sandra just moped all day in the shelter. Like she's ready to go home. Everything's okay. Uh, so they go in. I think there's a little bit of a suspicion. I don't think it's like a complete Brent Champagne esque blindside here. Oh no! But I think they feel fairly comfortable about where because mm -hmm. they say, "Look, if Lil doesn't vote with us, Sandra will." Spoiler alert: Neither one of them do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Burton gets voted out for the second time in this game. Yeah, he's Boom. the first, first person to be voted out twice. It's a it's a big thing. Uh, and I will say, I'll say again that I think despite the mistakes he made, I think Burton was actually like a pretty competent player, uh, especially coming back in. He had a really good reputation. I think he was right alongside Johnny Fairplay in making mm -hmm. a lot of those moves. I think if he goes to the end with John, I think despite the outcast thing, I think he cleans up pretty well just because of like the reputation he has. He actually, he's very purposeful for it, right? He vocalizes before I'm the good cop. Johnny Fairplay is the bad cop. And let's see how it works out. I think it's a very cogent strategy. I just think, a lot of boneheaded decisions like not shoring things up with Lil and taking Johnny Fairplay on the reward are just like small little chips in the statue that leads to it collapsing. Haley, if Burton goes to the final two with Johnny Fairplay, who wins? I gotta think it's Burton because like, yeah, I feel like he definitely gets Lil regardless. He's like uh, the Steven to Burton's JT. Yeah. Uh Oh, don't tell Savage that. Mm, you really not like him. Yeah, like I mean, it's only four. He only needs four votes, and I feel like, like he's getting the coolest guy ever. Yeah, like yeah. I think he de he definitely gets. I think he gets. I think he gets Rupert, Krista, and Sandra, and yeah. then probably Lil, probably Tijuana. You think and Dara. Rupert votes for fair play. No, 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 no. Rupert, for Rupert. Rupert votes oh, Burton. Oh, 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 Burton. Yeah, yeah. There, Burton. there's no way we see this at the reunion, right? With like the mock final tribal council, like Rupert. And the the Rupert Coalition would not want it to vote for fair play in any iteration in a final tribal yeah. council. I feel like that Rhino would vote for Burton. Really? I thought he would have voted for fair play, but maybe he would have voted for Burton. Do so, you think do you think he gets do you think Burton gets a clean sweep here? That'd be wild if Burton becomes uh, a person voted out once and then also becomes the first unanimous winner in Survivor history. I mean, Chris Underwood uh played 13 days and uh, like doubled up Gavin. Yeah, Burton would. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Let's get to the finale of Survivor Pearl Island. Uh, we have uh, sort of a little bit of a sleepy uh, final four vote. Uh, we get our final four breakfast. I think this is the first time we uh, get a uh, breakfast for finalists. I think the first and only time. Uh, delivered by Jeff Probst. And he's just sort of like, yeah, we kind of felt bad for you guys. So, like, here's some mimosas, right? It's like, it's not even a big spread. Uh, maybe yeah. because they had that wonderful breakfast before, but like he really just comes with a couple of things. I do like that Lil here starts to in the finale talk about like, oh, I wonder if he would be a, a good candidate for the scouts. And she maybe. even asks him. <laughs> yeah. Jeff's like, uh, I don't know. Do you think she's tried that on a lot of people throughout the season? Ask them to join the, the, the Cub Scouts. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Like, uh, Hey Bradley, I don't know if you know to, to Dara, but you know the Scouts. Could you join my troop? <laughs> oh, I think talking about Bradley Kleige. I didn't uh, know who we were talking about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, how about no? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, all right. Uh, people are talking about uh, what are they going to do now? Uh, should they get rid of Johnny Fairplay? Haley, uh, this actually is an impressive round for Johnny Fairplay because somehow he survives uh, being uh, the next person to go here in after Burton gets sorted out at the final five. And so I wonder if it's one of those things where um, Dara doesn't have protection. Nobody does. Um, and they're just like, Dara's won three in a row. She has a solid vote in Rhino. She has a solid vote in... Um, Tuana, Tuana, and then yeah. I, f I feel like fair play goes. It doesn't matter if if Dara's up against uh, Lil or Sandra. I think mm -hmm. fair play's going there. Mm -hmm. I understand why they're like, you know what? Let's get Dara out here. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. she of the of the final four, she has ticked everyone off on the jury the least by far, and that is something that juries might value sometimes, right? Of like you either betrayed us or just like got on our nerves. Dara was someone who just like sat quietly in the back, tended to her firewood and won a bunch of challenges. 
and that's impressive. So while it might seem odd on the surface, I don't think this is on the level of like voting out Lydia instead of Danny at the final four of Survivor Guatemala. It's I, mm -hmm. I don't think it's that much of a no brainer. We should also yeah. mention uh, everyone gets letters, and Lil. Uh, pours tears over her letter that uh, real timely uses a nice quote from Pete Rose from her son. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, what was that Pete Rose uh, quote? Oh, God, I don't remember. It was something like, uh, you know, like uh, those who, you know, uh, some experience victory, some experience defeat, and I want you to experience defeat or something. But it's just like mm -hmm. so awkward in retrospect. It's like, oh, Charlie my Hustle. Oh, my daughter quoted my favorite running He's back. A Cincinnati legend. Exactly. But it would be like, I don't know if, if I got a letter from like, oh, you quoted my favorite running back, OJ Simpson. Oh, I feel <laughs> so at home right now with my letter. Thank you, my wife. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's quite on the same page. OJ ah, Simpson and Pete Rose. In the same book. Maybe not same page. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. If he did it, Rob. If he did it. If, 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 if that was the case. Okay. Um, we get an interesting challenge here. We're going to get a quiz, Haley, uh, but the contestants are playing against the jury. This is BS to me. I will say mm -hmm. that. I think yeah. I think if they elected one person to play, I I could have justified it a little bit, but just getting the whole jury against each player, I don't know about that one, guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it almost seems like this is their attempt at a post-merge outcast thing, right? I'm like, well, we already did your past comes back to haunt you once. Let's see if maybe they'll beat you again in a quiz. I guess what helps it is, I agree with Haley, it, it's pretty BS, but it at least doesn't screw a player. Like, if they weren't a part of it, Johnny Fairplay would have won because he was one ahead of everybody else. So, like, he would have been saved. Daryl would have still been gone. This is yeah. not like a, a Lex and Big Tom situation in Africa. Mm hmm. All right. Um, ultimately, Dara gets voted out here uh, three to one. A anything else to say about Dara? No, no. I saw her at the Survivor Second Chances uh, finale. I was sitting in the oh. audience next to Andrew Savage's loved ones and Dara was uh, there with the Savages. Yeah, yeah, you know what? In all of the Morgan's qu quarantine questionnaires, they are like Savage, Tijuana, um, Dara, OT, uh, OT, and Rhino are all like still pretty tight. Like they've all gone to each other's weddings and just mm -hmm. had a nice time. Yeah. And I think it really just shows again, like that particular experience. I guess they had just really, really bonded them together. But Dara, I mean, yeah, I think she was the most under the radar presence. Uh, I think she was very fun and like a very dry way with some of the stuff that she was doing but like a rather big uh non-entity as it were one of those like brett clouds are like surprisingly close to winning but we don't really see much of them types but she served her place in the season but we have in my opinion i'm glad she cleared the way for the much 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 more exciting final three I do mm -hmm. think it was rude, however, for Jeff to be like, so Dara doing anything with that modeling career yet? And she's like, no, I'm still working on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was that was a little sad. Also, the, I guess her biggest legacy is in uh, Survivor All-Stars, right? During the trivia quiz isn't the question like, who was the mortician? And they keep showing the umpteenth shot of her showering. They show it like so many times uh, during the season. That was her like one enduring uh, like uh, NFT of Dara. <laughs> the NFT of Dara Johnson. Because <laughs> very low price for that. <laughs> How many, how many Belbala for the Dara NFT? <laughs> I'll sell my clothes for it. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, we haven't talked about this. That this is the only season that has C mail. Uh, Haley, would he like C mail? I didn't know where you're going with that for a second. Um, yeah, sure. Not I bad. Mean, it's it not the, the only paddle, season that's more. on a beach. Uh, I don't know why this is the only They're just season. living it's, their lives, Rob. Yeah. Just let them You don't get a fun. letter like on the pirate ship. I don't know why this is sea mail and then every Fiji season is tree mail. Yeah, it is weird. Okay. And also, like, I feel like tree mail has often not been in a tree as of late. So it's like it's no longer tree mail. It's more ground mail like than well tree mail. mail. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. So I guess I guess it might be the closest in proximity to the ocean. Like, it seemed like it was literally right on the coastline. 
Okay. So maybe that's why. I think it's another like cute, hey, this season's a little bit different. It's a pirate theme, so it's sea male instead of tree male. Okay. All right. Uh, we do our rites of passage. Uh, a- a- anything uh, of note here in rites of passage? They burned a freaking shipwreck down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We fast forward through this. Not going to lie to you. <laughs> I mean, it should I mean, be it's the fifth like they season. always have to burn something. That's what they do. I don't, I don't know, man. I think we're in the situation we are in terms of climate change in part because of all the things we burned on Survivor. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I To Haley's point, though, I do believe this is one of the only rites of passage where the previous players do not speak. Usually, mm-hmm. right, we get like the, the montage of them while they're giving some of their final words. We don't get that this time around. Instead, we just have people speaking about them. Of course, Johnny Fairplay is going to talk about your wife, Rob, and say, uh, rock and body. <laughs> <laughs> How dare it. How dare he? Okay. So uh, let's get to our final three challenge. And uh, we're going to have our final three of Sandra and Fairplay and Lil. They're going to uh, get into the position uh, on all fours. And uh, they're going to have to balance and not let their butt touch uh, the floating crate in the ocean. Okay. Okay. My knees ache the entire time watching this. That's because you don't do aerobics, Haley. How dare you judge me? Uh, Maybe this. You see this? Yeah. Th- this, to be candid, is one of my favorite final immunity challenges of all time. Yes. Okay. Uh, it's why? Well, maybe not from like a structure perspective, even though I like that it's, you know, deceptively simple. I really like all those old school challenges, right? I know it's a sore spot for you, Rob, like this idea of this is where you put in the like stand in one place and like hold out your power as long as I would have much rather have done this. I'm sure Johnny Fairplay (laughs) would have rather stood in one place and held the headdress, you know, grass Mm -hmm. is always greener, Mm -hmm. but God, the narrative here and the characterization is incredible. There was a Reddit post about this the other day that it just really sums it up so well. Like how everyone is a reversal of who they were up to this point where like, Johnny Fairplay, the overly cocky, domineering villain, is now begging and pleading with Lil to make a deal and getting shut down. Lil, who's been personified as this kind of like meek, emotionally volatile, manipulative, manipulatable person, is now taking charge and being like, no deal, John. Screw the banker. And Sandra, who like runs her mouth all the time, is silent this entire challenge. Like, I just... From a narrative perspective, it's an incredible downfall for a character like Johnny Fairplay, the person that he has dragged along thinking that he has essentially groomed this dog to be his attack dog and lead him to the final two. He gets attacked by at the very end and ends up being his demise. Like, again, I'll say you could not write this better. Haley, uh, did you like the back and forth between Johnny Fairplay and Lil here? I did. I did. I like that she like put him in his place and you know, she was being sassy. Her version of sassy was a mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, I, my, my knees are great. My ankles are great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's like talking to her about a d- making a deal. She's like, I do a robot. So like, like, he was not talking about it. He was like, he's like, he's like uh, well, okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> like, you, yeah. Okay. Do you not understand how deals work, Lil? <laughs> just like she doesn't want to take a deal. Yeah. I just, I, I love the exchange. Jeff says, I think Lil just said game on. And Fair Play's like, I think Lil just said game over. And mm-hmm. it's so, de- so much defeat in his voice that he's got to know it's over for him in that moment. Yeah. How about Lil singing Amazing Grace also? It's a moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, it's weird. It's, it's very Lil, right? Like mm-hmm. of like, uh, yeah, I'm going to hum myself a little hymn as I decide, uh, you know, make a million dollar decision. But yeah, I mean, after this epic blow up by Lil, I don't think anyone expected her to win this final challenge either. No. And, I, and then that's why there's another great foreshadowing moment in the episode before, right? Where they say like, Lil, you're not guaranteed third. You can win the final challenge. And she does. Uh, even though there's a bit of bandying back and forth, like, Everyone knows what's going to happen here. Uh, In this case, Lil thought she was losing either way. And so she said, you know what? I would rather the money go to a young mother like Sandra than a young whippersnapper like John, who's always out getting some honey, smoking something, drinking something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, And the mom connection ends up uh, coming up huge here, Haley. Yeah, I I think I, 
I agree with her reasoning. I could see it's it's basically Lil casting her own vote. Also, if you can believe it, Johnny Fairplay and Sandra are the exact same age coming into the season. That is wild to me. Wow. <laughs> the same age that I currently am. And now I may go. Wow, you are mm-hmm. three peas in a pod right now. Yeah, uh, me and Sandra and Johnny Fairplay. Mm-hmm. It's interesting. I, I think I'd assume that Johnny Fairplay was younger than he was when he played. Yeah, I would I would have guessed he's like 25 and I would have guessed and, Sandra's like 35. But Sandra didn't age. Like, but yeah, I would have said she's yeah. 35 in the Pearl Islands and Heroes versus Villains. Yeah, I mean that she's she actually is older than you think she is. And then uh, Johnny Fairplay, uh, do I have that right? Uh, she's she's actually younger. younger. She's younger than you think she is. And Johnny Fairplay is older than you think he is. So, yeah. All right. Well, Lil wins. Uh, she's going to take uh, Sandra to the final two. Johnny Fairplay is done. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's he a was going to huge... party. He wanted to do carousing. <laughs> Not, Not the carousing. That life. That's why I draw the line at carousing. But, I mean, it's a huge downfall. It's one of the biggest late game downfalls for a villain in Survivor history, in my opinion. Especially how much he built himself up to go down the way that he did is frankly a little humiliating, but so satisfying for his character. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Let's get to the f- final two. Final tribal council. Sandra versus Lil. Um, I feel like this is not a super eventful final tribal council. No, I, I think Lil could have owned up to her game a little bit more. Um, I think one of the biggest points in Lil's favor when, was when Sandra said, like, Everyone's on the jury because of Lil. And I, I I wish Lil had leaned into that a little bit more. Yeah. I wish she would have been like, I have You're my hand on was room. on everyone's eviction here. But I think the tough t- part was that she wouldn't stand in her own light with it. Like she was yeah. always cowering after instead of just being like, I had to do what I had to do. And I, I think people were a little but um, aren't you a Boy Scout leader, Lil? Yeah, like, I just don't think that was super fair. Um, Those boys. Well, I mean, to that point, Savage... Leader. leader. Exactly. So, well, Savage brings this up at the reunion, right? And this is still a topic that's been bandied about, about, like, how much of you is in you the survivor player, right? This is a very different pressurized circumstance from where you usually exist. But does the natural deprivation bring that out of you? And Savage makes this point in the reunion of, like, Yes, she is not the Boy Scout master. She would have left the uniform at home, but like she is Lil and Lil is a Boy Scout master. So mm-hmm. it almost is like cyclical logic in that regard. I will say, I think it was a good final tribal council from mm-hmm. Sandra. Outside of that comment, Haley, that you brought up, I that was that could have, like you said, really gone the other way of essentially Sandra being like, uh, you really have to read the room well when you make that argument of you should be pissed about Lil because she put all of you on there rather than you should commend Lil because she put all of you on there. But I think Sandra had good answers for everything uh, because her her game sort of existed in being true to herself. And I think she could easily make the argument that Lil was not due to all the things that she represented. Let me ask, Gabon, I think, takes the cake in this category, but is Pearl Islands one of the most unlikely final twos in Survivor history? I mean... Considering oh, that uh, one of the women got voted out on day nine, uh, I mean, pretty unlikely. Definitely. I would say it's up there, if not the most up there. Yeah, I think this is a cast where if you look at them, and I think Krista says this uh, in her final words, where like, uh, Sandra would probably be the first person voted out of Drake, and Lil would be the first person voted out of Morgan. And like, here we are, the two people that could have very easily been part of the outcast, and one of them was, are now sitting mm-hmm. in the final two. And that's really fun as well. That's the hallmark, in my opinion, of like a really fun post-merge is that you look at the group even in episode eight and you're like, I would not have seen these two as the final two right now. And Lil's the oldest person on the season by almost 10 years. Oh, wow. The next not the years, it's the mileage. (laughs) The next closest is like Lil's 51 and the next closest is Trish at 42. Yeah, so I, I, I wonder how much she was able to connect with people from that perspective, you know, right? Like, I'm sure she certainly saw stuff in some of the younger people, but I wonder if she feels like she's been in such a different life path than a lot of these people up to this point that, like, she just couldn't 
connect with them in a way that maybe people like Sandra or even a Johnny Fairplay would. Is Lil's son in the Scouts? Like, uh, mm. is, is, does she have like a like? I would imagine, like, if I was like a T-ball coach, I think that implies like my son is in T-ball. Like, I wouldn't just be like a like a guy who coaches like the like the the local T-ball team. Or is or is that nepotism? Does he have to join another troop if he becomes part of the Scouts? I think you have a parent who's leading a uh, scout. I, I, I don't know how, I, you know, let's not even get into this. I don't even know how, I have no idea how this works. And I don't want to be getting dragged for her. Rob, you idiot. You Do you even know? Do you even scout, bro? No. <laughs> no. So my parents did not get me involved. Uh, do I look like I've been outside? No. All right. Um, I thought that the most interesting thing in the final tribal council is uh, the back and forth with uh, Rupert and Sandra, where Rupert wants to know, did you know <laughs> who the hell voted for me? It's like, of course, Rupert's question was like all about him. <laughs> but what about me? Who do you think should have been in that seat? Is yeah, there I mean, anyone else? Is there <laughs> anyone else? <laughs> yeah, he, he pretty much like implied that question, right? Where the question is like, please compliment me. And Sandra's like, okay, I know my job. Uh, you know, hell, Rupert, you should. I was, I was cursing, I was hollering, I was mad. I definitely did not spill fish. I was really angry about you going. <laughs> He's like, "That's my girl. You get my vote." In mm-hmm. in two different seasons. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, let's get to our live reunion. Uh, Haley, what'd you think of Jeff's shirt? It was awful. Mm. <laughs> it was like noticeably awful. Like I can see it in my brain. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I saw Adam Klein try to pry it off of him to use as an idol. He -hmm. had to, like, maybe had a bowling match he had beforehand? (laughs) (laughs) Survivor bowling won't be invented for many years. I also also believe that they cut this out on the Paramount Plus version, but I do believe in the original version, uh, Jeff pulls another, yo, Survivor's comeback thing, where he accidentally says that Sandra was voted out and Lil won the game. Huh? This might be another action figure moment, but I'm fairly sure that when Jeff Probst gives his little spiel to the audience, right, of like, well, she did it. The lippiest mother in Survivor history. He accidentally says Lil instead of Sandra as uh, not when declaring the winner, but like giving the, the postmortem to the audience, the Jerry Springer moment. Oh, OK. Uh, that Johnny Fairplay's grandma was watching. Exactly. Uh, she was well. She was watching it right there, right then. So yeah, I suppose so. That that's the moment I remember that they they cut out. They do something weird on Paramount Plus, uh, where they did oh, they like do a lot of things weird on Paramount Plus. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but in this one they were like they cut because again R- he gives this spiel right, being like we're gonna talk about Rupert, the biggest hero in the game, and Johnny Fairplay, the biggest villain, and they intersplice it with like montage footage, and it's it's incredibly odd why they chose to re-edit that way. So yeah, this was one of the most glaring uh chops i've seen on paramount plus in quite some time Haley, what'd you think of this reunion from survivor pearl islands um it wasn't that bad i feel like they did try and talk to everyone um maybe not everyone in a respectful manner like i feel like three of the women all they got talked to about was like who on the cast are you boning <laughs> Like keeping your pantaloons, Jeffrey. <laughs> All right, everybody. We had a hard fought battle of piracy, but of course, everyone wants to know who's bumping ugly is among these <laughs> 16 strangers. Michael Rattles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we checked in with Rupert. Uh, we checked in with Johnny Fairplay. Uh, uh, Johnny Fairplay makes. Yes. John, well, Johnny Fairplay, uh, you could see the fire and fury behind Jeff Probst's eyes as soon as Johnny Fairplay makes the joke, maybe in All Stars, my grandpa will die. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that- and Jeff is like, doesn't know how to address that in any way. He's just like, like, he just moves on. Also, like, why are they wearing the same outfits from the island? Just clean versions. Well, I think, oh. I think Sandra changed into a pink outfit. Well, right? hers was more pink, but it is in the same like family of the previous outfit. But Lil, mm-hmm. despite all the qualms she had in that final tribal they council, all, no, 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 they all wore the same outfit. Oh, really? Aaron's dress was what it looked like pre-cut. Johnny Fairplay was still wearing the polo. Obviously, Rupert was wearing the dye-dye shirt, but. But Austin was wearing that blue shirt. We didn't see much of the blue shirt because he sold it, but he mm-hmm. was wearing a blue shirt. Um, 
whatchamacallit, Krista was wearing a floral dress. I, the halter top, Michelle was wearing that halter top again. It was all the same. And for what reason, I asked? What Could this be? And they were stranded with the clothes on their backs. You also have to wear this to the reunion. Was that in but the they, contract? Did they like rebuy the whole outfit for them? They're like, Dara, we know you cut your dress up, girlfriend. We're going to rebuy it for you. And you're going to wear it again. Maybe that was like, we owe you an outfit. Mm. Maybe. Like, uh, well, you know that Armani so. suit? Buy it back. Wow. Can us. you imagine? If I was Dara, I'd be like, shoot, I just bought this dress for $20 at Forever 21. Like, and this mm. guy's getting his $1,700 suit. I, I mm -hmm. do believe that in one of those quarantine questionnaires, someone does say that they like never got their personal effects back that they, that production <laughs> took. Jeff stole their passports. Yeah, yeah. Well, not the passports, but I think like a lot of the clothes that they had, like I, I think some of it got lost in transit. Mm -hmm. I'd be upset. Well, I would not okay. be surprised if they housed all of Austin's alcohol. <laughs> yeah. That, that, he didn't get that back. Um, all right. W anything else? Uh, Survivor Pearl Islands. I feel great about it. Yeah. Okay. What's not to love? Again, I'll, I'll go back to what I said before. I think this is a great microcosm of like everything reality TV is. It's bombastic characters. It's comedy. It's sort of like cheesy but epic challenges. It's knockdown, drag out fights. It's big strategy. It's big villainous moves. And it's unfair twists as well. And it's like things that don't work out. So I think actually... It's not the perfect season, but it's the season I always have the most fun watching and talking about because I think it encapsulates so much about what has made me fall in love with this genre and want to talk about it for years and hours and hours and hours. Okay. And for that, we owe this season everything. <laughs> or maybe to some people, it's like, damn this season for, 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 for making that happen. It's like, I hate this season even more now. Okay. Yeah. I broke my beard for this oh, season. Oh, no. I... Bro, who broke my beard? <laughs> you killed my okay. beard. All right, <laughs> let's uh, let's just do a couple of questions, okay? Uh, I'm trying to keep this uh, podcast uh, a, a little a little succinct tonight. All right, I mean, as I say, as we are into hour number uh, uh, oh, past the four hour mark of this podcast. All right, uh, Luke Owens wants to know how would Lil fare in Winners at War? <laughs> oh, honey. Honey Bear wouldn't have been asked. You know what? I was thinking about it when I was walking around the neighborhood listening to Survivor China podcast. Yes. They should have just had all the calls and brought everyone who said yes. Wait, say it again, Haley. Say it again. You cut out. They should have called every winner and brought everyone to the island who said yes. 37 okay. person season. Mm hmm. And just see what happens. Yeah. Then we would hmm. have had any of these questions. It would have How long been... does the season go? I don't know. I'm not hmm. on. I, li I like this idea. They're building the plane as they fly. Of like, oh, all right, today, <laughs> uh, two people will go home. Ever, I think. I think there's no point. There's just you're playing two individual games. They everyone goes to tribal council every time. They just play for individual immunity within those little tribes. Okay. <laughs> to answer um... the question, uh, for Lil on Winners at War, woof. Uh, just imagining her interacting with Boston Rob would yeah. be an experience in and of itself. She also would have been 68. <sighs> yeah, what's wrong with that? Nothing, but just she would have been 68. Yeah. Um, I, I just imagine like, you know, years young. But imagine Tony being like, oh my God, Lil, you got, we, we got we to gotta figure this out. Like, oh, I don't know, Anthony. <laughs> Anthony. I don't. I don't think that ladder is going to be safe. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. Um, Christian E was there. How would Sandra have done on Winners at War as a one-time winner? So are we are we saying that if she only won Pearl Island, let's and say got she cut only back, won Pearl Islands, didn't come back for Heroes versus Villains? See, that's a big if though, because then that implies she doesn't come back for game changers doesn't mm -hmm. come back for Island of the idols mm -hmm. and if that's the case i think then she's very much caught up in this old school you know shutdown i mean she ends up being so but i think that game changers and island of the idols made her more uh used she's not to, the like, queen she's not the queen i think it made her more used to like the high the high intensity cutthroat gameplay that a lot of these modern winners brought i think we could see like a danny boatwright situation where she comes in and is like 
this is way too fast. Like, I can slip under the radar, but, like, these people are just playing a whole entirely different game than what I do. Now, I think she gets to play the game she played in Heroes versus Villains in uh, Survivor Winners at War. That's her second win. I don't know, because I feel like winner, Heroes versus Villains, uh, which we'll see when you're talking about it, was so, like, uh, tribal, quite literally, from that perspective, that, like, she was able to win by being like, hey, I'm against you, Russell. They're like, Great, take our jury votes. In the voting block era, I don't think you can take that stance and win a season oh, just on that. Okay. All right, let's do one more question and we'll get to the survey. Uh, Carolina wants to ask, the two seasons that Sandra won are in the top three. Do you think that there is a correlation? For example, people like uh, the season more because of the winner. Tony could be another case uh, because he also has another two winner season in the top 10. How much... Do we have to uh, give credit to Sandra for her two winning seasons being in the top three? So I think I'm more inclined to give Sandra the character credit over Sandra the winner credit for her two seasons being in the top three. Does that make sense? Yeah, like I would say that more so like Tony, I think, has the more satisfying outcome uh, from a narrative perspective in the two seasons he won. Sandra was a character in them, but I would not necessarily say that like going into the finale, people were like, okay, this is Sandra's story. You know, I, I think that there were a lot of big characters around her. And I think people were certainly satisfied by it. That being said, I'm personally someone that's more about the journey than the destination, but I know that is not necessarily the majority opinion. So I do agree with the commenter that there is probably a very good chance that people are like, oh, we love Sandra. Sandra's such a great character. She was in every single episode of these two seasons, and that makes it great. Yeah, for me, I I don't really look at the winner of the season so much in uh, the rankings, except in a few uh, cases. And a lot of times, the better the winner, the worse the season. So I do think that a colorful character like a Sandra or a Tony winning, I think in a lot of cases helps it because they are there uh, the whole way. So... I would say to give her uh, like definitely some of the credit, but I think that this is a rich cast, an incredible theme. Uh, there is a, a, a lot going for this season and for Heroes versus Villains uh, besides only Sandra. It's not like that. Otherwise, if you took Sandra off the board, these would be two lame seasons. Let me also add something that Haley brought up at the very beginning of this, because we always say that like Tony is a unicorn, you know, yep. like nobody can play like him. But the more I watch Sandra's seasons, I'm wondering to a point that Haley made earlier, could we say the same for our other two time winner? Like a lot of people say they like to play like Sandra as long as it's not me. But is Sandra able to be successful due to that strategy combined with like her specific set of personal skills? How how applicable is as long as it's not me? Well, I think that what's very interesting about Sandra, and uh, I don't know if she's ever been described this way, is that I feel like that she is looked at as a goat, but she's like a goat with teeth where that (laughs) she's like uh, it's a trap where people look have looked at her and thought that, okay, well, she's somebody who's going to vote for her in the end. And she actually is like actually like is a really formidable opponent to take uh, to the end, because uh, while she does not like get a lot of credit in the real time, at least uh, like the first two versions of Sandra that we saw, then she's able to make a compelling case of like uh, what she did do and why she should get the money. And I think that the way she can also like uh, put the person she's up against, like on the defense and really like make a strong argument for herself and against other people that might be unpopular figures. I think that it makes her somebody uh, who, while you might think she's going to be an easy beat, she is anything but. Yeah. I think that, you know, it's understandable that people try to take qualities of players that they admire, but at the end of the day, we need to remember that survivor is a personality competition where strategy is involved, but you can't adapt other people's strategies onto yourself necessarily. You have to kind of see what works for you. And the way that Sandra works is like the way that she presents herself, both from that that toothy goat perspective, as you said, Rob, but also like the, uh, you know, the, the least of all evils option in both of her final situations, mm-hmm. like works very specific for her. It might work very specific for others, but I would not say it's as a uh, umbrella of a strategy as people might think of like, well, she clearly won with this two time strategy. I should do that. Mm-hmm. No, it's, it's very specific, I think, to a person like Sandra. 
I think that uh, the only other person I could think of that like also is able to do this, uh, ironically, somebody who uh, will be a tight ally of hers is Courtney. I think that she also mm. has that same sort of thing where people are like looking at her like, oh, she'll, I'll go to the end with her. She won't win. And then she's able to like uh, really just like light up other people that she could potentially uh, be in the end with and she also knows herself very well and is able to tell you like exactly like what she did do in the game uh where i feel like that that's like a, a, a you, know, you gotta be very careful about taking that person to the end yeah absolutely all right Haley, should we get to the survey yes please who's the mvp of the season i i, I think it ooh, I, hmm. see this is tough I, I I personally would say Johnny Fairplay, but I don't think it I don't think they voted Johnny Fairplay. I think they gotta vote Rupert, right? I think they vote Sandra. It is Sandra. 50% for Sandra, 37.5 for Johnny Fairplay, and 9.6 for Rupert. I were think the, Rupert's way too low for were, that. Were those the top three? Top three. Yeah. I mean it, it, it's tough because Rupert only well, lasts. Three. Oh, I'm so sorry, Lil. Uh, Rupert only lasts about like two thirds into the season, and granted, like he leaves a crater in his wake. But I, I do think it really comes down to those top two, the ones who make the final episode. Which one-time player would you most like to see come back and play in a future season? Skinny Ryan. <laughs> oh, this is a tough one. You know what? I I think this. Uh, poor Skinny Ryan. Uh, I'm gonna say I think it depends on. If people watch the season alongside us, I think they're going to say Burton but I don't know how many people did that. The answer is Burton. 45% a runaway. Uh, 16% for Krista. Krista, what do you think about that? Um, second place. <laughs> silver medal. I'm going to fashion this into a tube top. <laughs> a medal into a tube top. That would be... Wow, you're going to be very popular. <laughs> I already am. Yes. All right, third place. Uh, Tawana. Okay, all right, T. 4%. What about me? Uh, nobody wants to see Lil play again. Because poor Lil getting trashed in this survey. I, I I don't know what I did wrong. Okay. Which name in this list made you pause and think to yourself, wait, who is that? Haley, who is it? Trash. I'm going to say Michelle. It is Michelle. 46 uh, for Michelle. 17% for Trish. 14.26% for Nicole Delma. What my it wife. is, you know what the push the problem my is? Wife. Much yeah. much more famous Michelle's in Survivor. That's the issue. Mm. Is I think there are Trishes out there. Love me some Trish Hegarty, but I do think that like the Michelle Fitzgerald of it all. When people think Survivor Michelle, they're not thinking Michelle T T Tesoro not, or not Michelle Yi. No, yeah, I'm or Michelle Yi. They're not thinking Michelle Texaco uh, Texaco or whatever her name is. All right, who's the most underrated player of the season? Ooh, Will. Could it be? Could it be Sandra? We got this. Uh, I remember when I was on for Guatemala. This happened with Danny. Uh, could this happen with Sandra as well, or has Sandra earned enough of a reputation to not be considered underrated? Hmm. This could be another Burton one too. What do you think, Mike? I'm gonna I'm gonna lock me in for Burton here. I think I think the the Queen's reputation has risen her. It's Sandra. Twenty six percent. Dara had fifteen point four percent. Lil, finally, 14.88%. Well, it's about time. I'm okay. on the podium. Who got the Natalie Cole Award for the best pre-merge boot? Well, Ooh. does Lil and Burton count? No, they do not. Okay, they were cool, not cool, eligible. Cool, cool. So I guess it's got to be Sean or Austin, I suppose. And I, I guess, I'm going to say Austin, I think. I think that's the right choice. Um. It is Austin. Um, th to me, that seems wild. Uh, best pre-merge boot for Austin. Because what did he do? I mean, there was so much around him, though. Like, uh, there was so there was a huge storyline. I guess so. I, I guess I'm, I'm thinking like best player. Uh, but oh I guess no. Uh, in terms of best player, I mean, it's it's not a great crew. I would say that I think it's a bit of a top heavy cast in terms of like the big characters and players, but maybe I think Trish had some potential to maybe her. Maybe Trish, maybe uh, Trish. But, but I think if you're looking at like who had the biggest storylines, it's definitely yeah, Austin. Austin. Had the, he had the most. Okay. All right. We asked the listeners to uh, tell us where would you rank Sandra 1.0 on a scale of one to 40, one being the best winner and 
40 being the worst winner. So there's this is a two part question, right? Because it's like, where does it rank? And I also I wonder, is it above or below her in Heroes versus Villains? What's the more impressive win? I think she's 17 here. 17. 17. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say it's below. I think it's in the lower half. Uh, I'm gonna go with a lost number. I'm gonna say 23 for Sandra 23? In, in, in Pearl Islands. Okay, give it to Haley. It was 15.9. Uh, now that puts her now we now Kurt Clark, the tabulator, takes this and then puts that in the averages and then uh, tells us where that is. she actually is at 15th overall, nice. uh, which is uh, is pretty good. Like, I thought that maybe like, oh, I, we might see this number. And I thought that maybe it's like, oh, it's just Sanders, the queen, put her in the top five. Uh, I think it's a good spot for uh, the, for her game. Uh, she is actually one spot below uh, one of her uh, nemesis, uh, JT Thomas, mm. and then one spot above the Queen Slayer herself, uh, Denise Stapley. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, awkward mm. sandwich to be uh, a part of. Yeah, I didn't expect. I mean, that makes me excited because I think that Sandra played a very low key, but like solid game overall. She was never really truly in any danger over the course of Survivor Pearl Islands, which you can't say about the vast majority of the cast. I still though will raise the question and you'll get to this either next week or the week after as to whether or not her heroes versus villains game will be higher or lower than this one. I think if I had to guess, I will say, I think it will be higher. I think so too, because of the caliber of competition. Mm -hmm. Just to like, uh, talk about her game here. I mean, she does get blindsided a few different times. I mean, that's one of the things I like to look at. Like, did they vote correctly at the very least? Did they know where mm -hmm. the vote was going? Uh, she gets kind of a, like uh, caught with her head turned around uh, the other way uh, on a few different votes this season. Yeah, but what I like about it is she's always good on the rebound. Like, you can really, I think, tell the metal of a player by how they react when their back's against the wall. Mm -hmm. And granted, while Before Sandra I get dragged, is... Is that, is, is that accurate? Certainly the Rupert vote. The Rupert uh, vote and the Krista vote. She's on. She's not on the. She doesn't yeah. vote. Yeah. Did she? But, but I, think, I feel like she wasn't as blindsided by the. Yeah, Krista she wasn't line. blindsided on the Krista one. Krista was. I didn't see it coming. <laughs> uh, but I don't know if, if Sandra was in particular. But I mean, what I like about it is is when Sandra is you know not in the in the vote, she just goes to work. And I think her ability to be able to be maneuverable from that perspective, and also mm -hmm. have the perception of being able to like feel like she can be someone to get picked up by other players i think is very valuable especially considering the egos that she was playing with so mm -hmm. i think it was solid i would not say the flashiest but i think like a very competent game that i think we look more favorably upon you know she was certainly known as a character in this season but i think people more so remembered this season as rupert and the dead grandma season and i think now with Sandra returning so many times and getting a freaking statue, people have come back to appreciate her gameplay a bit more. Okay. All right. So let's talk about what's coming up next week. Uh, two seasons to go. Uh, I think I'm going to tell you what is uh, the number two season. And then by proxy, we will know what is the number one season. Okay. Um, Haley, do you uh, want to guess what the number two season is? I have to say it's Kagayan. Okay. Mike, are you in agreement? I'm I'm going to agree. I think that I've seen more vocal uh, arguments against Heroes versus Villains, but I think Heroes versus Villains has still been regarded as such an incredibly epic season, and people, this survey has showed people love returnee seasons, so I think it makes sense if we're putting newbies against returnees, returnees is probably going to win. I feel like it's been 10 years of us saying that Heroes versus Villains has been the best season. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Yeah. So you feel like, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I, I think it's a good thing. I think it's just like, yeah, it's what it is. Also, uh, in my rewatchability rankings, uh, I'm going to say, uh, you know, I have a tough decision to make. Uh, what, what do I think was better? Uh, this or Survivor fans versus favorites? I'm going to say fans versus favorites. I'm going to put fans versus favorites one in this number two. I'm sorry. Johnny I'm Fair plays like, no. Mm, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. All right, still top I five. I don't, no, don't want to let you down. Yeah. All right. So uh, that I feel like that every, uh, my, my difference is that uh, when you get to the merge, I feel like every single episode and vote of uh, here of uh, fans versus favorites uh, is, is great. I do feel like that, you know, we talked about uh, the, the Rhino vote. 
uh, you know, like I feel like that not every single like there are maybe higher highs along the way in Pearl Islands, but I feel like that uh, it is a, you know, a little bit of a more consistent ride on fans versus favorites. So I would say the Pearl Islands is too, but every episode does feel important and and mm-hmm. and, and fun and and like uh, iconic. So this is a great, great season of Survivor. All right. Rob, but, you ignorant slut. Yeah. Next week, next week, we're going to talk about the number two season of Survivor, and it is going to be Survivor Tagion. Here we go. This so that huge. will be next week. And then in two weeks, we will talk about the number one Survivor season of all time. I guess no surprise, Heroes versus Villains. So one week off from talking about Sandra and Rupert. Uh, we'll be back two weeks from tonight to talk about them. But in the meantime, we'll talk about the other two-time winner, Tony, and everybody from Survivor, Kagiyan. Uh, one week from tonight. And uh, that panel uh, next week is going to be with Puya Zamakili and Dave Jorgensen, uh, Washington oh! Post uh, TikTok guy. Yes, Dave Jorgensen. Uh, people yes. might know him as a viral superstar author as well. Be guest, sure. Dave is fantastic. Uh, a one-time near Survivor player, got very close to being on Survivor South Pacific. So yes. he's a he's a lifelong fan, uh, and so I'm I'm super excited to hear. I love Puya, but I'm really excited to hear from Dave in particular about this. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think Puya is pretty great too. <laughs> okay. Hey, I, I, then... I could beat him in a I could beat him in a race though. We'll see. We'll see. All right. And then two weeks from tonight, uh, we'll talk about the number one season of all time. And that will be, we will be joined then by, I believe, uh, the six timer on the countdown, uh, Chappelle, one more time, and Shannon Gus uh, to talk heroes versus villains two weeks from tonight. Okay. Uh, real quick, tell you about what's coming up here on the podcast Survivor 41 kickoff special. Check that out uh, in the podcast feed if you uh, haven't already. We're gonna Mike and I are gonna get you ready for Survivor Forty One, and then uh, we will have for you the first six Survivor cast interviews that Mike Bloom was able to procure. Uh, Mike, exciting this stuff! Is, yeah, this was a really fun time. I'm really excited for people to experience this podcast. We're gonna be again hearing audio from the interviews that we did uh, virtually. I'll bring in some stuff from my articles, bring in some stuff from the bios as well. Consider this your deep dive into the first six players here. And we're going to have three installments of these. We had a really fun time with this first one. And it's making me even more excited for this new group of people to come September 22nd. Okay. Then, uh, of course, uh, why Sandra won? Pearl Islands, uh, that is. David Bloomberg and Jessica Lewis uh, will be back with you on the Survivor Podcast feed to talk about uh, how Sandra followed all of David Bloomberg's rules. Uh, Or did she? We'll find out. Uh, Tomorrow night, uh, I'll be talking uh, Big Brother 23 with you, Taryn, and Melissa and uh, that was like the royal you uh, I was gonna say, the, like, the I, audience not like not Haley, 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 are we scheduled for that yes I would, yes I haven't watched an episode yet this season but if you want to call me I'm in oh, it's a good season it's a good season you watch I, a bunch of the crappy the ones yeah uh Taryn Melissa and Chappelle will join me on uh Wednesday night to talk uh BB 23 if you missed it we had uh, such a great episode of the slop this week uh Jacob Jones had an all-time podcast guest performance uh talking about everything from uh on big brother slop that's a patron only podcast rob's website patron and then uh mike what happened on the bnb this week yeah the bnb we come back habitually to cover big brother this past week we had kirsten mckinnis on to talk about uh weeks five through seven of big brother 23 you'll never guess which big brother house guest has a cameo worth one thousand dollars Seriously, you will never guess. Find out on the BNB. We had a very fun time breaking everything down with Kirsten. By the way, Haley, can we go back to that picture, Scott? Uh, I just wanted to explain to Haley. Uh, so, Haley, in this picture, uh, this is uh, that's uh, the uh, jacked jellyfish. Who, is he like, who is berated... he like the Otev of this year? Yeah. That was good. Uh, are, are you even jacked? Yikes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is actually, uh, I thought this was Rupert's next catch that he brought in for Drake before they voted him out. Yeah. Shocking, shockingly good. Uh, Haley, tell me about Batch this week. 
It was messy. Um, it's, uh, gosh, they are doing two episodes a week, and it's rude to me personally. Um, it's It's been good, though. I'm having a good time. You know, we had last year off from Bachelor in Paradise, but it, it, it feels good to be home again. That's for sure. Okay. Every time we look at Bachelor in Paradise, we see home. Okay. We had so what? much our patron podcast feed uh the slop the bb q a uh drop the patron five for five uh this morning also the survivor uh patron feedback show uh which i will have for you coming up on uh thursday uh this week with humberto and geo worthy uh, be sure to check that out plus uh we will also be doing a survivor q a uh this week for the patrons only about survivor 41 that's all at robinsonwebsite.com slash patron it's the start of september uh we're gonna have a ton of great survivor stuff for you as well plus some um, uh early releases of podcasts in our patron podcast feed that it's definitely uh worth checking out especially this month where you're gonna get survivor and big brother content in our patron podcast feed at robinswebsitecom slash Patreon, of course, uh, check out everything from our sponsors at robinswebsite.com slash offers. Hit that subscribe button if you're watching us on YouTube or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And then follow us on social media at RHAP Grams on Instagram for everything that we're doing or uh, at Rob's podcast on Twitter. Okay. Let me get to Mike's plugs. Okay. Uh, Mike, what, what do you got coming up? I have a treasure chest full of plugs for you, Rob. It's like uh, painting someone else's plugs green and passing it off as a Hulk doll. So you mentioned the 41 stuff. Uh, the other stuff I'm doing are articles for Parade.com, putting those out twice a day, uh, every day except for Labor Day. So you can check all that out at Parade.com. Really interesting interviews with this season's cast. But there's other Survivor going on. Uh, Survivor South Africa has been going strong the entire summer, not Haley strong. And so myself and Shannon Gus have been doing podcasts all season long. Uh, we are going to be having Adam Klein on this weekend to talk about the, I guess it's anti-penultimate episode of Survivor South Africa. It finishes the week before Survivor 41, just like jumping from one train over to another. Of this course, is big- ridiculous. Exactly. Uh, hoping to find a nice marriage between all of us uh, on marriage. the podcast. There we go. I love it. That's what uh, Jeff was hoping would ha- be happening between, I don't know, Fair Play and Dara or something. Uh, and then Big Brother Wise doing exit interviews for uh, Parade.com, as well as, believe it or not, when it rains, it pours in reality TV, The Circle is coming September 8th. Alert, alert. Literally none of us are ready for this in the community whatsoever, but uh, I have some preseason interviews up there. Got to talk with a couple of the contestants. I don't know what they call them. Circlers, uh, maybe, Hmm. Uh, but I'll be doing exit press throughout there. And then over on post-show recaps, of course, down the hatch with Josh Wiggler. We're going into season six, big old season, a monster of an entirely different variety going on there. Uh, and then, of course, the Bloom Files, uh, my podcast with my beautiful wife, Angela Bloom, where we go over the X-Files and all of its weirdness. And if you missed it, I was on this past episode of Renap with Jessica Lee. got to yes, join you and Eva. Yep, talking about all things Star Trek. So <laughs> it's a lot. There's a lot of stuff going on, but I am one happy pirate. I'm like Rupert at sea. I feel at home. Mike Bloom, you were on fire tonight and uh, looking forward to talking more uh, Survivor 41 preseason with you. Yeah, I'm I'm it's like this is a great way to sort of like honestly take a break from checking out all the new Survivor to like bask in a season I will forever love and forever reminisce about. Apologies if I talk too much out there, people. Uh, I, I just love to talk so much about why this is an incredible season worth its weight in gold doubloons. And I hope we all got to sort of take some time tonight to just like you know, uh, revel in how much fun this is. Definitely best old school Survivor season. My favorite season of all time. And I I always relish the opportunity to talk about it. So thank you for for having me on. Okay, thank you, Mike. Haley. I'm not as busy as Michael, but- um, I mean, who is? We are knee deep in the Bachelor in Paradise season. And uh, there's no stopping because The Bachelorette, is again happening after the season of bachelor in paradise so we mm-hmm. are just on that love train my friends so they went um, they went bachelorette bachelor in paradise bachelorette again yes yes they do hate me yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. wow did they just like not like the bachelor c- contestants that much of like we won't alternate genders no my friend it's that um 
they pick somebody for the bachelorette before they like sign this they sign the contract and then realize that the audience actually wanted somebody else more so they're like let's do two seasons of the bachelorette oh, don't worry we're still no. getting the bachelor come january mm-hmm. we're just fitting in another season in between <laughs> okay wow so that's happening you can catch that on the wrap up feed. Um, if yeah. you want to follow me personally, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at each strong underscore. If you want to check out everything I'm reading, well, why don't you head on over to at the strong library on Instagram? Wow. I read a lot of Bridgerton the, the books library in the last is week and open. a half. Yes. Okay. And how were they? Just great. I love them. They're yeah. great. Can't help it. Haley, you were phenomenal here <laughs> on the podcast tonight. No, you were. Shucks. It was so fun. Like I'm so I I'm just like in awe every time I get to come do something like this. Like it's just mind blowing to me. Well, we had so much fun. Uh, and Haley, I appreciate you uh, staying up late to uh, talk with us. Significantly about this. past my bedtime. I know. Yeah. I Night, know. The nighttime is the bad time for Haley Strong. It's the one I'm, bad time. I'm yeah. fading. You're fading fast. Yes. No, Haley, uh, you did an incredible job. I mm-hmm. have so much fun whenever we get to get on a podcast. So uh, so happy that you were here for this. Thank you all so much for making it through the number three season of all time. Two weeks from tonight, we've reached the end of this countdown. Can you believe it? We'll talk what, to you soon. What yes? do you do after? No, I don't know. <laughs> What you have so much time on your hands after this? It's almost like this is yeah, this is like day thirty-seven of Survivor, or it's like okay, uh, like I don't know what am I gonna do? I got so much time, like we have to live yeah, my but, life. but but it's yeah. almost like you went, you're on day thirty-seven of Survivor season. And they're like, okay, great, now final tribal council's over. Here's your next Survivor <laughs> season to undergo. And you're like, you're all like right, like Russell it. but that's only one episode a week. <laughs> yeah, but five podcasts a week. All right, but the, uh, that add them all together, and they're about the length of this one. That's true. Are, are you how are you going to feel like having to watch things on normal speed? Will everything just feel like in slow motion again? Slow motion. It's like when I watch Fast and Furious on three X. Exactly. Everything slows down. Yeah. Yeah. Take some. My take some time. Be so sharp. Yes. Take some time to revel in it. You know, take take it all in. Truly enjoy the experience. Yes. Amazing <laughs> grace. Okay. All no, right. Trump, <laughs> no, <Trump. laughs>